Solace of Simon A Love on Palmer Island Romance Written by Suzanne Ash Chapter 1 I moved in with James Alexander. Into the penthouse suite. We're engaged. The word still stung. It had been well over 36 hours since Simon ran into his girlfriend. Ex-girlfriend, he corrected himself. Less than a month after leaving him, she was back in the building and about to get married to his banker. Simon shook his head, trying to get the image of Megan holding out her hand to show off the large diamond ring out of his mind. Getting dumped had been bad enough. He didn't need to run into her whenever he left his condo too. It was why he'd taken off the first chance he got. And driven back to his happy place. When he crossed the bridge that connected Palmer Island to the mainland, he felt like he could breathe again. A weight lifted off his chest. Megan had only been down there twice, and with no connections left to the island, he wouldn't have to worry about running into her. She was happily living in Charlotte, and he was seriously considering moving back home. His sister, Summer, had done it, and she was about to move out. Would his parents mind if he moved back for a little while? Maybe he could look into buying a place down here. He drove down the familiar roads of the place he had grown up in. Past the diner where they'd hung out after school. Past the arcade where he'd spent much of his middle school years. Past the pier where his grandfather had taught him to fish. Of course, that wasn't the only thing the pier was good for. Every once in a while, the waves hit just right and he could surf down there. He was itching to take his board out and lose himself in the ocean. Not tonight, though. Tonight he wanted to hang out with his family and forget all about Charlotte and Megan and that large rock on her finger. He pulled up to the sidewalk in front of his parents' house. It was lit up and he could see people moving around the kitchen and living room. He smiled. It was good to be back home. Simon got out of his SUV and stretched his legs. He'd made the four-hour drive without stopping, eager to get on the island. He grabbed the duffel bag he'd packed and slammed the door shut. Walking up the path to the house, he thought he heard a noise from the space in between their house and the one next door. When he couldn't make anything out, he decided it must have been a cat or a squirrel and rang the doorbell. Surprise, he said when his mother opened the door. He dropped his bag and hugged her. I didn't know you were coming down. Jane squeezed him tight. Is Megan with you? She loosened her grip on him. I'm by myself, he said. When his mother didn't say anything, he stepped out of the embrace and studied her face. It's not a problem, is it? Me coming down for a visit? Of course not. We're always happy to see you. Come in. You missed a good game of Scrabble. She pulled him inside, closing the front door behind him. Clive, look who came for a visit. His father stepped out of his study. Everything okay in Charlotte? The concern was obvious on his father's face. Everything's fine. With Summer moving out to Colorado in a few weeks, I thought I'd spend a little extra time down here. His father nodded and returned to his chair in the living room. I'll take my bag up. Is Summer here? He could always count on his little sister to distract him. Or maybe he'd call up Brayden and see if his best friend was up for grabbing a couple of beers. She and Brayden went for a walk on the beach. They should be back in a little while. His mother smiled, obviously pleased with the two of them dating. He dropped his bag off and jogged back to the living room just in time to see the happy couple walking off the back deck. Look who came home for a surprise visit, Jane said. Simon raised his hand in greeting. Brayden looked at him and started to speak. His friend knew about Megan and looked concerned. Not something he wanted to get into. And not something he wanted his mother to know about. At least not yet. He shook his head, hoping his friend would get the message. Brayden nodded his head. He understood. Simon walked over to hug Summer. I missed my baby sister. And with this big move coming up, I figured I'd better come down and spend time with you any chance I get. How sweet. 
Jane turned and pinched his cheek. You're such a good big brother. And you've got to be starving. Did you eat? I'm fixing you a plate. With that, she was off, no doubt piling three meals worth of food on his plate. His stomach growled. Simon realized he couldn't remember the last time he'd eaten. It had been a long day. He slumped onto the couch and tuned everyone out. Braden and his father discussed something inconsequential, so he'd rest until the food was ready. Simon, how are things with the business? Income projections still going up? We're going to have to talk about upping your expenses. Any interest in buying an office building or leasing a bigger space? His father's voice pulled him out of his stupor before he could drift off to sleep. The numbers are looking good, and this new collaboration should give us an even bigger boost. Simon mustered as much enthusiasm as he could. He was tired, but the business was what he lived and breathed for. I'll go over the books with you in the morning. He sat up, wondering how his father would take the latest company news. As far as the office goes, he looked over at Braden, we're actually considering going to remote workplaces. With what we do, there's really no need for a joint office space. He looked up at his father. Hmm. Clive leaned back in his recliner and put his hands behind his back. That's going to provide some unique accounting issues. I assume your employees will take home office deductions. As will both of you. He looked at Simon and Braden in turn. There's some paperwork associated with that, but nothing too complicated. As far as offsetting profits though? He rubbed his chin. I guess in the long run, the savings in rent will more than make up for the tax reductions. Plus, there are some things we can do with renting meeting spaces. Oh stop it, Clive, Jane exclaimed, carrying a plate piled high with food. Simon's stomach growled again. This is family time. You boys can talk business tomorrow. Here you go, honey. She handed him the plate. Everyone ready for a cup of coffee? I'd rather have some tea with dinner, mom. Simon dug in. There was nothing better than his mother's cooking. It was exactly what he needed. Comfort food. He'd have to go for a run in the morning, but it was worth it. He took another big bite of his mother's meatloaf. I'll help, Summer jumped up and followed her mother into the kitchen. Simon kept digging into the meatloaf and garlic mashed potatoes on his plate. He eyed the Brussels sprouts suspiciously. As a child, he hated them, calling them green yuck balls. He popped one into his mouth. Not bad. He enjoyed the complex flavors and textures. It went well with the rest of the meal. He'd have to ask his mother for the recipe. Did you catch the game this afternoon? Brayden asked. He didn't seem all that comfortable. Simon bit into the piece of garlic toast his mother had made. I did. It was a close call at the end there. Simon kept working on his plate, watching Brayden and his father trying to make conversation. Was it horrible that he enjoyed watching his best friend squirm? Nah, he decided. If your best friend dated your little sister, he deserved to be a little uncomfortable. Summer walked in and handed him a glass of ice-cold tea, their mother close behind with a tray of coffee and cookies. Thanks. So, you two made up? he asked his sister. We're good, was all Summer said. Brayden put his arm around her shoulder, pulling her closer. I think you two are more than good. You've been practically inseparable. His mother sounded more than a little excited. Brayden is moving to Colorado with her. I know. Simon smiled. Brayden had called him and they'd had a lengthy conversation about what it would mean for their company. Speaking of which, what's the plan? Renting two separate apartments seems like a waste of money, and I know young people today don't always follow tradition. Clive trailed off. Simon wasn't surprised. His father was old-fashioned and conservative. Thankfully, he'd never realized Megan had lived with him for a few months. Simon reminded himself that he was here to stop thinking about her and what could have been. Sir, I've been thinking about that as well, 
and I would like to ask permission for your daughter's hand in marriage. Simon had to hold back a groan. This wasn't helping. Neither was the happy gasp from his mother. You have it, son. His father stood and shook Brayden's hand. His best friend looked a little pale as he pulled a ring from his jeans pocket with shaky hands. He got down on one knee in front of Summer. Don't they make the perfect couple? he heard his mother whisper. Summer, I have been in love with you for longer than either of us realized. I can't imagine living a life without you in it. If you feel the same, and I think you do, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? Simon was in agony. He loved his sister and was happy for her and his best friend. But did Brayden have to do this right now? Summer, his mother hissed. Simon looked up. Sorry, his little sister said softly. Yes. I'll marry you. He couldn't remember seeing her so happy. His mother demanded to see the ring and hear all about it. Simon wasn't really listening. Best to get the whole proposal thing over with so he could get out of there. Go ahead and kiss her, he said. He did his best to ignore the happy couple and was grateful when his father cleared his throat repeatedly. It took a few tries before Summer and Brayden broke apart and sat back down on the couch across from him. More coffee? Jane asked the room. Honey, I think we're going to need a little something stronger. His father got out the good stuff and poured each of them a glass. His mother insisted on opening a bottle of sparkling wine and poured Summer a glass. The face his sister made when she tasted it was priceless. This was her big day, he couldn't let her suffer. He walked up behind her and took the glass from her hand. Turning to make sure neither of his parents were looking his way, he dumped the contents into a plant. He winked and handed his sister the glass back. Thanks, she mouthed. I can't believe you're going to marry my little sister. Sure, that's something you want to do. Simon couldn't resist teasing his friend. Ouch. Jane looked up, giving him a stern look before offering her daughter a refill. Thanks, Mom. I'm good. Simon snorted, still rubbing his ribs. His sister had sharp elbows. He downed his bourbon and put down the tumbler. I'm going to head out for a bit. You can't be serious. Your sister just got engaged. His mother looked and sounded enraged. It's fine, Mom, summer suit. I'm glad you could be here. I'll walk out with you. Brayden said, handing his drink to Summer. I have a question about the latest user demographic stats. Simon knew it for the excuse it was. They'd discussed the matter last week. What's up, he asked when they were out of earshot. That's what I'm wondering. What's going on with you? Something's bothering you. Is it me and Summer? It isn't. Not really. Simon shrugged. That doesn't sound convincing. Honestly, that isn't it. You two are good for each other. It's. Simon had to get out of there. He was happy for them, but this was harder than expected. Brayden waited. It's what, he prompted when Simon didn't continue. It's hard seeing the two of you together. Megan, he took a deep breath and turned to look at Brayden. Megan moved in with James Alexander. Our banker? He's an arrogant. He is, Simon interrupted him. And from what I can tell, Megan moved from my condo right into his place. And you're running into them. Simon nodded. It's hard seeing you two so happy when I had all that and now it's gone. It wasn't perfect, but at least I wasn't alone. I'm sorry. I'm happy for you both. I really am. I just need a little air. We'll talk tomorrow. I'll call you. Simon walked out of his parents' house and down the walkway. He needed to clear his head, to think. His car keys were in his pocket, but after the long drive from Charlotte, he was in no mood to get back into his forerunner. Instead, he strolled down the sidewalk, past the small neighborhood park and onto Main Street. Summer was coming to an end, 
and the steady stream of tourists that usually packed the shops and restaurants had started to thin out. He walked aimlessly past the small convenience store, the local pizza joint, and eventually came up to a small flower shop. He thought about picking up a small bouquet of flowers for his sister. He stepped up and pulled the door handle. It was locked. The store hours were posted on a small sign on the door. A quick glance at his watch confirmed his suspicions. He was half an hour too late. Simon still couldn't believe his little sister was marrying his best friend. Of course, they'd been dating for a while and Brayden was moving out to Colorado with her in a few short weeks, but still. He'd assumed he would be the first of the Johnson siblings to get married. He'd been engaged to Megan for two years before she told him she was seeing someone else and moved out. He shook his head. The last thing he needed was to dwell on the past. He needed a distraction. Simon noticed a sign pointing into a small alleyway, not far from the flower shop. Open late was all it said, along with a few books drawn on the simple chalk sign. It couldn't be chalk though, could it? That would wash off in the rain. It had to be some sort of paint. Lost in thought, he walked along and found himself in the middle of a courtyard he didn't know existed. He'd grown up on Palmer Island and had spent much of his youth fishing off the pier and playing games at the arcade closer to the beach. How had he missed this? A small bookstore was tucked into one corner. As far as he could tell, it was the only business in the place. The rest of the buildings looked residential. The sign on the door let him know the store was indeed still open. Welcome to the book nook. Is there something I can help you with? A young woman with kind brown eyes, her dark hair pulled back into a ponytail, rose from a comfortable-looking chair sitting with its twin in front of a small fireplace. The low table placed between the chairs held a stack of books. I'm not sure, Simon said. The store looked very different from the chain store not far from the company offices he usually perused on his lunch break. There's a business management book I was thinking of picking up. He continued to take in the store. The walls were covered in floor-to-ceiling bookshelves. Tables held stacks of leather-bound tombs. And the smell. The entire place smelled a bit dusty and musky. Not in a bad way, though. It reminded him of pleasant hours spent hiding under the covers with an adventure tale as a boy. Do you know the title? She asked, blowing her bangs out of her eyes. Or the author? He gave her both, and she walked through an open doorway into another room. The entire building must have been residential at some point, Simon realized. And from the look of the fireplace and the solid oak beams, it had been built quite a while back. He followed the woman into a room full of narrow bookcases, packed with paperback books. He saw beach scenes, women in ball gowns, and men with bare chests on the covers of a few books that were laying up on top of the stacks and on the side table next to a small sofa. Another reading nook, he guessed. They were the kinds of books you saw tourists carrying down to the beach. The books his sister devoured back in high school. Not his preferred reading material. If you don't have it, it's no big deal. I'm sure I can order it online. The book was a fairly new release and not the type of material someone would want to read on vacation. I have a copy. Follow me. The brunette rose and started walking through yet another set of doors into what must have been a bedroom when the house was originally built. A sign on the wall read Nonfiction. He stepped up beside her, the scent of bergamot and vanilla was barely noticeable. It reminded him of an old perfume his grandmother used to wear. Here you go. She handed him a hardcover copy of the book he sought. Is there anything else you're looking for? Maybe something a little more fun? She winked at him. What's your poison? I've got a little bit of everything in here. He didn't doubt it. Romance isn't my thing, if that's what you're asking, he teased, smiling back at her. I didn't think it was. She walked around him. Hmm, let me think. He turned as she continued to make a full circle around him. She was inspecting him from head to toe. Fantasy, she exclaimed after a moment. I bet you love high fantasy novels. 
am I right? He was surprised. He hadn't thought about those books for a few years. Not since college. I used to love Lord of the Rings, he admitted. How did you know? You give off that vibe. What else did you read? The Wheel of Time series? Simon nodded. Anything more recent? He held up the book she'd handed him. This is about all I've had time to read the past few years. She shook her head disapprovingly. That's work. It's like the stuff we used to have to read in high school. What do you read for fun? He thought about it. I can't remember the last time I read something for fun. We're going to have to fix that, she said. If you're game. He nodded. Maybe a little fiction wasn't a bad idea. He doubted the book in his hand would keep his mind off Megan and the breakup. Lead the way. They retraced their steps to the main room and walked through another open doorway into a room filled with fantasy and science fiction books. He wished this store had existed when he was a boy. How long have you had the store? he asked. Let me think. For about five years. That explained it. He had left for college before she'd opened her doors for the first time. I took over from my grandmother. The store has been here for the past 37 years. So much for that theory. He'd have to ask his mother about it. With her love of books, she had to know of its existence. And kept it from him. Have you read any of the modern fantasy authors? Brandon Sanderson, Patrick Rothfuss? He shook his head. Let's start with Brandon Sanderson, then. He finished the Wheel of Time series after Robert Jordan passed. She walked over to a shelf packed with books. I think you'll like the Mistborn series. Here. She held out a paperback book to him. The title and the name of the author were prominently displayed on the cover along with a cloaked figure hovering in the mist. He turned it over and read the back. It sounded like the kind of book he'd enjoyed in his youth. I'll give it a try. She walked back to the main room and behind a small counter that held an old-fashioned cash register. I don't have much cash on me, he said, setting the books down and pulling his wallet out of his pocket. Don't worry. It's an old-fashioned shop, but we take credit cards. She smiled and pointed to the small card reader tucked away next to the register. I hope you enjoy the book, she said while handing him his receipt. Mistborn, she clarified. Bring it back if you don't. I have a satisfaction guarantee when I recommend something to my customers. That sounds like a costly policy, he said. Not really. She held her hand out, motioning for him to walk ahead. Unless there's something else I can help you with, it's time for me to close up shop. Chapter 2 Sophia, darling. Pamela Davenport waltzed into the shop, ignoring the fact that Sophie was helping a customer. I'll be with you in a minute, Mom. She turned her attention back to Miss Doris. Is this a gift for someone on the island? Someone I know? It's Wendy Johnson's birthday next week. She doesn't get out as much as she used to. I thought a book would be a nice gift. We used to trade paperbacks back and forth when we were both first married. Miss Dora smiled, looking lost in the past. Sophie thought for a moment. There's a Fern Michelson book she might like. She walked over to the next bookshelf and grabbed a copy. It's also available in large print. Wendy's eyes aren't what they used to be, Miss Dora said, pulling out a pair of glasses. Neither are mine. She took the book and read over the copy on the back. This sounds perfect. I'll take two if you have them. Wouldn't mind reading this myself. Sophie picked up two large print editions and made a mental note to add it to her next book order before ringing up the purchase. Would you like me to gift wrap one of the books? Not necessary, dear. I'm making her a basket. I'll tuck the book in around the muffins. Miss Doris was famous around the island for her baked goods. Finally. Sophie's mother closed the magazine she'd been perusing and set it down on the coffee table. 
Of course her mother had chosen something from the bridal section, to keep her busy. I don't know why you insist on keeping this, shop open. Believe it or not, because I enjoy it. Her mother shook her head. I guess it gives you something to do for now. She rose and smoothed out her skirt. The reason I'm here. You want to make sure I'm coming to the heritage ball and have something appropriate to wear. Sophie forced herself not to roll her eyes at her mother. It would only make things worse. Her mother waved her off. Of course you're coming, and I have set up a fitting for you at Madame Bouvier's next week. It was her mother's favorite dress shop down in Charleston. I have plenty of dresses to wear. Her closet was full of formal and semi-formal gowns her mother insisted on buying her for various social events. As a former Miss Palmer Island, her mother attended them all and insisted on bringing her daughter along. Someone might recognize the dress. Her mother looked distressed. We can't have that. And what would Martin think? You didn't? Of course I did. You can't attend the Heritage Ball without an escort. Martin is happy to accompany you. Her mother looked pleased with herself. For years, she'd been trying to play matchmaker between her and Martin Whitefield. It's never going to happen, mother. What are you talking about? Her mother pretended to look confused. It was an admirable performance. Martin and I will never be a couple. He's a nice enough guy. From a good family, her mother interrupted, Sophie nodded. The Whitefields were one of the oldest and most affluent families on the island. And he has a good job. He's in a position to take care of you. Mother. You know I don't like it when you call me that. Mama, Sophie changed her tone. Antagonizing her mother never did much good. There's no spark. No matter how often you try to put us together. Her mother waved her off. Your friends. That's a solid foundation for a marriage. You read too many of those romance stories. All passion and excitement. That wears off quickly. A marriage based on friendship and respect for each other is what you want. Look at your father and I. Sophie wasn't so sure about that after growing up around her parents. They got along well enough, though there was little love and no passion between them. But this was a conversation they'd had often enough, and it never ended well. I'll go, but no new dress. Aside from the fact that she couldn't afford to buy a new dress, Sophie hated the idea of buying them for one occasion. Very well. But don't blame me if the women start to gossip. Her mother picked up the small leather purse she'd set on the table and left the store. Sophie sighed. Roped into another one of your mother's events? Maddie asked. Sophie's faithful assistant must have busied herself stocking shelves in one of the back rooms the moment Pamela Davenport walked in. Yep. The annual heritage ball. The late summer event for the rich and famous Palmer Island residents. I don't know why she keeps insisting on dragging me to these events. To set you up with Martin. She's already tried to get you guys to go out to dinner. Maddie shrugged and turned to rearrange a few cookbooks. Hey, it wasn't my fault that the warehouse delivery was late. It had been a lucky coincidence that she'd had to cancel their plans to have dinner at Shea Paul's. And then you came down with a cold. And then Alfred was acting strange. All of that happened. I ended up taking poor Alfred to the vet. And if you'd been on a date with Martin, you'd understand. I get it. The guy is boring and won't take a hint. Especially with my mother continuing to encourage him. I think she and his mother planned our wedding when we were both toddlers. At the country club where both families were members of course. Sophie shook her head. It's like she won't even consider anyone else. Don't take this the wrong way, Maddie looked around the room, then at Sophie, but you haven't exactly been putting yourself out there. Maybe your mother feels like she has to find you a husband? It was a good thing she'd known Maddie for years and liked her friend. It's not as if I live like a hermit. Maddie rolled her eyes. When was the last time you'd been out on a date that wasn't arranged? Or out to a bar? 
that's not fair. You know that's not my scene. There are plenty of other places to meet people. I talk to strangers all the time here in the shop. She looked around her pride and joy. And I run the book club. The book club meets here. And how many men take part? There's. Steve doesn't count and you know it. Maddie looked like she was about to throw a book at Sophie. Not that she would. Her friend treasured them almost as much as she did. It was one of the reasons she'd hired Maddie, despite slow sales. You've got a point. Steve was a man, a happily married gay man, with a love of historical romance novels. And even he was trying to set her up on blind dates. Maybe I really should sign up for one of those dating sites. Maybe you should. You look lovely, Martin said when he showed up on her doorstep the night of the Heritage Ball. These are for you. Sophie took the large bouquet of roses, at least two dozen in various shades of pink and purple, from his hand. I'll put them in water and we can go. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Misty shoot down the steps. Sophie tossed the roses back at Martin and took off after her cat. She finally cornered her out by the dumpsters. Sophie picked up the wayward little girl and held her out in front of her, hoping the cat wouldn't ruin her dress. She'd never hear the end of it from her mother if there was a tear in the burgundy taffeta. She rushed past Martin, who still stood helplessly by the door, into her apartment. Come on in, she called over her shoulder. She set Misty down in the kitchen by the food and water dishes, while Alfred sat on the counter, looking at all the commotion. Is everything okay? Martin followed her into the kitchen. Everything's fine. I couldn't let Misty escape. She's declawed and can't defend herself against other cats. And there were quite a few of them roaming around in the back alleys of Main Street. She knows she's not supposed to get out, but tests me every once in a while. Martin had a glazed look in his eyes. Not a cat person, she guessed. Sophie took the flowers he once again held out to her and rummaged through the kitchen cabinets for a vase. I know I own something to put these in. I didn't think bringing them would inconvenience you. His tone was tense. Sophie looked up. I'm sorry. Not at all. They're lovely. I have the perfect vase. It's got to be here somewhere. She put the flowers on the counter and crouched down to get a better look at the inside of her cabinets. Here it is. A Waterford. Very nice. You recognize it? Sophie was stunned. It was my grandmother's. Martin gently picked up the crystal piece and examined it carefully. It has some age. Not a big collector's item, but a nice family piece. He set it down and stepped back. Sophie poured water into it and dumped the roses into the vase. Martin raised an eyebrow, looking displeased. I'll arrange them later, I promise. I don't want to get an earful from my mother, because we're running late. He nodded and offered her his arm. Twenty minutes later, they walked into the main hall at Halston Plantation. The room was full of elegantly dressed people, residents, and visitors alike. Sophie recognized Caroline Sutton and her husband, Pete, and waved. You know the Suttons? Martin asked, again sounding surprised. Caroline comes into the bookshop quite a bit when they're down. They'd become friends over the years and had gotten even closer when Caroline asked for her help with a new charity that's working on getting books in the hands of young children. For the first time, he looked impressed rather than annoyed at her. Before Sophie could offer to introduce him, her mother waved them over. So nice you two could make it. She smiled at them, but a moment later, the smile vanished. Sophia, her mother hissed. Look what your cats did to poor Martin. Sophie's eyes traveled down to Martin's legs. They were covered in white cat hair. Did Alfred rub up against you while you were waiting on me? I'm not sure. Martin backed into a corner and started brushing the wool material of his suit pants. That won't come off without a lint brush or some packing tape. Sophie looked around for someone who looked like staff. Don't worry about it. It's fine. 
Martin straightened up, resigned to spending the remainder of the evening uncomfortably untidy. I'll go find us some drinks. I can't believe this. I was ready to introduce the two of you to Evelyn Sutton. Her mother shook her head disapprovingly before taking a step in Sophie's direction to make room for a group of elderly women in fancy ball gowns moving past. Sophie stepped back as well, only to collide with something solid. She heard something large and metal hit the floor a heartbeat later. I, I'm, so sorry. The young waitress, who looked like she might still be in high school, looked mortified. Come with me. Her mother grabbed her by the arm. I'll deal with you later, she hissed over her shoulder. Sophie followed her mother into the ladies' room. It wasn't like she had much of a choice. The back of your dress is covered in hors d'oeuvres. Seafood from the smell of it. Her mother shook her head and made Sophie stand in front of the sink. She took a handful of linen napkins and rubbed at the mess, but it was useless. Sophie could feel through the thin fabric of her gown that the only thing her mother had succeeded in was spreading the mess around. Stop. This isn't helping. She turned to catch a glance of the dress in the mirror. It wasn't pretty, and even if they had been able to get most of the food off, she would smell like a seafood store all night. Martin was waiting, two glasses of champagne in hand, when they returned. To his credit, he didn't say anything about her appearance. Or the smell. I'm going home, Sophie said when Martin offered her the drink. He looked at her dress and swallowed. Very well. I'll take you home. Her mother nodded her thanks and left. Sophie tried hard not to roll her eyes. At either of them. There's no need. She was sure he was worried about his car. She didn't blame him. She wouldn't want to scrape whatever was still stuck to her back off the seat, either. I'll catch a cab. She walked off, hoping he wouldn't follow her. I'll call you tomorrow, he called after her. She seriously doubted it, and that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Sophie walked out of the main building and up the long drive. She could call a cab, but that would eat into her meager budget this week. The night air was warm, and her mother had managed to get the worst of the mess off her back. Sophie decided to walk back to her place. It had been a short drive and once she hit the main road that stretched the length of the island, there was a sidewalk that ran all the way to Main Street and beyond. By the time she made it to the sidewalk, Sophie started to regret her decision. She felt blisters starting to form and the warm summer air was thick. Sweat formed on her forehead. Well, it was what it was. It wasn't like she could call for a cab or rideshare now. Where would she have them pick her up? Sophie Davenport squared her shoulders, lifted her chin, and picked up the pace. Sophie? Do you want a ride? An Oldsmobile came to a stop next to her, the passenger side window rolled down. Miss Doris. Sophie stepped up to the car. Hop in. The older woman pushed open the door. That's very kind of you, but I'd better walk. When Miss Doris wouldn't take no for an answer, Sophie quickly explained the mishap and showed her the back of her dress to drive home the point. Oh, fiddlesticks. I have an old blanket in the back. That mess won't hurt it. The hazard lights came on and Miss Doris was out of her car and digging around in the back of her trunk with a speed that belied her age. A moment later, the ruffle blanket was spread out over the passenger seat. Get in, Miss Doris ordered. Sophie did as asked, doing what she could to avoid having her dress touch the blanket. They were at her house in a matter of minutes. Thank you for the ride home. I'll take the blanket and get it cleaned. Sophie hopped out of the car. Miss Doris turned off the engine. You will do no such thing. She grabbed the blanket and threw it in the back before hopping out of the car. Let's get you out of that dress. Misty and Alfred greeted them at the door. One sniff and both cats tried everything they could to get up at Sophie's dress. Bedroom, Miss Doris ordered, pushing her in the direction of the door. She quickly closed it before either cat could sneak in. Good thinking, Sophie said. She tried to reach for the zipper. 
It had taken a piece of string and some serious gymnastics to get into the dress by herself. Here, let me help. Miss Doris unzipped the dress halfway before taking a step back. Boy, that does smell strong. What exactly did you back into? I'm not sure. Some sort of seafood hors d'oeuvres. She turned around, waiting for Miss Doris to leave. Go take a hot shower. There's some in your hair. Hand me the dress before you hop in, and I'll see what I can do about saving it. She pushed Sophie in the direction of the bathroom and wouldn't let her utter a protest. I'm going, I'm going. It was easier to go along with the request. Washing all remnants and reminders of the evening off sounded like a good idea anyway. You really don't have to do this, she tried again, to no avail. By the time Sophie walked out of her bedroom, showered and in her favorite yoga pants, a towel wrapped around her freshly washed hair, Miss Doris was standing at the sink using a butter knife to scrape the gunk off the fancy dress. It's such a pretty gown, it'd be a shame if it got ruined. The woman gently moved the knife over a delicate piece of fabric close to the top. I'm not sure we'll ever get it all out. There's salmon mousse caked into the zipper and the lace got stained by. Sophie took the dress from Miss Doris. I appreciate the effort, but this looks like a lost cause to me. She took the dress and unceremoniously tossed it into the trash, much to the dismay of her cats, who both took up positions next to the stainless steel container, hoping they'd get a shot at tearing into the delectably smelling fabric. You're probably right. Still, such a shame to see a beautiful dress like that go. You looked stunning in it. Miss Dora smiled, her steel-gray eyes twinkling. Even with all that seafood paste on it. Sophie laughed. Honestly, I'm glad to get rid of it. Not a lot of good memories in that dress. She glanced over at the trash can. Her cats had started to climb up the side, trying to get into the contents of the bag. She made a mental note to take it out to the dumpster before going to bed. Would you like a cup of tea? Or are you in a rush to get home? No rush at all. There's no one waiting for me at the house. The last set of renters left, and the new ones aren't coming in for another couple of days. Sophie had forgotten that Miss Doris rented a small cottage and several rooms in her house out to vacationers. Tea would be lovely. Something herbal maybe? Sophie grabbed her kettle, another hand-me-down from her grandmother that came with the place, filled it at the sink, and put it on the stove. Mint or chamomile? Chamomile. Miss Dora smiled and took a seat at the kitchen table. I don't mean to pry, but tonight didn't go well? Sophie bit back a snort. Aside from the fact that I ended up wearing an entire tray of seafood nibbles? Miss Dora smiled. Aside from that, yes. It went exactly as expected. Sophie grabbed two cups from the cupboard and added a bag of tea to each. It was one of my mother's functions. The Heritage Ball. I'm surprised you weren't there. Oh, I stopped going years ago. Can't say I miss it. I wouldn't either. But mother insists. The water had come to a rolling boil. She turned the burner off and filled the cups. The aroma of the tea enveloped her immediately. Sophie took a deep breath. It was a comforting scent. She carried both teacups to the table and took a seat across from the kind older lady. Thank you. Miss Doris leaned over and smelled the tea. Nothing better than a soothing cup of chamomile after a long and tiring day. Sophie couldn't agree more. She dumped her own tea bag in and out of the hot liquid. If you don't mind me asking. Miss Doris looked up at her. How did you end up having to walk home? Car trouble? No, it wasn't the car. Hers wasn't always the most reliable, but it got her where she needed to go. Most of the time. Martin Whitefield picked me up. And he didn't have the decency to drive you home. Miss Doris shook her head. Wait until his mother hears about this. Bethany raised him better than that. Oh no, Martin was the perfect gentleman. He offered to drive me home. She pulled her teabag out and set it on the small saucer. 
sugar or honey? Miss Dora shook her head. He did? Why did I pick you up on the side of the road, then? Sophie bit her lip. Miss Doris knew Martin's family. One look at the woman's face told her she wasn't getting out of answering. Martin loves his car. I'm sure he would have taken me home, but he wouldn't have appreciated getting anything on his seats. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't carry an old blanket for this kind of emergency. Miss Doris grinned. You're probably right there. Still, he should have insisted. Are the two of you serious? She took the small pot of honey and drizzled a little of the golden liquid into her tea. To my mother's dismay, no. There's nothing there. It was depressing, really. Here she was, about to turn thirty, and she spent her life running the book nook that was barely profitable before going home to two cats. Miss Doris reached across the table and squeezed her hand. You'll find someone. I just know it. All it takes is a little patience. I hope you're right. The only problem was, she knew almost everyone on Palmer Island. And the prospects didn't look good. There had been someone recently who'd made her heart beat faster, but with her luck, he had been a tourist and was long gone. Chapter 3 Simon, you promised to clear your things out of the dining room. His mother walked into the family room, waking Simon from his nap. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. He rose and ran his fingers through his hair. He glanced up at the TV. The game was in the seventh inning, and his team was winning by three runs. He sat up to pay attention. His mother grabbed the remote from the coffee table and turned it off. Now. I have to set the table. My friends will be here in less than two hours. She tossed the remote down and it landed with a clank. And go take a shower. You've worn that for three days straight. Seriously. She waltzed out of the room. Simon raised his arm and took a sniff. Maybe she had a point. And he had promised to clear out of the family dining room he'd been using as a temporary office since moving out of his apartment. He grabbed his phone to listen to the play-by-play -play of the game while he packed up his stuff. Are you done yet? His mother asked when she poked her head in thirty minutes later. Just about. Let me get these boxes up to my room and it's all yours. Everything he'd been working on was carefully packed and labeled. It always amazed him how much actual paperwork there still was while running a business in the 21st century. You'd think even more of this could be handled electronically. But then, his father was an old-fashioned accountant who still preferred to look over balance sheets in black and white. Simon made a mental note to look into a better electronic accounting software and secure file-sharing system for legal documents and the like. All their actual work on the app was done in the cloud already. There had to be a better solution. Ideally, something that would sync with his phone. Come back and help me pull out the table, will you? His mother busily dug for tablecloths and napkins in the china cabinet. Of course. After that, he got roped into carrying in chairs from the garage and dusting them off. He felt grimy when it was all said and done. Any fun plans for the day? Jane spread a fine linen cloth across the large oak table. It was covered in some sort of embroidery and only came out for special occasions. He started to pick up one side to help unfold it. Not with those dirty hands, his mother barked. I appreciate the help, but this is too delicate. Simon looked down. His hands were covered in dust and a few stray spiderwebs clung to his t-shirt. Do you have anything planned for this afternoon? Is this your way of asking me to make myself scarce while your library friends are here? Simon smiled. If you don't mind. You know I love having you back home. But at times it was inconvenient having your 27-year-old son living with you. I get it, and I don't mind at all. As long as you save me a piece of Miss Doris's pie. His mother's hand flew to her heart in mock dismay. Miss Doris's pie? What about the eclairs I made? I'll take one of those too. He walked out of the room before his mother could toss one of the fancy napkins at him. 
go shower, she called after him. An hour later, he pulled up on Main Street, looking for a parking spot. His hair was damp from the shower. Thankfully the air was warm and surprisingly dry for late August. He found a spot and strolled down to the bookstore he'd discovered a couple of months ago. He'd finished the book the young woman from the shop recommended two days ago and was looking forward to what else the pretty brunette would recommend. What was her name again? Sophie? When he strolled into the book nook, a different woman greeted him. Hi there, I'm Maddie. Is there something I can help you with? Before Simon could answer, a young girl with pigtails came barreling into the room. Mama, I can't find my pink crayon. I need my pink crayon to finish the elephant picture. She waved a piece of paper around and came to a sudden stop when she noticed him. I'm sorry, but this is an emergency. Simon laughed and didn't stop when he saw the mortified expression on the young woman's face. I'm in no rush, and this is clearly urgent. I'll browse while you find the pink crayon. He turned to look through the books on a nearby shelf. Let's make this quick, Willow, Maddie said. She wasn't gone long. I'm so sorry about this. Thank you for your patience. What can I help you with? I was here a couple of weeks ago. Your colleague helped me find a couple of books. I was hoping she'd have a few more recommendations for me. He held the Lord of the Rings collector's edition he'd found tucked into a corner of the shop among various other collections, first editions, and leather-bound books that smelled of dust and musk. You must be talking about Sophie. Sophia Davenport. She owns the shop. Maddie walked over and took the wooden box from him. This is a collector's edition. We have regular hardback and paperback versions in the back room. She turned and started to put the expensive item back on the shelf. I know. It's a gift for a friend. He's a big fan and this will make his day. He picked the box set back up. If you don't mind. Of course not. Her cheeks flushed pink. I can set this aside for you while we find you something new to read. Unless you'd rather come back another time. Sophie will be out most of the afternoon. I'm sure we can figure it out. I read Mistborn and enjoyed it quite a bit. I believe it's a series? He felt bad about embarrassing the young mother. He'd make it up by picking a few new books. Are you here on vacation? Maddie asked as they made their way to the science fiction and fantasy section of the store. Through a doorway, he could see the young girl sitting at a table, intent on her drawing. You could say that. I grew up here. I'm between places and decided to spend a little time with my folks. That sounded reasonable. No need to mention that he'd ran off without a new place to call his own lined up. That's nice. I'm sure they love having you back. Simon coughed. Thankfully they'd reached the Brandon Sanderson shelf. Do you have the rest of the Mistborn series? If he planned on staying out of his mother's hair more than he had so far, he'd have a lot of time to read. Of course. Hardback or paperback? We might have a few of them in the used section as well. Maddie turned to lead him into yet another room. Hardback would be nice. She looked at him, eyes wide open. I like to hang on to books I enjoy and reread them. He added a new women's fiction hardback as a peace offering for his mother and a leather-bound journal for his father. Your total is $512.87. Maddie looked at him almost apologetically. Great. He smiled to reassure her and handed her his credit card. You don't happen to have a box I can use to get this to my car? Of course. She walked off toward the back after taking his payment. He heard her talking to her daughter, but couldn't quite make out the words. Found one, Maddie said when she returned. She insisted on carefully packing the books into the box for him and walking him to the door of the shop. Wait. He turned and saw Willow, was that her name, running through the store, waving another sheet of paper in front of her. I made this for you. He set the box down on the ground and took the drawing from the girl. Is that a monkey in a tree, eating a banana? 
she nodded, her little head bobbing up and down excitedly. Do you like monkeys? I do. Almost as much as pigs. I like them so much, I used one as the logo for my company. He pulled a business card from his wallet and handed it to Willow. She took the card from him. I like your pig. She squinted, concentrating on the small letters on the card. Siamo and Simon. She held her hand out. Nice to meet you, Simon. I'm Willow. Can I keep this? Of course. And I will hang this up in my room. It was nice meeting both of you. He put the drawing in the box and picked everything up. I hope to see both of you soon. I think it may take you a while to get through all those books. Maddie put an arm around her daughter. You'd be surprised. I'm a fast reader. At least he had been in his youth. A six-book series used to be something that barely kept him occupied for a couple of weeks. Sophie. Clive Johnson had his computer open, looking through the bookstore's balance sheets. I think it's time to face the facts. The store isn't profitable, and there's only so long you can run a deficit. We're still in the middle of tourist season. I'm sure sales will continue to pick up. The numbers are better than they were earlier in the year. Not by much, but they'd managed to stay afloat so far. We're at the end of the season. Do you know what percentage of your clientele is locals versus tourists? Well, there's the book club. Her group of loyal readers usually picked up the book they were discussing along with a few others each month. How many members are there in your book club? Clyde Johnson had a pen and paper at the ready. Seven. He looked up. Seven? She nodded. Okay, then. What else? People come in to buy birthday gifts or a new book they've heard about. Numbers. I need numbers. Local buyers, average purchase amount, lifetime customer value? He had his pen poised, waiting for her to rattle off the numbers. I don't know. What goes into the bookkeeping software each month is what we take in. I wouldn't even know how to begin to calculate the rest. The pit in her stomach grew. She'd had a feeling this quarterly meeting wouldn't go well, but this was worse than usual. The way I see it, you have two options. Get rid of Maddie or close the store. Unless you can figure out some way to significantly boost your sales. He looked up and straight into her eyes. If you keep going like this, you'll be underwater by the end of the year. Your only saving grace has been the fact that you own the building. But there are taxes and upkeep. He clicked around with his mouse. I know you work hard, Sophie, but for what? You barely pay yourself. Maddie is making more than you are. Is this really what you want to keep doing? Maddie is raising a daughter. She needs the money. Firing her is out of the question. Sophie rose and picked her purse up off the floor. Sophia, sit down. Sticking your head in the sand is only putting off the inevitable. Going into bankruptcy and losing the building isn't going to help you or Madison. Mr. Johnson leaned back. Sophie took a deep breath and sat back down. Unfortunately, he was right. Coffee? She nodded. He pushed a button on the old intercom that sat on his desk. Lottie, would you bring in coffee for two, please? By the time Mr. Johnson's secretary arrived with a tray filled with cups and several different types of cookies, Sophie had gotten herself under control. Thank you. She accepted a cup, declined the store-bought cookies, and took a sip. You can make payroll if you scale back your own salary even further. Not that this is something I recommend, but it will buy you a couple of weeks. Prepare Maddie, or at least discuss cutting back her hours. I also suggest talking to someone about a marketing strategy. Take a look at what other independent bookstores are doing. Drum up some business. It used to be such a thriving shop. It had been. The store had done well and seen her father through college. Her grandmother had passed a highly profitable business on to Sophie after her own college graduation. And she'd done well the first year or two. 
But as ebooks and online shopping became more and more prevalent, sales declined. I will do that. You know. She blew her bangs out of her face. It used to be more than a bookstore. My grandmother sold stationery and the likes. We sell a few journals. Maybe we could grow that part of the shop. It is something to consider. Let's set another meeting three months from now. If you have any questions between now and then, you know I'm always here for you. Mr. Johnson rose and shook her hand. How was your meeting? Maddie asked when Sophie returned to the shop a few minutes later. Thankfully, it was a short walk from the accounting firm to the book nook. It went okay. You know how it goes. All dry numbers and stuff. Bookkeeping was Sophie's least favorite part of running her business. I'm happy to take over that part. I am good with numbers. It wasn't the first time Maddie had offered to take over the books. I'll think about it. Sophie had and while she wished she could pass off the responsibility, there was no way she'd let Maddie see how much trouble the store was in. This was her problem and she'd figure it out. Oh, I almost forgot. Maddie ran over to the cash register. We had a customer come in. He spent over $500. Seriously? Sophie looked over at her friend. Maddie nodded. I have the receipt here to prove it. That's amazing. Sophie took the slip of paper from Maddie's hand. How did you pull this off? The extra cash was the answer to her prayers. She'd be able to make this week's payroll and set aside a little to make sure her friend would get paid next week as well. Oh, it was all you dot he was looking for you. Said you helped him find a book a couple of weeks ago. Maddie looked giddy with excitement. Do you remember him? Nice looking guy, about your age. I have no idea. It had been a busy few weeks with lots of new faces in the store. It was still tourist season, after all. What did he buy? The Lord of the Rings Collector's Edition. The pricey one we got a few Christmases ago. A few other books. Oh, and a bunch of fantasy stuff. That's when it clicked. I know who he was. The guy who'd been popping up in her dreams uninvited. Chapter 4 Do you have any butternut squash? Sophie asked the young man with a three-day beard and baseball cap. The sign over the booth read Serenity Farm, Organic Produce and more. Not for another two weeks. Everything I have is out on the table and in the crates. She picked and paid for a few fresh herbs before strolling over to the next stall. Friday mornings at the farmer's market were her favorite. There was nothing like a fresh garden tomato or a dozen eggs from free-range chickens. Today though, she had a hard time finding those. Sophie was looking over a display of local honey and jams when someone bumped into her. I'm sorry, a deep voice said. She turned and looked into familiar green eyes. It's you, she blurted out. The fantasy guy. One and the same. And you're the bookstore girl. I came looking for you the other day. He grinned, causing butterflies to dance in Sophie's stomach. Simon. He held out his hand. Sophia. But everyone calls me Sophie. His warm hand engulfed hers for a moment. Either her sense of time was off, or he held it longer than appropriate for a simple handshake. Not that she minded. I heard about that. You spent a small fortune on books. He waved her off. Peanuts. And worth every penny. I'm halfway through the Mistborn series. I'm going to need some new recommendations next week. That shouldn't be a problem. It's a pretty popular genre. She smiled. Especially since you have a decade or two of new releases to catch up on. I'll take you up on that. His eyes roamed the small market tucked into an empty parking lot at the far end of Main Street. You haven't seen any butternut squash, have you? Won't be ready for another couple of weeks. She laughed at his raised eyebrows. I talked to one of the farmers. I guess they aren't quite ready yet. That's too bad. 
My mom sent me down here to pick some up for dinner tomorrow. He took a step back. I had to move unexpectedly and am staying with my parents until I can find a place down here. No need to explain. There was no way she'd move back in with her own mother, but then again, she had options. She owned her building. At least for now. Hey, you didn't happen to see any eggs? He shook his head and her head fell. It's weird. There's usually plenty at the market this time of the year. If you are up for a drive, my grandmother keeps chickens and has plenty of eggs. I'm sure she wouldn't mind sharing a dozen or so with you. Half a dozen would be plenty. Are you sure she wouldn't mind? Not at all. She's here on the island. I was at her place a couple of days ago, and she was drowning in them. Sent me home with four dozen. Your car or mine? Mine's at the store. We can take yours if it's close by. Sophie didn't advocate getting into cars with people she barely knew, but Simon was different. There'd been an instant connection. And she had her phone. Simon pointed at a row of cars parked less than 30 yards away. Is there anything else you wanted to grab here first? Sophie looked at the small bundle of herbs in her basket. No, this is it for today. Ten minutes later, they pulled up to the cutest little house with a white picket fence around it. It had some age to it but was well kept, and the front yard was an explosion of blossoms. There were rosebushes, zinnias, morning glories and all sorts of other flowers Sophie couldn't identify. Hi, Grandma, Simon said when an older woman in a summer dress and a pretty blue and yellow apron came walking up around the house. My friend Sophie here is looking for farm fresh eggs and I told her you could help her out. Welcome, Sophie. I think I can spare a few. Sophie saw where Simon got his smile and those pretty eyes of his. It's nice to meet you. Call me Grandma Wendy. The woman turned and walked into the house. Come on back. I was working in the garden. You can meet the chickens. She followed Simon and his grandmother into the garden. Several baskets, brimming with eggs, sat on the back porch. They were white and brown and even a few with green and blue hues. The girls have been busy laying. There's more here than my family and I can use. I've been trying to give some to the neighbors. Grandma Wendy pulled a couple different wire baskets off of a shelf on the back of the house and loaded them up. Oh, I don't need that many. Half a dozen would be plenty. She tried to stop the woman from packing more into the next basket. Six eggs? That's barely enough for breakfast for two days. I'm sure you can put these to good use. She finished packing the basket to the brim with eggs. Would you like a tour of the garden? You can meet the girls. They're in the back. Sophie looked at Simon. I'm in no rush, he said, a smile playing around his lips. I would love to meet your chickens, Sophie told Grandma Wendy. The older woman beamed and took Sophie's arm. Together, they walked down the path of a garden Sophie had always dreamed of having. There were plots and raised beds, tomato plants, a small potato field, and even a couple of rows of corn toward the back of the garden. The coop is back here. This time of year, I don't let them into the garden much. The girls are as fond of cucumbers and tomatoes as I am. I don't mind sharing, but they'll peck at anything ripe in sight. Grandma Wendy pointed toward a chicken coop that ran toward the back of the property. It wasn't a huge yard, but every bit of space was well used. These tomato plants look amazing. I tried to grow one of those small dwarf varieties in my living room window, but I don't think it got enough light. There's nothing like a garden fresh tomato, still ripe from the sun. You should take a few. Grandma Wendy pulled tomatoes off the vine and handed them to Sophie. And some cucumbers would go nice with those. They walked a few rows over, where a multitude of cucumber plants grew up an old trellis. Sophie couldn't believe the abundance. Simon's grandmother picked an armful of cucumbers and turned to hand them to her. Sophie's hands were full of tomatoes and it was all she could do not to drop any. Simon, go run inside and get one of my baskets. 
I want to send some zucchini and sweet peas home with the girl. You don't need to, Sophie tried to stop the woman from harvesting her entire garden. There's plenty here. What you take with you, I don't have to worry about putting up. There's only so much one old woman can eat in a year. She turned to her grandson. Time's a waste in. Yes ma'am, he told his grandmother, before sending an apologetic look at Sophie. I'll be right back. Simon chuckled as he strode back to the house. His grandmother would send the pretty bookstore owner home with enough groceries for a week or two. Thankfully, Sophie didn't seem to mind. He'd seen the way she dyed those tomatoes. Living on his own in Charlotte for a few years had made him appreciate the food his grandparents had always raised in her garden. He was glad to see his grandmother keep it up on her own since his grandfather had passed. The moment he stepped into the kitchen, he smelled the smoke. He ran to the stove and used a kitchen towel to pull the scorched pot off the flame. That's when he noticed the roll of paper towels next to the burner. It was a miracle it hadn't caught on fire. He turned the burner off and moved the roll as smoke billowed out of the pot. It was impossible to tell what his grandmother had been cooking. He threw a random lid on the pot and took it out on the porch. There you are, Simon. Where's that basket? Grandma, you had a pot burning on the stove. He held the offending object out to her. Oh dear. That's a bit of leftover chili. I was heating it up for lunch. I would have sworn I turned it way down before I went outside. The burner was on high. Sophie walked up behind his grandmother. That's burned up pretty good. Not going to be easy to clean the pot. Grandma Wendy took a closer look. Nothing a little elbow grease and some baking soda won't fix. I was really looking forward to that chili though. Did you hear me about the burner, Grandma? Simon asked. He couldn't believe how blasé his grandmother was acting. The house could have burned down. His grandmother grabbed the pot and walked past him into the kitchen. He and Sophie followed behind. This old stove won't set anything on fire. I had it on low. It barely keeps the food warm. Grandma. Simon didn't know what to say to get through to the old woman. This was serious. She could have been hurt. He felt Sophie's hand on his arm. I'm sure your grandmother meant to turn the burner to low. I've done that before. Cranked it all the way to high instead of lowering the flame. Nothing happened, and I'm sure she'll double check before heading outside next time. Of course. I've been cooking for over 60 years. Barely burned a pot. This was nothing more than an accident. Grandma Wendy turned and looked at him with her kind eyes. Don't worry, Simon. I manage fine. Now let me get that basket so you and this young woman can be on your way. I heard there was an incident with Grandma today. Clyde Johnson walked out on the deck and joined his son. I was over there with a friend of mine. Grandma was out in the garden. When I walked into the house, it was full of smoke. She'd left something cooking on the stove and forgot about it. I think the dementia is getting worse. I know. His father sighed and leaned back. We've tried different medication and your aunt is checking up on her as often as she can. But it's not enough anymore, is it? Simon let his gaze roam the ocean. It was smooth as glass. He could see the curve of the earth. It's not. We've been talking about getting her set up in a home. There are a couple of decent places, not too far from here. We should hear back on an opening soon, I hope. A home? Simon was shocked. It was the first he'd heard of the idea. Grandma doesn't want to leave her house. What about her garden and her chickens? You sound like your sister. His father ran a hand through his hair. He looked tired. What do you expect me to do? She can't be trusted to stay by herself. Your mother and I talked about having her move in with us, but... That wouldn't work out. His mother and grandmother had never gotten along all that well. Mom's gone quite a bit, so grandma would still be here by herself. 
and away from her home, her garden, and her chickens. What about a live-in nurse? It's not as easy as that. There are mobile services who would come check in on her once or twice a day. For 24 hour care, we'd have to hire a team of nurses, and frankly, that's too expensive. She'll adjust to living in a home. Simon didn't know what to say. There had to be a better solution. This was Grandma Wendy. I was wondering if you'd be interested in taking over the house for a while. That way she could come back and visit from time to time. I wouldn't expect you to keep the chickens. Taking care of his grandmother's chickens would be the least he could do. The house is plenty big. All I'd need is broadband internet. His father nodded and got up. Thank you, son. That'll make it a little easier at least. He walked inside, leaving Simon to ponder what he'd learned. Simon picked up his phone and dialed his sister's number. Hey, Summer. Do you have a minute to talk? It's about Grandma Wendy. After Simon shared the news, Summer said, You've got to be kidding me. They can't put her in a home. His baby sister sounded as upset as he felt. You've seen the people in those places. Grandma will fade away without her house and her garden. Having those chickens gives her purpose. There's got to be a better solution. I was hoping you'd have an idea. Dad and Aunt Joyce have been looking into this for a while. He shrugged, fully aware she couldn't see him all the way in Colorado. At least she'll be able to visit if I take over the house. You know. His sister went quiet. What, he prompted. Before I got the job offer in Fort Collins, I was toying with the idea of moving in with Grandma. If you were taking over the house anyway, couldn't you keep an eye on her? At least for a while. See how things go. I thought about that. I'm going to have to spend some time going back to Charlotte for meetings and stuff. I'll be around a lot, but I can't watch her 24 to 7. What if Mom or Aunt Joyce filled in when you needed to leave? Or you hired someone for a few hours a week? That's a thought. He felt the weight lift off his chest. At the very least, it's worth a try before you let them stick her in a home. Simon thought so too. Chapter 5 Do we need anything for book club tonight? Maddie asked. I can pick up some snacks on my lunch break. I have to run to the grocery store anyway. We're out of Dino Nuggets. Can't have my little girl coming home to that. Willow was spending the day with her paternal grandmother. Can't have that. Sophie laughed, she knew all about Willow's love for the breaded and fried chicken pieces. She lives on those, doesn't she? Nuggets and mac and cheese. At least the kid eats a few fruits and veggies. Maddie grabbed her purse. Crackers and cheese? That would be great. I'll go get the coffee maker from my apartment in a little while. Steve offered to bring some wine. Sophie mentally reviewed her book club checklist. The kitchen in her store was well stocked with glasses, cups, and plates. There wasn't anything else she needed to do other than print off the discussion prompts she'd typed up a few days ago. The club members were good about grabbing chairs and congregating in what used to be the living room of the large apartment her grandparents had turned into a book and stationery store. Hey, Maddie, she asked before her friend made it to the door. What do you think about expanding our stationery section? They carried a few postcards and a small assortment of blank cards and such. Nothing like what the store had carried during her grandmother's days. I don't think we sell a lot. Maybe look at the numbers and see if it makes sense? Sophie was poring over their sales when Maddie returned. The rest of the afternoon passed in a blur. Before she knew it, it was time to close up shop and set up for their monthly book club meeting. I'm going to tell you up front, this was a did not finish for me. I kept falling asleep. Can't we go back to discussing Regency romances? Cindy walked in with a tray of brownies. You can't expect me to read actual fiction after I spent all day on my feet at Mary's diner. I'm with you there. No offense to Charlotte Bronte, but I miss the pomp and the pageantry and all the drama. Steve carried two bottles of Chardonnay. 
Do you have glasses for these? Way ahead of you, Maddie called from the kitchen. She was carrying a tray of wine glasses and set them down on the table with a clank. I even found a bottle opener. She grabbed a bottle and pulled the cork out expertly. A fellow, pro. Steve grinned. Pour away. It didn't take long for everyone to get settled in and make a dent in both the wine and the cheese and crackers. Anybody ready to talk about Lucy Snow's relationship with M. Emanuel? Sophie handed out the discussion prompts she'd prepared. If we have to. Honestly, this is a lot more fun when we can gossip about the ton. This was all a little dry for my taste. Steve popped another piece of cheese into his mouth. They talked for a few minutes about the novel and the underlying conflict the author created by making one protagonist a Roman Catholic and the other a Protestant. Then there's the cultural difference between England and Belgium, Sophie started. One look at her fellow book lovers told her that it was time to call it quits. Okay, we'll pick a Regency novel for this coming month. Something by Julia Quinn maybe? Since her Bridgerton books had been adapted into a TV series, the author had become a customer favorite. Yes, please. Cindy rose and made her way over to one of the bookshelves. She brought several volumes back before the club agreed on which to read. I'll have to order a few more copies for everyone. Sophie made a mental note to call her supplier in the morning. You might want to check on the fantasy section too. Make sure you're well stocked in case that cute guy comes back in. Maddie giggled. Oh, do tell. A secret admirer who loves Lord of the Rings. He has potential. Sophie groaned. Steve didn't need any more encouragement. He'd been trying to set her up with every straight man he met at the gym for years. Oh, stop it. You're as bad as my mother. Take that back. Steve sat back, holding on to his wine glass. You cannot compare me to your mother or mine. The guys I pick are hot and fun to be around. Unlike. I take it back. It had been an unfair accusation. Sophie had known Steve for as long as she could remember. Their mothers were friends, and while her mother was annoying from time to time, she had not thrown her out on the street. Good. Now tell me about this guy. Have you been out on a date? He leaned forward. Is he from the island? Do I know him? Spill, girl. The rest of the book club sat at the edge of their seats as well. This was not how Sophie had pictured the night's discussion going. No, we haven't. The crowd looked disappointed. I met his grandmother, though. He grew up here, but only recently moved back. He came into the bookstore and I ran into him again at the farmer's market. They were out of eggs, and his grandmother has chickens. Now this has the makings of a proper romance. Shy bookstore owner meets successful businessman at the farmer's market. They bond over the adorable grandmother and rescue chickens in the process. I should be taking notes. Steve was an aspiring romance writer. As far as Sophie knew he had yet to finish writing anything, she shook her head and rose when she heard knocking at the door. Saved by the bell, she said before heading to the door. I've got it, Maddie chimed in. That's Willow. Her grandmother offered to drop her off. Thus the wine. She set her glass down and motioned for Sophie to sit back down. So tell us about this guy who took you to see his grandma. Cindy handed her a brownie. Sophie was sure it was meant as a bribe. There isn't much to tell. She's a sweet lady with a huge garden and a flock of chickens. She sent me home with a dozen eggs and a whole basket of produce. Sophie was still working her way through all of it. That's adorable. Steve helped himself to a brownie. Brownies? Can I have one? Willow came running up to the group. What's the secret word? Maddie prompted. Can I have a brownie please, Mom? Willow turned to face her mother, puppy eyes on full beam. You'll have to ask Miss Cindy. Miss Cindy? Willow blinked, may I have one of your brownies please? Of course. You can even have two. 
she piled several of the baked goodies on a small plate and handed it to Willow. The little girl curled on the couch next to Sophie and dug in with gusto. They are even better than Dino Nuggets. That's high praise, Sophie added. When are you seeing this man who loves grandmothers and fantasy books again? Laureen asked. I'm not sure. I'd love to thank his grandmother for the produce, but I'm not sure how to get a hold of Simon. Oh, we have a name. Who do we know who grew up here with that name? Cindy looked around the group. No one came up with a good answer. The island wasn't huge, but there were quite a few permanent residents. If he left right out of high school, his classmates might be our best bet. Any idea how old he is? Are you talking about Simon who came to the store? Willow asked. Maddie nodded. I know his phone number. She sat up, looking proud. How do you know his number? Maddie looked surprised and concerned. Willow handed her the plate of brownies and jumped up. She ran up to the kitchen and dug around in the drawer that held her coloring books and crayons. She came back and held a small business card out to Sophie. He gave me this. The plot thickens, Steve muttered. Go ahead, give him a call. Not happening. There was no way she was calling Simon within earshot of her book club friends. She shut her copy of Villette and poured herself another glass of wine. Any news about Grandma Wendy? Summer sounded anxious. Simon heard the hum of some type of equipment in the background. Are you calling from work? he asked. No. I'm home. The dishwasher is running, and Brayden is vacuuming. Hang on. The line went silent for a moment. Better? Much. I thought you were in the lab. Simon leaned back on his bed. His mother had a few friends over for lunch and he was hiding out in his old room. So you've got Braden trained on housework? He looked forward to his next conversation with his best friend turned brother-in-law. We're both working. Only fair we share the stuff around the house. Braden sucks at laundry. He had to hold back a laugh. Now stop stalling and tell me about grandma. She's getting confused more often. He swallowed hard. I think she even realizes that it's a problem. That's a start. What did dad think of our idea of having you move in? He's willing to give it a try. We're heading over to grandma's tonight to talk to her about it. Simon was hoping his grandmother would be at least open to giving it a try. It was move in with her or rent a condo on the mainland. Either way, I'm ready to move out. Already? That didn't take long. I spent the entire summer at home. Yeah, but you were working and staying out of the house. My computer and my files are here, and mom and I are driving each other nuts. Who knew that moving back home after being on your own for almost a decade was this hard? She complains about how I do laundry. I've been washing my own clothes since I left for college. I heard about that, Summer giggled. He didn't? It came up in conversation one night. I heard you were wearing a lot of pink there for a while. Tell that husband of yours we are going to have words the next time he comes out here. Which may not be for a while. Working remotely was working out surprisingly well so far. I will. I might even join him if I can get a few days off. Summer's voice grew softer. I miss you guys. And I'd love to see Grandma. Who knows how much longer she'll recognize us. Hey, we don't know that it will get worse. The doctors are running more tests and trying different medications. They'll do everything they can to slow down the mental decline. She'll have at least a few good years. At least he hoped she did. There were so many unknowns when it came to dementia. I know. Just in case though. Simon got it. Grandma Wendy had been a big part of their life growing up. Losing their grandfather had been hard enough. At least that had been quick. Watching one of his favorite people fade away wasn't something he was looking forward to. I know. I'll make sure she doesn't forget about you. Thank you. Tell me about Colorado. 
Are you getting settled in? Exploring the area? What's going on with you guys? Simon missed his sister and his best friend as much as they missed him. It was weird not having either of them within easy driving distance. It's been fun. Summer's mood was lifting. We've been doing quite a bit of hiking. You wouldn't believe how much fun it is to do stuff outside without all that humidity. There are a couple of good trails, just outside of town. Tell him about the park, Braden said in the background. We're driving up to Rocky Mountain National Park this weekend. We might get an annual park pass. It's supposed to be stunning. I can't wait to explore. They are supposed to have marmots just off the main trail. And pikas. I'm jealous. That sounds like a lot of fun. You'll have to come out to visit. We have a couch you can crash on. I might take you up on that. Simon would love to head out west. Aside from a few business conferences in California and Las Vegas, he hadn't been farther west than the Mississippi. It would be exciting to go exploring with Braden and Summer though he might feel like a bit of a third wheel with the newlyweds. You can always bring someone. His sister was uncanny, sometimes about picking up on his mood. The special skill seemed to work just as well when they were half a continent apart. Have you met anyone yet? Not really. Aside from one very pretty bookstore owner he couldn't stop thinking about. You have to put yourself out there, Simon. It's time to get over Megan. What you need is a rebound girl. We'll see about that. Somehow the thought of anyone calling Sophie a rebound didn't sit right. Promise me you'll at least think about asking someone out. That I can do. Because it was something that had been on his mind already. Chapter 6 How did you get my number? Sophie's heart dropped. She'd taken a chance and dialed the number on the card Simon had given Willow. It had taken her a full day to get up the courage. In the end, her desire to thank his grandmother had won out. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad you did. His voice was warm and joyful. I'm curious though. Did you work as a private investigator in your former life? Sophie laughed, the tension melting away. Nothing like that. I'm a boring little storekeeper. You gave Willow your card and when I mentioned that I wanted to thank you and your grandmother, she shared it. I'm glad she did. He must be out by the water, since Sophie heard the waves and seagulls. There's no need to thank us, though. I didn't do anything, and my grandmother loved having you over. That's sweet of you to say. I'd still love to return the favor. I've been eating the most amazing meals all week. It was true. The eggs were better than those from the farmer's market and Grandma Wendy's vegetables were something else. Even Willow had traded her Dino nuggets for a piece of tomato pie. What did you have in mind? Simon asked. Does your grandmother like to read? Books had always been her go-to gifts. Even before she took over the store. She does. At least she used to. I think there's a whole shelf of romance books in her bedroom. My grandfather used to tease her about reading them. What made her stop? Sophie couldn't imagine a week without reading a historical romance. Her eyesight I imagine, Simon sighed. There was something else that was bothering him, but Sophie didn't want to pry. Even with her readers, she has a hard time with small text. And all her books are paperbacks, Sophie guessed. How about something in large print? What type of romance does she like? There's more than one? He sounded perplexed. Sophie couldn't hold back the laugh. Of course. There's contemporary, historical, paranormal. And then there are different subcategories under each. Regency, Highlander, Beach Romances, Cowboys, Aliens, Wolves. Okay, okay. I get it. Stupid question. I don't know what she likes. I could call her and ask. But that would ruin the surprise. Sophie tapped her finger on her nose. Have you seen her books? I have. What did the cover images look like? Do you remember what was on them? 
She kept her fingers crossed. The line went quiet for a moment. Sophie had almost given up on her idea when he started talking again. They are mostly bright colors. Reds and purples. They have women in long gowns with hair flowing over their shoulders. Some of them were a little revealing. A few had ships on the covers as well. I don't remember a whole lot more. It's been a long time since I've seen them. They made quite the impression when you were young, didn't they? She hoped the smirk on her face didn't bleed into her voice. Simon laughed. They did. She wouldn't let me borrow them and my grandfather gave me an earful when he found me trying to sneak one out of the house. I bet he did. She could picture him as a boy, hiding a steamy romance novel under his shirt. Does that help? It does. It sounds like your grandmother likes historical romance. Her own favorite. It would be fun to pick something out for Simon's grandmother. Do, do they? Simon stopped. Good grief, I'm a grown man. He took a deep breath. They aren't too explicit, are they? She's in her seventies. Sophie bit her lip to keep from laughing at his discomfort. I'll pick something sweet for her, don't worry. It will be appropriate. A love story with a happy ending. Maybe something with a duke. Okay? Don't worry. She'll love it. And if she doesn't, I'll exchange it for something she does like. It's store policy. I remember that. When would you like to give this gift to my grandmother? I would give you her address, but I'm not sure she'd remember you. It might confuse her. Sophie got the feeling again that there was something he wasn't telling her. That's okay. I can pop something in the mail. What if I take you out to dinner and we can stop by my grandmother's first? Does Friday night work for you? Sophie's heart started beating faster. He was asking her to dinner. On a date. That sounds good, was all she could get out. Great. I'll pick you up at six. Unless that's too early. When does the shop close? Six o'clock works. Sophie was sure Maddie wouldn't mind closing up for her. You can pick me up out front. Great. I'll make a reservation. I'll text you when I get there. Hang on. Where are you taking me? Dread came over her at the thought of going to Shea Paul's. It was her mother's favorite and even if they didn't run into her, chances were good that someone would recognize Sophie and word would get back to her mother. I was thinking Shea Paul's. Unless that's a problem. He paused for a moment. Sophie wasn't sure how to explain her own hesitation. I was trying to impress you, but if you'd rather go somewhere a little more casual. Yes, I would, Sophie replied quickly. How about Mary's? It's pretty casual and the food is always good. Mary's is perfect. Relief flooded through her that he didn't mind the change of venue. Best of all, she didn't have to explain why she'd preferred a diner over the fanciest restaurant on Palmer Island. Sophie hung up the phone and danced through her living room. She was having dinner with Simon. And would get a chance to thank his grandmother. She slipped into her jacket and headed down to the store. It didn't take long to find the perfect book for this grandmother. A Regency romance in large print. One of her personal favorites. She grabbed a couple of nice bookmarks and headed back upstairs to wrap everything. I'm sure she'll love it. Simon drove down the road to his grandmother's house and felt Sophie practically vibrating next to him. She looked stunning in a simple natural linen dress and a dark blue cardigan. Her hair was pulled up into a ponytail, with a few strands pulled out to frame her face. He pulled into his grandmother's driveway and looked over at his passenger. His hand itched to tuck one of those strands behind her ear. To cradle her head in his hands and pull her in for a kiss. Those strawberry lips of hers had been tempting him since he drove her home a few days ago. He couldn't stop thinking about them. How they would taste, how they would feel. You really think so? Sophie unbuckled her seatbelt and tugged on her cardigan. I do. 
He stepped out of the car and quickly strode over to her side to open the door for her. He held out his hand. And if she doesn't, you have that satisfaction guaranteed policy. She took his hand and stepped out of the car. For the briefest of moments, he thought she'd keep her hand in his. Then she let go and fell into step beside him as they walked up to his grandmother's front porch. How nice of you to visit, Simon. Grandma Wendy beamed and pulled him into a tight hug. And you brought your friend from the other day. I'm sorry, dear. I forgot your name. I'm Sophie. She held out her hand. His grandmother grabbed it and pulled Sophie into a hug as well. Simon grinned. He wasn't surprised. Once his grandmother knew someone, there was no way of getting around a hug whenever she saw them. Come in, come in. I made some coffee. She walked ahead into the kitchen and turned to Sophie. Simon called this morning and told me you were coming. I brought you a little something as a thank you for those eggs and veggies the other day. Sophie held the wrapped gift out to his grandmother. You didn't have to do that. I have plenty and I enjoy being able to share with others. Sophie smiled. And I enjoy giving gifts. She held it out again, insisting his grandma take it. Open it, Simon said. I'll pour the coffee. The two women sat down and Grandma Wendy gently teased the tape off the paper. Why don't you rip into it? Simon asked. If you're gentle and careful, you can save the paper. I have a whole drawer full. Comes in handy, from time to time. Simon shook his head. He knew his grandmother had always been frugal, but this seemed excessive. I do the same thing, Sophie admitted. It's fun to have all those different types of paper to choose from. Exactly. Or finding a piece that's the perfect size for what you need to wrap. It's like a fun little puzzle. Simon smiled. Those two were getting along famously. He'd be in trouble if he didn't watch himself. This is beautiful, dear. Grandma Wendy looked at the book, her readers perched on her nose. Two leather bookmarks were tucked inside the hardcover, sticking out at the top. She turned the book over and skimmed the description on the back. I miss reading. It's a large print, Sophie said. I'm hoping that will make it a little easier on your eyes. Oh. Grandma Wendy looked surprised and opened the book. She started reading. Sitting back in her chair, she turned the page. This is much easier on the eyes. Where did you get it? I had it in my store. Sophie smiled, looking pleased. There are more? Others? Grandma Wendy closed the book, marking her spot with one of the bookmarks. Her eyes were bright with excitement. There sure are. I keep a nice little stock of the most popular books. If there's anything else you're looking for, I'm happy to special order. Not everything is available in large print but a lot more than you'd think. Come by the shop whenever you're ready for another book. I will. She looked over at her grandson. I don't think Simon would mind driving me. She turned back to Sophie. It's been hard to get around since my husband passed away. I used to drive, but it's been a long time. I don't mind one bit. Simon meant it. He needed to talk to his grandmother about his idea of moving in with her but this wasn't the time or the place. He glanced down at his watch. Look at me prowling on. You two are heading out to dinner. Don't mind me. I'm going to get comfortable in my chair and read a few chapters of this book. Let me go get some eggs, packed up, and you two can be on your way. I promised your mother some too. Grandma Wendy rose and headed over to the large walk-in pantry. Do you think she really liked it, or is she being polite? Sophie asked in a whisper. Simon couldn't resist any longer. He took her hand and squeezed it. She loved it, he said before tucking one of those strands of hair behind her ear. It was even softer and silkier than he'd imagined. Vincent, you know better than bringing a girl over. Grandma Wendy came out, two egg cartons in her hands. She set them out on the counter. 
If father catches you, he'll take you out to the woodshed. She started pulling on his arm. Take her out the side door. Grandma, I'm Simon. This is my friend Sophie. She's fine. Vincent, you need to get her out of here. Take her home. Father will be here soon. And let's hope Silly doesn't see you. She'll tell on you for sure. She kept pulling on his sleeve until Simon rose. Sophie stood up as well. Grandma Wendy pushed both of them toward the front door. Who's Vincent? Sophie whispered. Her brother. My dad's uncle. He died in Vietnam. Simon realized that his grandmother was having a full-blown episode. He'd heard about them and while he'd seen her confused, it had never been anything like this. What do we do? We can't just leave her. Sophie looked up at him. Simon wasn't sure how to best handle this. Sophie was right. They couldn't leave his grandmother. He turned and linked his arm with the old woman. It'll be fine, Wendy. Dad knows about Sophie. He likes her. It wasn't a lie, Sophie was a client of his father's. He did know her, and Simon couldn't imagine anyone not liking the amazing young woman. Vincent, seriously. You can't sweet-talk yourself out of this. Grandma Wendy grew more and more agitated, but at least they were back in the kitchen. Wendy, did you get a chance to look at this book? Sophie asked, coming to his aid. All the girls are reading it. She held the book she'd gifted his grandma out. Grandma Wendy took it. I heard about this. Sophie turned to Simon. Why don't we plan on staying here tonight? We can cook up some of these eggs and keep her company. Simon nodded. I'm sorry it'll mess up our dinner plans, but that would probably be best. He would make it up to her. Why don't I get her settled with her book and you see what you can find that goes with eggs? Sophie took his grandmother by the arm and led her into the adjoining living room. He heard the two of them talking softly as he dug around the fridge, pulling out a bit of ham, some shredded cheese, and a few leftover veggies. She's calmed down, Sophie said when she walked back into the kitchen a few minutes later. Getting into her book. I think she'll be fine. Thanks so much, for your help. Simon looked over to see his grandmother through the large opening to the living room. She had a blanket tucked around her legs and was holding her book, intently reading. The lamp on the side table next to her gave plenty of light, and she looked comfortable and calm in her favorite chair. Glancing up, she waved at him. Sophie picked a wonderful book. She's a keeper Simon, she called. Simon felt the heat rising in his cheeks. Looks like we have everything here to make some omelets, Sophie said without skipping a beat. Do you want to chop veggies or scramble eggs? You chop, I cook the eggs. He pulled a cutting board out of the drawer and handed it to her. You've got it. Sophie grabbed a knife from the butcher block and got to work. Thirty minutes later, he slid the last of the omelets from the pan onto a pre-warmed plate. He sprinkled a little of the parsley Sophie chopped on top. I think we're ready to eat. Let me see if I can pull your grandmother out of her book. Sophie smiled and walked into the living room, her linen dress moving gently, hugging her hips. Simon swallowed and forced himself to turn around. He grabbed the first two plates from the warm oven and started setting the table. By the time he was finished, Sophie and Grandma Wendy walked in. This is really good. Sophie sounded surprised. Simon has always been a good cook. He used to help me make cookies when he was this tall. Grandma Wendy held her arm out at table level. I think I was a little older than that. Oh no. You were a tiny little thing. Standing on that kitchen chair over by the counter, stirring the batter and getting flour everywhere. Grandma Wendy giggled. It was all I could do to keep you from throwing eggs in, shell, and all. I did teach you to crack eggs early on, though. I remember. She put her fork down. I remember your mama didn't believe you could crack an egg. You showed her. Simon smiled. 
He remembered that particular episode from his childhood and how proud he had felt at the accomplishment. No wonder you're a good cook. You started early and learned from the best. Sophie took another bite really good. You can cook me dinner anytime. I'll make a note of that. He speared a piece of mushroom with his fork. I still owe you a dinner out, though. Does tomorrow evening work for you? I've been looking forward to one of Mary's burgers since I've come back. You don't need me to grab a burger at Mary's. Sophie's cheeks turned a lovely shade of pink, and he didn't think it had anything to do with the warmth of the kitchen or the food. But it would make it so much more enjoyable. Of course she'll go. She's smitten with you. Grandma Wendy patted his hand. If everyone's finished, you'd better take her home. I have a date with a duke. Chapter 7 I'm glad you decided to come out with me tonight, Simon said, holding the car door open. Well, you did talk up those burgers. Sophie climbed out of the car and straightened her skirt. Why was she so nervous? It wasn't the first time she'd gone out to dinner with someone. And she'd wanted to eat at Mary's for ages. She took a deep breath. Ready? His lips twitched. He held his arm out for her. Ready. Sophie took it, and together, they crossed the gravel parking lot. Simon held the door to the diner open for her, and she was sure he would have pulled her chair out as well. Thankfully, Cindy from Book Club was working and seated them in a booth. It's been a while Simon. Are you having your usual? Cindy pulled a small paper pad from her apron pocket, ready to take their order. Mind if we look over the menu for a few? Simon asked. Not at all. Cindy handed them each a plastic-covered menu. I'll bring y'all some water and rolls. Unless you know what you're drinking. Do you have Dr. Pepper? Sophie asked. Of course. One Dr. Pepper coming up. How about you, Simon? Do you need a minute? The beverage list is on the back. Cindy's eyes were sparkling almost as much as the ring on her finger. I'll take a Coke, Simon said, putting the menu down in front of him. How's Max? Weren't you guys moving somewhere up north? We thought about it. Took a trip to see his family during the off-season. I didn't care for the snow after a day or two. She shrugged. We like it down here. And I missed this place. Cindy married a writer. I have no idea why she's still working here. Simon explained after Cindy left. Maybe she likes the people? Sophie couldn't imagine not running the book nook. She enjoyed helping customers find a new favorite and guessed it was similar for Cindy. They know you pretty well here. It's hard not to be a regular at Mary's when you grow up on the island. Simon leaned back in his seat and unwrapped the silverware. I'm surprised we haven't run into each other here. Sophie laughed, her eyes roaming over the cozy dining room. This isn't really my mother's scene. There's a chance my grandparents brought me when I was little, but I don't remember eating here. I've been meaning to try it. But eating dinner by yourself in a diner full of people seemed awkward. You're in for a treat, then. Simon opened up his menu. What kind of food do you like? Burgers, pasta, fish, shrimp, home cooking? Honestly, you can't go wrong with any of this. What's your favorite? Bacon cheeseburgers and chili cheese fries. There was no hesitation. And peanut butter pie for dessert. I take it that's your regular order? She grinned up at him before looking through her own menu. How's the grilled shrimp paboy? It's my friend Parker's favorite. He has it and a large order of onion rings any time he comes back home. Sophie thought for a minute. Onion rings sounded delicious, but not what she wanted to eat on a first date. Here are your drinks. Dr. Pepper for the lady, and a Coke for you, Simon. Cindy set their beverages down before pulling a basket of warm rolls and a small dish of soft butter from her tray. Are you ready to order, or would you like another minute? Simon looked at her. I'm ready, if you are. The smell of the warm yeasty rolls made her mouth water. 
I'll have the usual, Simon said, and Cindy nodded. How about you? The waitress looked at Sophie, pen, and paper at the ready. I'll take the grilled shrimp paboy with sweet potato fries and tartar sauce on the side, please. Excellent choice. It's my husband's favorite. It's a little busy right now, but I'll get this out to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, let me know if you'd like more rolls. Cindy briskly crossed the distance to another table of new arrivals. Sophie looked at the basket. It held four decent-sized rolls. If they went through those, they wouldn't need their dinner. Sorry about that. I forgot how crowded it gets on Friday nights, Simon said. I don't mind, Sophie said. None of her mother's friends would be caught dead in a diner and slow service would mean more time with Simon. Nope, she didn't mind at all. I can't believe you've never been to Mary's. Everyone I knew hung out here after school. He picked one of the rolls from the basket and smeared butter on it. Taking a big bite, he looked at her for an answer. I went to a boarding school upstate. I spent my breaks here, but didn't live here full-time until I graduated college and took over the bookstore. Her mother hadn't approved of Palmer High or any public school, for that matter. Instead, Sophie had spent her teenage year at an all-girls boarding school with few opportunities to leave the grounds. That sounds like fun. I'm sure you made some great friends. He popped the rest of the roll into his mouth. I did but you know how it goes. Everyone drifted away after we graduated. Went to different colleges. She shrugged. It had been a few years since she'd talked to anyone from St. Mary's. It's easy for that to happen. Parker, Braden, and I had to work on staying in touch. Well, not so much me and Braden. We were roommates in college and started a company together. Parker, though, we had to hound him to come down and drag him out surfing. Simon's gaze went to a picture on the other side of the room. It was hard to make out, but looked like three young boys holding up surfboards. Is that you? And your friends, she asked. Simon nodded. We spent all summer on our boards. Or at the arcade, by the pier. And they'd stop in here, begging me to give them a deal on milkshakes. An older woman in a full apron walked up to their table. Mary. Simon jumped up and hugged her. I'm surprised to see you out of the kitchen. I have some help. And Cindy told me you were back. I wanted to stop by and say hello. I don't want to interrupt your date, though. Food should be coming out shortly. She leaned in to give Simon another hug and whispered something into his ear, before turning to Sophie. I'm Mary. Any friend of the Johnsons is a friend of mine. She held her hand out and Sophie shook it. Mary had warm hands and a firm grip. The diner is yours. Sophie looked around appreciatively. It's a great place. I can't believe it's taken me this long to come in. I'm Sophie. Sophie Davenport. Martha's granddaughter? Mary looked surprised. Sophie nodded. Come here. Mary pulled her up and into a tight hug. I haven't seen you since you were a tiny thing. Your grandparents were some of my favorite customers. And your grandfather helped me out of a bind more than once when I started this place. She pulled away and looked Sophie up and down. My, you've grown into a beautiful young woman. And you have your grandmother's eyes. Come with me. I want to show you something. Mary grabbed her hand and pulled her toward the back wall of the restaurant. Sophie had no choice but to follow her. She glanced back and saw Simon following them. This was taken the day we opened. Mary pointed to a faded black and white photograph. Those are my grandparents. They were sitting in one of the booths, sharing a milkshake. Faith and Joshua Davenport were my first customers. Mary's face was lit up with pride. I had no idea. Regret rolled through her. This place was connected to her father's side of the family, yet it was the first time in her adult life that she'd set foot inside. I'm sorry, Mary. If I'd known, I would have come in a long time ago. Mary waved her off. 
nothing to be sorry about. I know how your mother raised you. I'm glad not all of that rubbed off on you. Simon wouldn't be courting you if you were anything like her. Sophie had to bite back a grin. Courting was such an old-fashioned term. She avoided looking at Simon, choosing instead to inspect the picture more closely. I can't believe how young they both look in this. Your father was in high school when I opened, so they weren't all that young. Offered him a job as a busboy, but that man had higher ambitions. She shook her head. I'd better get back to the kitchen and check on your food. It was good to see you again. And I'm sorry about hijacking your date, Simon. Sophie got the feeling that Mary wasn't sorry at all. You didn't, and I learned all kinds of interesting things about, my, he coughed. About Sophie. It's been an enlightening encounter. He walked over to look at the picture himself. Don't be a stranger, Sophie. You're welcome to have a meal on the house anytime. Mary gave her another quick hug before tightening her apron and hurrying back to the kitchen. That's not an offer she makes very often, Simon said before motioning for Sophie to walk ahead of him, back to their booth. I can imagine it would put her out of business if she did. Sophie sat down and took a sip of her Dr. Pepper. Soda was a rare treat. Oh, definitely. I bet Brayden, Parker, and I could have eaten her into bankruptcy. My father said we came close to eating him out of house and home. He grabbed another roll. I can see that, she teased, before picking up one of her own. They were soft and fluffy, still warm from the oven. The butter melted right into them. Simon laughed. This is me after skipping lunch. Nothing like teenage me after a day spent in the ocean. He turned to look toward the kitchen. Cindy was on her way with a large tray. Shrimp paboy, sweet potato fries, and tartar sauce on the side. She put the plate in front of Sophie. It smelled amazing. The fries looked hand-cut and crispy, with a hint of coarse salt on them. The sandwich was bigger than she expected and stuffed with plump shrimp and a bit of coleslaw. A large dill pickle was on the plate as well. And for you, the usual. Enjoy. Cindy placed a large bottle of ketchup on the table and left. Dig in, Simon said. He didn't waste any time picking up his burger. The food tasted as delicious as it looked. Sophie ate half of her shrimp sandwich before turning her attention to the sweet potato fries. She picked them up and dipped them into the tartar sauce. That's an interesting combination, Simon said, poking his chili cheese fries with a fork. Look who's talking. Sophie popped the fry into her mouth and took a sip of soda to wash it down. It started as a rebellious teenage act. Shea Paul's doesn't serve fries or any finger food. But they did have sweet potato fries for a while. It would embarrass my mother to no end when I did this. She picked up another fry, coating it in the chunky tartar sauce. Turns out, it's actually really good. Wanna try? She pushed her plate to the center of the table. Simon snagged one of the fries and dipped it. She watched him closely as it disappeared into his mouth. Not bad. Not as good as these, though. He pushed his plate next to hers. Sophie picked up her fork and speared a few of the fries covered in thick chili and melted cheese. Hot, she gasped when the cheese hit the roof of her mouth. Her hand flew up to cover her mouth. She took a sip of her drink. I'm sorry. Simon looked petrified. I should have warned you. There are some hot spots in there with the melted cheese. It's okay. I didn't get burned. It startled me, that's all. She took another bite to prove her point. They are delicious, but you're wrong. These are better. She pointed to her sweet potato fries. To each their own, he said, looking relieved. Did you leave any room for dessert? Cindy asked when she came to collect their mostly empty plates. Well, Simon's was empty, hers held the pickle and a little leftover tartar sauce. There's always room for peanut butter pie, Simon said enthusiastically. Sophie shook her head. 
She didn't see how he could eat anything else after finishing off her fries. You have to at least try it. Coffee? She nodded. Two cups of coffee and a slice of the pie with two forks, please. Simon shot Cindy one of those smirky smiles that sent the butterflies in Sophie's stomach all aflutter. It didn't seem to have the same effect on the waitress. You've got it. Simon walked her to the door and waited for her to unlock it. I had a great time, Sophie said, keeping the door pulled closed. She didn't need a repeat escape from Misty. I did too. He stepped closer and for a moment Sophie thought he might kiss her. Should she let him? It was early in their relationship. If that's even what she could call it. But instead, he tucked a strand of her hair back behind her ear and retreated half a step. Listen, I'm going up to Clemson tomorrow, but I'd love to see you again when I get back. When do you come back? she asked. Sophie couldn't withhold her smile. The thought of him wanting to spend more time with her made her happy. He made her happy. She'd been smiling all night. Day after tomorrow. My friend Parker is on the faculty. I promised to come up for a ball game this season. His warm eyes were glued to hers. That sounds like fun. Should be a good game against Wake Forest. She looked forward to it. Watching college football with her dad had been a favorite growing up and something that still made her feel close to him. Simon raised an eyebrow. You like college football? I do. I wish I could invite you to come up with me. Sophie waved him off. Impossible to get an extra ticket, and I have to man the shop. You go have a great time with your friend. I'm sure the two of you don't get to see each other much. Very true. He's going through a bit of a rough time, and we promised him to come up earlier this summer. Braden and I. I'd better get inside and feed these guys. Dogs? Simon asked. Cats. Misty and Alfred. Their rescues and their main mission in life is food. That and trying to escape the apartment. I won't hold you up, then. Wouldn't want to get on to Misty and Alfred's bad side. He leaned over and pressed his lips to her cheek for a heartbeat. Good night, Sophie. Good night. Her hand flew to her cheek, keeping in the warmth from his lips as she watched him walk down the steps. Simon knocked on the solid oak door. Dr. Parker Flag Physics was written in bold, gold letters on the door. Come in. The voice was muffled, but he'd recognize it anywhere. I hope I'm not interrupting anything important, Professor. Simon walked in, ready for a fun day at Death Valley. The noise, the excitement. There was nothing like watching the Tigers play in their stadium. It sat right in the middle of campus, and he hoped they weren't sitting in the nosebleed section. The stadium seating was steep and being stuck in the top section was no piece of cake. Not that he'd walk away. Parker sat at his large desk, a manila envelope and a stack of paperwork in front of him, staring at a piece of paper in his hands. What's wrong? Simon sat down on the other side of the desk, presumably in the chair where Parker's students sat, asking for advice during office hours or being lectured after botched exams. Parker looked up, his face white. She served me with papers. Who? For what? Someone was suing Parker? What in the world could you sue a college professor over? It didn't make sense. Liza is asking for a divorce. Parker put the paper down and slid the entire stack over to Simon. We've been separated for a while, but I figured we'd at least talk about this. Man, I'm sorry. Give me a minute to get my head on straight. Parker glanced down at his watch. We have enough time to grab some wings and beers before the game. Forget about the game, Simon said. We're going to go on a beer and pizza run, and then we're going to hang out at your place. Unless there's a bar you'd rather go to. You need to blow off some steam. A bar is probably not the best idea. That's what I thought. In a college town like this, you couldn't find a bar without students. 
and there was no way Parker would have more than two beers if he was out where he might run into some of his. How's your bourbon situation? Well stocked. Parker rolled his chair back. Are you sure you want to do this? You've been looking forward to this game for weeks. Absolutely. There's no way we're spending the evening at the stadium. We can always catch the game on TV. I'm guessing it won't be blacked out? No way. It'll be packed. If you're sure, I know just the place for pizza. They picked up two pies from a small independent pizza shop a block from campus and stopped at the gas station on the way back for beer. By the time they got back to Parker's small house, the sun was setting and the noise from the stadium rolled over the town. I appreciate this. Parker stretched out on one end of the large leather couch, putting his feet on the coffee table. Of course. Though this has some benefits. Simon directed his gaze at Parker's feet. I don't think we could have gotten away with this before. Parker laughed. It wasn't a happy laugh. More of a bark, but it was a start. You're right. We wouldn't be eating pizza straight from the carton either. He grabbed his beer and drank half of it before setting it back down. Ready for the game? Simon asked. Parker nodded and turned his big screen TV on. They'd made it in time to watch the team, led by their coach, run down the steep grass hill and onto the field. The phone rang. It was Simon. Sophie picked it up and walked into the next room. Are you sure this is a good idea, someone said in the background. Simon? Hi, Sophie. Ahem. He paused, and Sophie heard the football game in the background along with a team of announcers. It didn't sound like he was calling from the stadium. Everything okay? Yeah, everything is great. I'm hanging with my bud Parker, watching the game. Did, did you see that interception? He sounded drunk. I missed it. How's the game? Oh, it's great. Pizza's good too. The sound of the game became louder. Games back on, she heard a male voice yell but that was all Sophie could make out. I'll be right back. A door opened and closed, the background noise became more muffled. Sorry about that. We're watching the game. Sophie smiled. I got that. Doesn't sound like you're at the stadium. What happened? Oh, that. Simon sighed. It's Parker. I couldn't leave him or drag him out to the stadium. It's full of students. You know. He wasn't making sense. What happened to your friend Parker? Liza. She served him with papers. Glass clinked on glass. Setting a beer bottle or pint glass down on a table maybe? Who's Liza? This conversation was getting trickier by the minute. Parker's wife. She wants a divorce. Simon burped. His voice went down to a loud whisper. He's a mess. That's why I couldn't leave him. Sophie had to hold back a laugh. It was a good thing the TV in the next room was loud enough that she could still hear it. Buzzed Simon wasn't very good at whispering. You're a good friend, she said when he didn't continue. I don't know about that. But I do what I can. Be here for him. Shame Braden isn't. Sophie wasn't sure what to say. Why did you call, she said a few moments later. I miss you. And I wanted to hear what you think of the game so far. He took another sip of whatever he was drinking. I haven't been able to watch it. My mother asked me to stop by. She'd called Sophie right before closing, asking her to come over as soon as possible. It was urgent. When Sophie arrived, she learned the urgent matter was sorting through dresses left in the closet of her old bedroom. Her mother had plans for the room and wanted to sort through the gowns with her daughter. Sophie shook her head, thinking about the mountain of dresses on her bed. She couldn't see herself wearing any of them again, but her mother had a different opinion. A loud knock sounded at the bathroom door. Mother was getting impatient. Listen, I have to go but I'm glad you're able to help your friend through this. 
You're spending the night on campus? She hoped he didn't have plans to drive back tonight. Yeah. I'll crash in Parker's guest room. His place is nice. Good. And Simon, I miss you too. Me too. The knocking on the door started again. Sophie. We should finish this. I don't have all night. Her mother's voice was edgy now. I'll be right there, Sophie said loudly, covering the receiver. Call me when you get back home. And enjoy the rest of the game. Go Tigers, he said before hanging up. Who was that, her mother asked when Sophie opened the door. A friend. She hoped he was becoming more than that, but that wasn't something she wanted to discuss with her mother. Introducing him to her would be hard enough when the time came. If it came. Chapter 8 I'm meeting my mother for brunch, Sophie told the brunette hostess when she walked into Shea Paul's. Of course, Miss Davenport. Your party is already seated. Right this way. The young woman dressed in a white blouse and black pencil skirt walked toward the main dining room. My party? I'm only meeting my mother. Sophie put her hand on the hostess's arm to stop her. She seated with two others. I believe they are waiting on you. The woman smiled politely. Are you ready? Could you tell me who is at my mother's table? Sophie held her breath and hoped for the best. Mrs. Whitefield and her son, the woman said, looking over at the bar. Sophie took a moment to compose herself. Her mother hadn't mentioned anyone joining them for their standing mother-daughter brunch date. The first Sunday morning of each month, the two of them had eggs benedict and mimosas at Shea Paul's. Rarely had anyone joined them other than her grandmother. And Grandma Lulu was in Arizona for the winter. I can tell them you called. That there was an emergency, if you'd like, the hostess offered. That is very kind of you. Sophie looked for a name tag. Of course a place like Shea Paul's didn't have something as tacky as name tags for its staff. Amy. She smiled at Sophie. I never said this, but I wouldn't want to have a meal with Martin Whitefield either. He, he isn't always gentlemanly around the girls. I'm sorry. Sophie knew better than to pry in the middle of the restaurant. Especially since the door opened and an older couple walked in. She was surprised, though. Martin and she didn't have chemistry, but he'd always treated her with kindness and respect. Amy looked at her expectantly. Sophie was tempted, but she'd never get away with skipping brunch. I'm ready to join them. She nodded to herself as much as to the hostess. If you're sure. Amy gave her a second to change her mind, then turned and walked into the dining room. Sophia. I'm glad you could join us. Her mother glanced at her watch. There was no way she was more than five minutes late. I'll tell your waitress that you're ready. Amy smiled at Sophie and walked off. Martin rose and pulled a chair out for her. Nice to see you, Sophia. She nodded and took her seat. I didn't realize the two of you would join us this morning. How are you, Mrs. Whitefield? Your mother was kind enough to invite us when we ran into each other at the club on Wednesday. Mrs. Whitefield grabbed her hand and squeezed it. I'm glad she did. It has been a while since I've seen you. Sophie pulled her hand back and busied herself unrolling the silverware from the linen napkin. I didn't get a chance to talk to you at the Heritage Ball. You left before I could join you and Martin. Sophie felt the heat rise in her cheeks. The seafood incident wasn't something she wished to dwell on. And by the look of Mrs. Whitefield, she had been there and witnessed the entire event. Including Sophie's exit without her son. Sophie realized why her mother had asked the Whitefields to join them here at Shea Paul's. The rumor mill at the country club must have been spinning with stories that Sophia and Martin were on the outs. What better way to show that all was well than a public appearance at the high-end Palmer Island restaurant? Sophie couldn't wait to get her mother alone. Can I get everyone started with something to drink? Their waiter was a tall older gentleman. 
He handed each of them a small leather-bound menu that held the day's brunch offerings. My daughter and I will have mimosas, Pamela Davenport said before handing the menu back. I think I'll have a coffee instead, Sophie interrupted. She opened her menu and looked at what the restaurant had to offer for the first time in years. She suddenly wasn't in the mood for Eggs Benedict. Martin joined her in ordering coffee, and his mother opted for a mimosa as well. By the time the waiter arrived with their tray of drinks, everyone was ready to order. Unsurprisingly, everyone but her ordered Eggs Benedict. It was the brunch dish that Shea Paul's was famous for and included a nice heaping of plump crab meat. I'd like the French toast. Hold the truffles. And a side of bacon. Sophie avoided eye contact with her mother, she'd surely object to the order. How are your cats? Martin asked. It was an obvious attempt at making conversation. Alfred and Misty are great. No escape so far. Sophia insists on keeping two cats inside the house, her mother explained. She'd made it clear, more than once, that cats belong outside or in barns where they could earn their keep hunting small rodents. How lovely. I have a Persian myself. Let me show you. Mrs. Whitefield pulled her phone from her purse and started swiping until she found the picture she'd been looking for. This is Percival. He's my pride and joy. A majestic-looking white cat with a long, flowing coat lounged on a small pet-sized leather couch. He's beautiful, Sophie said. He really was. The cat looked well-groomed and content in the image. Thank you. He keeps me company now that Martin no longer lives at home. They are such a comfort and joy, aren't they? Mrs. Whitefield looked lovingly at her phone. Sophie nodded. Martin, did I hear a rumor that you're starting a new development just south of here? Pamela Davenport was obvious in her attempt to change the topic of conversation from cats to something she deemed more appropriate. We're in the early stages, but so far so good. It will be a series of shops and offices surrounded by high-end condos with access to a private beach. Martin looked more animated than he had so far. There was a gleam of excitement in his eyes. My company is partnering with Sutton and Sutton Corporation out of Arizona. How exciting. I know Evelyn Sutton well. She spends a few months a year here on the island. Please let me know if you. I appreciate the offer. I have a good working relationship with her son. Martin took a sip of coffee, his eyes roaming the dining room. Thankfully, their food arrived quickly. Sophie's toast was crisp and covered in powdered sugar. The bacon was cooked to perfection. It was all she could do not to sigh constantly when she bit into the first piece. Sophia, her mother missed. Use your fork. Sophie used her fork to cut a bite of French toast before using her fingers to pick up another strip of crispy bacon. This is about that guy, isn't it? The one who called yesterday. Her mother tisked sked and shook her head in disapproval. This has nothing to do with Simon. Martin and I are friends. We've never been anything more than that, nor will we ever be. The sooner you both accept it, the better off we'll all be. Sophie looked at Martin, hoping he'd back her up. The pain in his eyes surprised her. He took his phone out of his jacket pocket and glanced at it. I'm so sorry ladies, but I have to head to the office. He smiled apologetically at Sophie and her mother before turning to his. Would you like me to drop you off now, or would you prefer to finish brunch? I can have Peggy order you a car. I'm happy to drive you home, Mrs. Whitefield, Sophie said. Her mother shook her head. I'll take her. I'm valet parked. If that's all right with you, my dear. Of course. Go take care of business, son, and make sure Peggy orders you lunch. You didn't eat much. Sophie glanced at his mostly empty plate. Ladies. He rose and left, leaving Sophie finishing her meal in awkward silence with their mothers. Chapter 9 How was the rest of your trip? Sophie asked when Simon picked her up a few days later. 
he'd texted her when he'd made it home the following day and called her to ask if she was available this morning. He'd refused to give her a hint about what they were going to do. It was good. Clemson won and I got to spend time with Parker. He grinned and held the door open for her. It was a good game. I can't believe you missed it. Me neither. Parents. What can you do? She sat down and put her seat belt on. She hoped she was dressed for the occasion. The flowery summer dress and cardigan she'd chosen were dressy enough if he planned on taking her out to breakfast, but casual enough for just about anything else. To be safe, she'd picked her most comfortable sandals. No heels that would get in the way of a short hike. Her crossbody purse held all the essentials. Lipstick, sunglasses, a water bottle, and a granola bar, along with her wallet, her phone, and a bit of emergency cash. You look beautiful. He said as he cranked up the car. Thank you. I hope it's appropriate. Since you won't tell me where we're going. Stop fishing for hints. We'll be there in a few minutes, and you'll see. And yes. Your outfit is perfect. He pulled onto the main road and headed south. A few minutes later, they pulled into the parking lot of the small Palmer Island Marina. Simon held out his hand to help her out of the car and then kept holding it as they walked out to one of the docks. They walked up to one of the smaller boats. Sophie wasn't sure if it was considered a yacht, but it was certainly bigger than the average fishing boat. Yours, she asked, surprised. My family's. My father's, to be honest. We used to take it out all the time to go swimming on one of the barrier islands when Summer and I were little. He walked on board and held a hand out for her. And I may have had a party or two here in high school. I can see that. The deck was surprisingly large. What's the plan? We're having breakfast here? Or did you just want to show off your yacht? She grinned. When we were talking on the phone the other day, you mentioned that you've never been to the old lighthouse. I thought we'd cruise out there and take a look. He opened a small door leading to the yacht's interior. She could see a small galley and a table and bench. I'll cook you breakfast when we get there. Aye aye, Captain. Sophie pulled her hair into a tight ponytail while Simon readied the boat. They took off and rode the calm Atlantic Ocean to one of the many barrier islands off the South Carolina coast. It wasn't long before Sophie spotted the tall black and white tower of the Shell Island Lighthouse. Can you hop out and grab the rope? Simon asked when they docked on the small wooden pier not far from the lighthouse. No problem. She jumped onto the dock and caught the rope Simon threw to her. Hold on to it. I'll come tie it off, he called. Sophie laughed and got to work. This wasn't her first time on a boat. It had been a while, but she remembered how to tie a rolling hitch. Nice work. Simon looked impressed before double-checking her knot and tightening it minimally. Sophie snorted. Her hitch was fine. Taking her out on the boat had been a great idea. Simon sat back in the warm sand and dug his toes into it. He watched as Sophie walked up and down the beach, her head down, looking for shells. The soft breeze of the ocean moved her hair and her skirt. She looked happier and more relaxed than he'd ever seen her. When he'd picked Sophie up, she'd looked curious, but there was something she was hiding. No, hiding was too strong of a word. Guarded, maybe? He couldn't explain it, but all that was gone, and she looked carefree and happy. And he was falling for this woman. The feeling surprised him. A few days ago, he'd been nursing what he thought was a broken heart. Here on the beach, staring out over the ocean, he realized that he'd been wrong. His feelings when Megan left him had simply been wounded pride. Their relationship had cooled long ago, and even before that, it had been chemistry and physical attraction that had brought them together. What he felt for Sophie was different. It was warmer, more intense. Hard to explain. Sophie walked up and plopped in the sand next to him. I can't believe I've never been out here. This place is beautiful. I've seen pictures, of course. 
There's a book about the history of the lighthouses in the area that we carry in the shop, she shook her head and smiled. Simon looked over at her. And you read it? Are you sure you're interested in this at all? She looked first at him, then at the lighthouse that sat a little farther down the beach. Of course I am. Don't leave me hanging. What do you know about the lighthouse? He smiled encouragingly. Granted, he'd never been a big history buff, but if it was interesting to her, he wanted to hear about it. This was the last inhabited lighthouse in the area. There was an old man living in it long after the light fixture had been automated. He raised his family here. His wife is buried somewhere on the small island. He refused to leave even after he retired. He ended up staying, living here by himself, only going to the mainland for supplies. He died in the small house that used to stand here and was laid to rest next to his wife. I think it was sometime in the 80s. Simon jumped up and held out his hand. Let's see if we can find them. The island isn't all that large and I'm pretty sure I know where the house is. She took his hand and let him pull her up. Her hand felt warm and comfortable in his. She didn't pull it away as they walked in the direction of the lighthouse. From there, he took her to the center of the small island. The foundation of the old lightkeeper's house was a few hundred yards from the actual lighthouse. Hurricane Hugo destroyed most of the building, Simon explained. He walked the perimeter of the house with her. I wonder where the graves could be. I don't think they would be too far away. They may be overgrown, though. Sophie spun around and scanned their surroundings. There, doesn't that look like a piece of cast iron fence? She pointed north. Sure enough, there was a bit of fence he'd never noticed before sticking out of a bush. I see it. He walked toward it, Sophie following close behind. I think this is it. Sophie peeked over the fence. Simon stepped up beside her. I think you're right. He walked along the side of the short fence until he found a gate. The hinges were rusted and it took some effort, but he was able to push it open far enough for them to squeeze through. To his surprise, the cemetery was larger than he'd expected. He could make out at least ten grave markers in the area, surrounded by the iron fence. Look at this. Sophie walked around, studying the small stone plates. Most of them were engraved simply with the names and dates. A few included a Bible verse or saying. Some of these must be children's graves. I wonder if the lightkeeper's wives gave birth and raised them here on this tiny island. I'm sure they did. Families lived here, only going to the mainland or one of the bigger islands for supplies. He followed her to the grave she was standing over. January 1876 to March 1877. Barely a year old. He couldn't imagine what those people had gone through. More deaths in 1877. I wonder what happened. Sophie slowly walked from stone marker to stone marker. Studying them. My guess is either some sort of sickness, like a bad flu, or a hurricane. There's a marker on the island for people lost in one of the bad ones. Back before they had much advanced warning. Before the storms had been assigned names. Living on the coast and even more so on a small island like this, with no noticeable elevation aside from the lighthouse must have been quite the gamble. They were both in a somber mood when they left the small graveyard. Next time, let's bring a few flowers and candles, Sophie suggested. To make sure they know they aren't forgotten. Simon nodded. He liked the idea. And he especially liked that she wanted to come back with him. Spend more time together. Do you want to see if we can climb the tower? It's been a long time, but from what I remember, you have an amazing view from up there. Is it safe? Sophie looked up at the old lighthouse. Simon shrugged. It's old, and not open to the public, but they don't seem to go out of their way to discourage people from getting in. He jogged up to the side of the lighthouse and pulled on the wooden door. It popped off with little effort. From the looks of it, it was nailed shut, but had been pulled open a few times over the years. Close by was a rock that looked like a good makeshift hammer. 
Up for an adventure? He asked, holding his hand out for Sophie. He used the flashlight on his phone to light up the interior of the narrow tower. It was a small lighthouse, much of the interior taken up by an old spiral staircase made from wrought iron. Several shelves and cabinets took up the remaining space. They were worn and missing quite a few doors, but it was easy to imagine what this space had looked like a few decades ago when the last lightkeeper had lived here. This has been preserved really well. Especially considering the shape the house must have been in for them to completely tear it down. Sophie strolled around the room, peeking into cabinets and around structures. Simon tested the first few runs of the stairs. They seemed solid enough. Ready to head up? He asked, looking back at Sophie. As ready as I'll ever be. She looked a little worried. Are you sure this will hold us? Simon thought for a minute. Here's what we're going to do. I'll head up a flight to test the staircase. I'll call out to you when I get there and you can follow. Rinse and repeat until we make it to the top. Ready? He sprinted up the first set of steps. Safe to come up, he called down to her. She joined him quickly, her eyes bright and her cheeks flush with excitement. They continued up quickly. Slow down, Sophie huffed when they were close to the top. I can't breathe. He stopped and waited for her. There was hardly any room aside from the stairs and the metal handrail. We're almost there. She nodded and he walked up the remaining flight, taking his time and carefully testing each step. A fall from here could be deadly and he needed to keep her safe. Wow. Sophie walked out onto the narrow catwalk that sat just below the large enclosed lens that used to send its beam of light far out into the ocean. You were right. The view is stunning. You can see all of Palmer Island and way up into Myrtle Beach from here. They'd gotten lucky. It was a clear day with not a cloud in the Carolina blue sky. The air was dry for this time of the year, making for farther, clearer views than usual. Simon wished he'd brought his DSLR camera out. His phone wouldn't do the panorama unfolding around him justice. Sophie's thoughts must have traveled along the same lines. She pulled her phone from her purse and snapped a few pictures. Let me get one of you. Lean up against the railing there, with the island in the background, she suggested. Simon put his back to the place where they'd both grown up, one hand on the rough metal, and smiled. A heartbeat after he heard the fake shutter sound from her phone, the metal creaked and gave way. Simon threw himself forward toward the tower. His body slammed into Sophie. Only the sturdy masonry of the old lighthouse held them both upright. That whole section of the railing is gone, Sophie gasped, peering over his shoulder. If you'd fallen. He didn't want to think about that possibility. He didn't want her thinking about it. Simon wrapped his hands around her head and kissed her. It wasn't a gentle kiss. Adrenaline rushed through his veins, the sound of pumping blood boomed loudly in his ears. He felt her along every inch of his body and smelled the scent of her perfume. The heat emanating off her body engulfed him in a cloud of safety and security. Slowly, his heart calmed down. His lips softened and the kiss turned sweeter. The way it should have been to begin with. Sorry, he mumbled, creating the smallest bit of space between their lips. He gently brushed his over hers before softly kissing her eyes and then her forehead. Are you okay? Hmm, she responded distractedly. He took that as a good sign and dug back in. This time, he'd do it right. He kissed her gently, sensing her reactions. He paced himself, enjoying the feel of their lips moving together. When Sophie finally pulled away, he opened his eyes. He had no idea when they had drifted closed. She looked as surprised as he felt when he realized that they were still on top of the lighthouse tower. Ready to head back down, he asked when the fog cleared from his mind. She nodded and they started down, following the same pattern as before, him always out front and ready to catch her, should she fall. Are you ready to get back home? he asked softly when they made it to the sand in front of the lighthouse. Almost, Sophie said. 
She pulled her phone back out of her crossbody purse and motioned for him to pose in front of the lighthouse. Watch out, he called as she backed off to frame the shot, almost walking into the surf. Her pearly laughter carried on the wind, making him smile. Perfect, she yelled into the wind, before putting her phone away and running back to him. Now I'm ready to go. The ride back was rougher than their trip out to the little lighthouse island. The wind had picked up and the ocean had transformed from smooth as glass to choppy and gray. Not much farther, he called out to her. Sophie looked a little green around the nose and mouth. She nodded, her lips tight. He could see the marina off in the distance when they heard a loud knocking noise coming off the engine. Before Simon had a chance to shut it off, it stalled. This can't be good, he mumbled to himself and got to work inspecting the damage. There wasn't a lot he could do, but Simon tried everything his father had taught him over the years. Nothing worked. Any luck? Sophie asked. She'd offered to help and then stayed out of his way. No. I don't think I have a choice but to call for a tow. His dad was not going to be happy. At least this time Simon was in a position to cover any expenses. The last time the boat had stalled on him, his dad had to cover the cost of pulling it back to the marina, as well as the engine repairs. Now what? Sophie asked. Now we wait. He handed her a life vest and grabbed one of his own. Thankfully, this close to Palmer Island, the wait wasn't very long and the towboat captain was experienced and efficient. In less than an hour, they were back at the marina. Simon groaned when he saw his father standing at the dock. As the owner of the boat, he'd been notified of the tow request. Simon had hoped to speak to him at the house, in private. But that wasn't happening. Sophie, this is my father. Clive Johnson, he said as soon as they stepped off the boat. I've known Sophie since she was a little girl. I'm her accountant, his father barked out. He turned to face the young woman. It's nice to see you. I'm sorry my son has gotten you in trouble. No trouble at all. We had a fun outing and your boat is lovely. I hope it won't be too difficult to repair. She stepped back, giving father and son a little space. What happened? Clyde Johnson asked, inspecting the boat for any visible damage. We were on our way back. The engine backfired and stalled. I couldn't get it started and finally had to call for the tow. Did you? Yes. I did everything you've taught me and looked through the manual to see if there was anything I was overlooking. And before you ask, yes, there's plenty of gas in the tank. I filled her up before we left this morning. I cannot believe you let this happen. I'm supposed to take Brad Sutton out fishing this weekend. If we land his account, we'd be set until I retire and beyond. His father shook his head, disappointment and frustration clear on his face. Hopefully it's a quick fix and you'll be up and running again by Friday. We have a few days. I'll cover any repairs and the tow, of course. Simon turned to speak to the towboat captain. I have insurance for that. His father scrolled through the contacts in his phone, undoubtedly looking for the number of his favorite marine engine mechanic. Go take Sophie back. We'll discuss this at home. Simon nodded and walked Sophie to his forerunner. Everything okay between you and your dad, she asked when they were both seated in his vehicle. It will be. Simon didn't know what else to say. He knew the motor stalling wasn't his fault. His father would come around to that conclusion eventually. Until then, living at home would be even more tense than it already was. He really needed to move out. Thank you for a beautiful day, Sophie said when he pulled up to the back of her building. Only then did Simon realize they'd spent the entire drive in silence. You're welcome. He looked over at Sophie. She didn't move, didn't open her door. Was she waiting for something? I should get back. Of course. Sophie left, avoiding eye contact with him. He watched her ascend the stairs to her apartment. When she was safely inside, he pulled away. Chapter 10 
the mechanic called, his father said when Simon walked back into his parents' house. He'd realized on the drive home that he should have talked to her. They'd shared their first kiss on the lighthouse tower. It had been amazing. Life-changing. Then, at the first sight of any trouble, he'd shut down. Shut her out. Can it be fixed in time? Simon walked into the living room where his father sat in his favorite chair, reading the Wall Street Journal. Todd thinks so. Have him send me the bill. He turned to head up to his room. He needed time to think about what had happened earlier today and how he felt about it. And he needed to call Sophie once he figured things out. That won't be necessary. I would, however, appreciate it if you'd ask next time before taking my boat out. Or better, by one of your own. His father closed the paper, rose, and walked down the hall to his office. Don't let him get to you, his mother said, walking into the room with a feather duster. He's under a lot of stress. He and your Aunt Joyce are trying to decide on where to move your grandmother. It's not an easy decision. And then there's the business. Getting the Sutton and Sutton account would make all the difference. Even for your grandmother. With that kind of money, we could put her into one of the best homes available. You're seriously thinking about putting her into a home? She won't last long in there. How could they seriously consider this? What other options are there? Moving in here isn't ideal either, and she can't keep staying by herself. At the very least, let's have a family meeting about it. Don't you think Summer and I should have some say in this? He lifted the framed picture of himself and his sister as children along with the potted plant sitting on one side of the mantel. His mother ran the duster over the area. If that's what you want, call your sister and see if she's available. I'll talk to your father. She finished dusting the mantle before walking into his father's office, shutting the door behind her. Simon pulled out his phone. Summer. Do you have a few minutes? Dad and Aunt Joyce are getting serious about putting Grandma Wendy into an old folks' home. I suggested we have a family meeting about it first. You have got to be kidding me. They can't seriously do this. There are other options. There has to be. Summer's voice was loud and agitated. I'm on my way up to our apartment. Give me two minutes. By the time his sister called back, the rest of the Johnson household was seated around the kitchen table. You're on speaker, Simon told his sister. What's all this talk about putting grandma into a home? I thought we'd given up on that before I left. It's nice to hear from you, Summer. Their mother pulled the phone closer. How are you and Brayden? How's the new job? Mom, we talked three days ago. Everything is fine. Can we please stay on topic? I have to head back to the lab in a few. Your grandmother has gotten worse. It is no longer safe for her to stay by herself. Did you hear what happened when Simon was there a few days ago? Their father's tone was somber. I was there and the only thing that happened was a scorched pot. He knew his argument was weak. What if we had someone care for her at home? She doesn't need anything complicated. Someone to keep an eye on her, maybe help with a little housework. By the sound of it, Summer was moving around her kitchen, running water, and banging pots. That's easier said than done, their mother replied. It's not something any of us want to take on, and we can't just hire someone to move in with her. What if I did it? The words were out before he could second-guess himself. Perfect. Simon moves in with Grandma and everyone's happy. Summer sounded relieved, and Simon heard Brayden talking in the background. That's ridiculous. Simon has a business to run. Their father smashed his hand on the table. My mother isn't going to get better. It will take more time and effort to care for her as her mind deteriorates. A home is the best place for her. A home will still be there if it comes to that, Summer said. For now, this could work. Simon and Braden are running the company remotely anyway. All he needs is his computer and internet. That shouldn't be a problem, right? 
I can have them hook up broadband within a day or two. I checked with the cable company. Simon caught his father's surprised look. You're seriously considering this? His mother asked. I am. Summer and I talked about it a few days ago, and I think it's the best fit for everyone right now. There's plenty of room at grandma's house. I can work from there. If I have to leave town for work, I can hire someone to check in on her. He nodded. The more he thought about it, the more it struck him that this was the perfect solution. I don't mind staying with her from time to time, his mother added, earning her a smile from her husband. And I'll be around as well. As will Joyce. His father looked at Simon, pride in his eyes. If you do this, you won't be in it alone. We'll be here to support you. And if my mother gets worse and it's no longer manageable, we'll revisit the home idea. Great. Glad that's settled. I'm going to eat my lunch and head back to work. Summer hung up. Are you sure about this? His father asked. I am. I've always loved spending time with Grandma Wendy. I think it's at least worth a try. I'll call Joyce and make sure she's on board. I don't see why she wouldn't, though. His father rose and went back into his office. This is very kind of you. But it's also a big responsibility. It will be like taking care of a teenager, what with the temper tantrums and mood swings. His mother looked concerned. I know. I have given this a lot of thought, and I've read up on elder care. I think we owe it to Grandma to at least try to give her more time at home with her garden and chickens. His mother nodded and rose to unload the dishwasher. He walked up to this room. He had a phone call to make. Simon settled on his bed and dialed Sophie's number. After a few rings, her voicemail came on. He tried to tell himself there was no reason to take that as a bad sign. Sophie walked into her apartment still, thinking about the kiss and Simon's reaction when he drove her home. She got that he was upset about the boat, and it didn't look like his father had taken it well either. But still. He could have said something. Walked her to her door. Kissed her again. Unless he regretted everything that had happened on the little island. Meow. Alfred sat down in front of her, making it clear that she'd been gone far too long. He could have starved. The bottom of the food bowl was clearly visible. Sophie laughed, instantly feeling better. She put her purse and keys on the counter before feeding the cats. After some much-needed snuggles and a quick use of the lint brush on her skirt, she grabbed her keys and headed downstairs to check on the shop. You're back? How was the trip on the boat? Maddie stepped away from the register and looked Sophie up and down. What's wrong? It was fun. I never thought I'd get to ride on a yacht. Sophie forded a smile on her face, hoping to direct the conversation away from how the trip had ended. You were on a boat? Willow raced from who knows where and threw her thin arms around Sophie's waist. I was. We took the boat to that small island with the lighthouse on it. The one you can see from the north end of the island. She sat down on one of the couches and pulled Willow down next to her. I've always wanted to go there. The girl's face was eager and full of excitement. Me too. I read a book about the lighthouse keeper and his family a long time ago. She smiled at the memory of how that story had captured her imagination. It was one of the first books she'd ordered herself for the shop when she worked with her grandmother to take over the family business. She'd made sure there was a copy in stock ever since. I read that book too. When you're a little older, Willow, we'll go out there. Maddie walked over to the local interest section and searched for a minute. She pulled out the book about South Carolina lighthouses and searched for the section on this one as she walked back toward them. Here it is. Maddie sat down on the other side of Willow. Together, the three of them looked and read through the history of Gray Man's Point and its famous lighthouse. I'm going to go draw a lighthouse, Willow said when they were done. Can I take this, Sophie? Only if you promise not to get any marker, pencil, or paint on it. 
and no tearing or folding the pages. Sophie handed the book to Willow, who ran away with it, before either woman could change their mind. You're putting a lot of trust in a seven-year-old. Maddie shook her head. She's a good girl. And if something happens, it'll become the store resource edition. Sophie shrugged. It was worth losing out on the sale of a book to make Willow happy and improve the little girl's confidence. How did things really go at Gray Man's Point? Maddie rose and started shelving a box of new arrivals. Her friend was one of the most hard-working people Sophie knew, rarely sitting still, for more than a few minutes. We had a lot of fun. We found the old cemetery for the lighthouse keepers and their families. Can you imagine spending your entire life on that tiny island? I can't. I can't imagine spending my entire life on Palmer Island, yet there are plenty of people around here doing just that. And that's not what I'm talking about and you know it. Spill the beans. He kissed me. Sophie's hand flew to her mouth, touching the spot that burned with the memory of their encounter on top of the old lighthouse. She hadn't meant to share that. That sounds encouraging. Why aren't you walking on cloud nine? Maddie squatted down to cut open a box of books. Everything was fine until the boat stopped. Maddie stood up and looked over the half-bookcase at her, eyebrows raised. There was a loud bang and it stopped. We had to be towed back to the marina, Sophie explained. Well, that'll put a damper on even the most romantic date. Unless he took advantage while you waited for the tow? She grinned. Simon would never, Sophie realized her friend was teasing her. He was the perfect gentleman. And pretty busy trying to fix the motor, she added reluctantly. And then? Something else must have happened with the way you're moping around. Maddie unpacked the books, sorting them, by section and author name. Sophie joined her, grabbing another stack of books from the box. I haven't been moping. Besides, I've only been back for half an hour. I can tell by the look in your eyes. It's not the look of a woman in love who's been kissed. You should be grinning like a fool. The grin returned. Who kissed you then? Stop deflecting. Something happened, and I'm not going to stop until you tell me. Sophie sighed. It's his father's boat. Mr. Johnson was waiting at the marina when we got back. Wait. You're dating Mr. Johnson's son. Mr. Johnson the accountant? Yes, didn't I mention that? No, you didn't. I hope he isn't as dull as his father. Mr. Johnson is a good accountant, but... The look on Maddie's face made Sophie laugh. Simon isn't anything like his father. Not that there's anything wrong with Clive Johnson. He's a wonderful person. Sophie didn't know what she would do without the man. He'd helped her after her grandfather passed and then again when she lost her grandmother shortly after taking over the shop. Well, I'm glad his son is a good kisser. Your face is starting to take on that look I was expecting, by the way. She turned to shelve more of the books, giving Sophie a chance to hide her burning cheeks. She busied herself alphabetizing the next stack of books, trying hard not to think about the kiss and the way it had made her feel. Or that Simon had held her hand like it was the most natural thing in the world. How they'd talked about the lives of the families living in isolation on the tiny island. What spoiled the moment, then? Maddie asked, yanking Sophie out of her daydream. His dad was pretty upset when we were pulled in. I guess he's supposed to entertain some big client this weekend on the boat. Sophie had never seen Mr. Johnson, so annoyed. Not even when an entire quarter's worth of expensive receipts had gone missing. I guess fixing a boat engine could get expensive. Maddie shrugged. Neither one of them knew anything about them. But it sounded like the kind of thing that could get pricey. I don't think that's it. Simon offered to pay for the tow and repairs. It definitely put him in a weird mood. He was quiet the entire drive back to my house. Sophie still wasn't sure what to make of his silence. There it is. You're worried the kiss didn't mean as much to him as it did to you. Maddie stated it as fact. I don't know. Yes you do. 
you like him, and he rattled your confidence. That always makes you second-guess everything and think too much. You have to get out of your head. Maddie shelved the last of the books. I don't know. Was her friend right? Here's what we're going to do. The shop is empty, and I doubt anyone will come looking for a book in the next hour. We're going to close up early, order takeout, and talk about this Simon situation. What are you in the mood for? Without waiting for an answer, Maddie walked to the front door and flipped the sign from open to closed. How about Chinese, from the new place? Sophie needed to figure out what she felt for this guy and an evening hashing it out with Maddie sounded like just the thing to help her work through such a confusing mess of emotions. Half an hour later, they were curled up on Maddie's couch, an array of takeout containers spread over the coffee table in front of them. An old episode of Grey's Anatomy played in the background. Willow looked at the food and scrunched up her nose. This looks yucky. Can I have some Dino nuggets and apple juice? Maddie shook her head. This child lives on Dino nuggets. She turned to her daughter and said, If you eat three broccoli spears, I'll make you your nuggets. Willow picked up a fork and speared the smallest bit of broccoli she could find in the box of beef and broccoli. She stuck it in her mouth and made a wild display of how disgusting the vegetable was, complete with gagging noises. Is that enough? Maddie shook her head. Eventually Willow forced three pieces down and walked into the kitchen with her mother. A few minutes later, she strode back in, holding a plate of her beloved nuggets and a juice box. This show is boring, she announced before biting the head off a dinosaur. We like it. You can go draw or play after you're done eating. Can I take daddy with me? Willow asked, pointing to a large framed picture of her father in uniform. It stood on the mantel over the fireplace. If you promise to be careful. Willow nodded and shoved another nugget into her mouth. When she was done, she wiped her fingers on her napkin and left, holding the precious picture, to her chest. You are such a good mom, Sophie said, piling more cashew chicken and rice on her plate. I think it's amazing how you make sure Willow knows her dad. It can't be easy. Honestly, it helps. At first, it was hard. She was so young when he died. I put up pictures of him everywhere and watched old videos of him holding her. In a way it helped, but it got to be a lot. I felt like I was living in the past, not living our life now. Overall, it's still a balancing act. But we're getting better at it. It helps that she's talking more about him now, asking questions. She's getting really interested in what he did and the type of person he was. What do you tell her? Sophie was curious herself. She'd never met Andrew, the Marine who died in Iraq, when Willow was a toddler. That he was kind and brave. He'd always stand up to bullies and encourage everyone around him to always do the right thing. Maddie took a sip of her water. I tell her that he's watching over her and that he hopes his daughter grows up to be kind and brave as well. That explains a lot. Sophie smiled. She loved her little shop helper. What do you mean? Maddie stopped eating and looked up at her. Why she's always drawing and giving away pictures. Why she goes out of her way to help people in the shop or while we're out and about. The other day, she ran out to the sidewalk when a customer left their umbrella. I hadn't even noticed, but Willow remembered the woman had put it in the bucket by the door when she came in. Maddie's face lit up with pride. That's my girl. I guess I'm doing something right. You definitely are. I can't wait to see the kind of woman she grows up to be. Sophie raised her glass of water. Maddie groaned. Don't remind me. She's growing up too fast. I can't believe she'll be in second grade after summer break. There's still a few weeks left before school starts. Sophie dug her fork into the small pile of food left on her plate. By then, you'll be more than ready to have her gone for a few hours each day. You're probably right. And if things work out with you and Simon, I may end up manning the shop by myself more often. She wiggled her eyebrows. Let's not jump to any conclusions. 
I have no idea how he feels about me. Or how I feel about him, for that matter. Sophie set down her plate, her appetite gone. The image of Simon staring at the road on the drive home popped back into her head. He wouldn't have gone through the trouble of taking you out on the family boat if he didn't like you. And he probably wouldn't have kissed you if he didn't have feelings for you. You are such an idealist. Sophie had heard enough, first from classmates at boarding school and then in stern warnings from her mother, about what men usually wanted when they showed any kind of affection. And you're such a cynic. I know you come by it honestly, with your mom and all. But you read more romances than I do. There's no reason to lose hope. Good guys are out there, and when they kiss you, they do it, because they are falling for you. Andrew did. We can't all find someone as amazing as your Andrew. Sophie smiled sadly. So far, I haven't. Except for Simon. Admit it. You're falling for him. Maddie leaned forward. Her voice had gone soft and intense. I wouldn't go that far, but it definitely feels different. I feel different when I'm around him. And that kiss. I can't describe how it felt. It had not been her first kiss, but for the first time she understood the tangled and confusing emotions her favorite romance heroines felt in the books she read. I haven't felt this way with any other guy. Well that's no surprise. Most of the guys you've gone out with were pompous jerks your mother set you up with. Sophie laughed and thought of Martin and the men that had come before him. They weren't terrible, but Maddie had a point. Chapter 11 I brought burgers and sweet potato fries from Mary's. Simon held out a large bag when she opened the door. The smell was intoxicating. I even remembered to ask for tartar sauce. Sophie laughed. I'm glad I suggested we stay in and watch a movie, then. His call yesterday morning had been a surprise. Come in. You're soaking wet. She held open the door, keeping an eye on Alfred and Misty. They were both on their best behavior, sitting at the end of the hallway, two pairs of curious eyes trained on the dark-haired man entering her apartment. Sophie closed the door and led the way into the kitchen. She pointed to the counter between the stove and the fridge. You can put it there. I'll go grab you a towel. When she returned a minute later, Misty was moving in a figure-eight pattern around Simon's legs. He was bent over, petting the cat's back while Misty purred like a sewing machine. Here. Sophie held out the fluffy light blue towel. She likes you. Thanks. Simon sneezed, then rubbed the towel over his face and through his hair. Can I hang this somewhere to dry? It'll probably drip. Sophie pointed to the bistro set tucked into a corner of her kitchen. As he pulled the Clemson hoodie he wore over his head, she busied herself getting plates and silverware together, trying hard not to peek at his stomach when his t-shirt rode up in the process. Simon hung up his sweatshirt and took off his shoes. At least the socks are dry, he said, looking down to avoid stepping on either of her cats. Don't worry. They'll get out of the way. She put a burger and a generous helping of sweet potato fries on a plate and handed it to him. Tartar sauce, she asked, holding up the little round plastic container Mary had sent it in. No, thank you. You don't happen to have any ketchup? I forgot to ask for some. Simon took the plate and picked up a fork and napkin. I do. I keep a bottle in the fridge for Willow. Sophie dug around in the back of the fridge until she found it. She needs it for her Dino nuggets. Can't have Dino nuggets without it. Or fries. He squirted some on his plate and dipped a sweet potato fry into it. They carried their plates into the living room. Sophie set hers down and grabbed the remote to turn on the TV. Simon sneezed. She looked over as he rubbed his eyes. Alfred had jumped up on the couch and was making himself comfortable, pushed right up against Simon's leg. Are you allergic to cats? she asked. I don't think so. Simon popped another fry into his mouth. My sister has a cat. His name is Nacho. Do you sneeze around him? 
and get red, itchy eyes? His were getting redder, by the minute. I haven't been around him in a while. He moved out to Colorado, with Summer. He went quiet, for a minute. The last time I stayed with my parents, when he was living there, I thought I was getting a cold. As soon as I got back home, I felt better. I think you are allergic. She leaned over and pushed Alfred down. It wouldn't help much. The cats had free range of her entire place. If you want to leave. Of course not. He sneezed again. It's no big deal. I'll get some allergy pills tomorrow. Summer's heart skipped a beat. That could only mean one thing, he planned on hanging out with her and her cats again. Allergies and all. I have some Benadryl. That might help. She got one of the small pink pills from her bathroom cabinet and handed it to him. Thanks. What would you like to watch tonight? Sophie sat down next to him and picked up her plate. Hmm. I'm not sure. What are you in the mood for? Action, drama, suspense? What's your favorite movie? The one you could watch again and again. He put his burger down, giving her his full attention. Pride and prejudice, she said without hesitation. That's what we'll watch. He motioned for her to cue it up. It's a chick flick, based on a Jane Austen novel. I know. I have a sister. I've heard all about Mr. Darcy. About time I figured out what all the fuss is about. He took another bite of his burger. His plate was almost empty, while she'd barely nibbled on a few of her fries. Okay then. When you get bored to death, remember, you did this to yourself. She scrolled until she found the movie and pressed play. They watched and ate in silence, though she stole the occasional glance at him to see if he was ready to move on to something else. To her surprise, he got into it, his eyes glued to the screen. Either that or he was a pretty good actor himself. Would you like some popcorn? she asked when they were almost halfway through the movie. He'd inhaled his food and she wondered if he was still hungry. Maybe he'd drank a lot of water to fill his stomach. Popcorn would be great. He smiled over at her, and for a second, Sophie forgot what they were talking about. I'll be right back. Simon grabbed the remote and paused the movie. She'd seen it at least twelve times. There was no need, but it was sweet. She walked into the kitchen and put a bag of kettle corn into the microwave. Misty and Alfred walked in and sat in front of their food dishes. Sophie laughed and poured more of the dry food in. You guys get a snack too. By the time she got back to the living room, Simon was lounging comfortably on the couch, feet on the coffee table, scrolling through something on his phone. His eyes were narrowed, his lips tight. Everything okay? Sophie asked. She sat down beside him, wedging the bowl between them. Yeah. It's a work thing. There's nothing I can do until tomorrow morning. He turned his phone off and grabbed a handful of popcorn. It's sweet. Sophie laughed at the surprised look on his face. Kettle corn. Not bad. Ready to start this back up? Sophie hit play on the movie and lost herself in the story. When she reached for the popcorn, his hand brushed across hers. It was warm and sparks skittered all along her arm, straight to her heart. Their eyes met for a heartbeat, sending the butterflies in her stomach a flutter. He pulled his hand from the bowl. Go ahead, he said, his gaze still on her. His eyes were gray with little specks of blue, green, and gold in them. How had she not noticed this before? Thanks. Sophie lowered her eyes, breaking the connection and scooped up a handful of the puffy kernels. This is better than I expected, he said, pointing to the TV. I can see why it's your favorite. What's your favorite movie? Sophie wondered what it would say about him and what it said about her, that she liked something set in a different century and a different continent. Without a doubt, Reservoir Dogs. Simon looked over and grinned. It's a little different than this. Braden and I must have watched it a hundred times over the years. I've heard of it. 
Sophie vaguely remembered seeing a trailer for it and hearing friends mention it. It's a Tarantino film, isn't it? Those weren't usually her thing. One of her college friends had talked her into watching Kill Bill and she had to leave the room. It is. His best if you ask me. His eyes were bright with excitement. He wasn't kidding about this being his favorite. Maybe we can watch it next time. It would be interesting to see what he liked about that particular movie. And it made her wonder what conclusions he was drawing about her choice. It's a plan. He snagged the last few kernels of popcorn and set the bowl on the coffee table before relaxing back into the couch. Sophie grabbed one of the throws she kept on the back of the couch and handed it to him. Thanks. He spread it over his legs and put one arm on the back of the couch. She got a blanket for herself and tucked her legs under. Minutes later, she was lost in the movie. Sophie looked at Simon as the credits rolled. His eyes were closed, his breathing deep and even. He'd fallen asleep. She smiled. He looked peaceful. She hoped the movie hadn't bored him to sleep. It was more likely that the Benadryl was to blame. Her grandmother had used it as a sleeping aid the last few years of her life. Should she wake him up? Sophie decided to put the decision off for a bit. She pulled her own blanket up around her shoulders and closed her eyes. We fell asleep. Simon sat upright on the couch, his phone in his hand. Sophie shook her head, clearing the fog. It was dark outside. She had no idea how long they'd been asleep. What time is it? She croaked. Two in the morning. I need to get home. My dad tried to call me late last night. He was up and heading for the kitchen. Sophie followed behind, the cats on her heels. She watched Simon pull on his sweatshirt and shoes. I hope everything's okay. So do I. You should go back to sleep. I'll call you later. He bent down and kissed her. It was nothing like their kiss at the top of the lighthouse. It was sweet. And brief. And then, he was gone. As Sophie unlocked the store the next morning, her phone rang. She pulled it out of her purse and glanced at the display. What was her mother calling this early in the morning for? She let it ring. Her mother could wait until she got a chance to make a pot of coffee. After Simon had left, it took her a long time to fall back asleep. She'd hit the snooze button one too many times and barely made it out the door on time. Good thing her commute involved a flight of stairs and a walk around the side of the building. She'd hardly made it into the kitchen before her phone went off again. Seriously? Sophie muttered. She tossed her purse on the table, the phone still chiming away. By the time the phone rang, for a third time, the coffee was brewing. Good morning, mother. Sophie leaned against the counter, bracing herself for what was to be an unpleasant conversation. Her mother wouldn't have gotten out of bed this early, for some idle chit-chat. Good morning. Sophie could hear her mother's clicking heels on the stone tiles as she paced back and forth. Though there's not much good about it when the first call I get, at an ungodly hour, I might add, is about some man sneaking out of my daughter's apartment in the middle of the night. What were you thinking? Sophie almost missed the cup she was pouring coffee into. Seriously? That's why you're calling? Because I had a friend over to watch a movie and one of my neighbors saw him leave? What am I? Twelve? He left at two in the morning. Do you know how that looks? What people think the two of you did? The clicking became quicker, the staccato noise punctuating Pamela Davenport's displeasure. What if word gets back to Martin? Sophie took a sip of coffee and prayed for patience. Mother, we've talked about this. I'm not interested in Martin, and if he were honest with himself instead of letting himself be influenced by his mother, and by you, he'd realize he wasn't interested in me either. He only likes the idea of having a Davenport as a wife. There is nothing wrong with that. You come from a long line of influential businessmen and politicians. What man of means with high standing in the local community wouldn't want someone like you by their side? You can open doors for Martin. 
I raised you two. Mom, please stop. I don't want any of it. That's why I went to college. Why I jumped at the chance to take over the book nook. This is my life. Running a big house and throwing fancy dinner parties isn't me. It is a good life. Martin is a good man. He'll provide for you. The clacking heels stopped and a chair creaked. I don't need a man to take care of me, Mom. I have the store and Grandma left me the building. I'm doing okay. Sophie took a seat as well. She knew in her own way, her mother was only looking out for her. I've talked to Clive Johnson. I know the bookstore is in trouble. I've made a few inquiries and from what I can gather, it's a dying industry. Her mother sighed. Sophie held back a curse. That was a serious breach of client confidentiality, not that she was surprised. Getting information she wasn't supposed to have access to was one of her mother's superpowers. How else would she have known Simon had left her place at two in the morning? Simon. Sophie hoped his father was more tight-lipped at home about her financial difficulties. Are you there? Yes, Mom. I appreciate the concern, but I'm fine. Things are looking up. I'm taking a few new marketing approaches. There's still a market for stores like mine. It's the big chains and box stores that are in trouble. People shop there for price and convenience. Here it's all about the experience, the expertise, and finding things they can't get a hold of online. Like first edition books and signed author copies. Sophie made a mental note to look into ways to drum up more business. She could advertise, niche down further, maybe work out some deals with local hotels and BNBS. The book nook was her baby, her father's family's legacy. It wasn't going to go under during her watch. Listen, I have to go. I promise you have nothing to worry about. And Simon was there to watch a movie. Pride and Prejudice. He fell asleep on the couch. That's all. I can see that, her mother sighed. I took your father to see Moonstruck. Twenty minutes in, he was snoring. In the theater. Can you imagine? She couldn't. It was hard picturing her parents in love and her mother going to the movies, eating candy, and sneaking kisses. But her mother had been young once, and from everything Sophie had heard, her parents had been madly in love when they married. I miss him, you know. Your father. It wasn't always easy, and we had our fair share of disagreements. But we built a good life together. And we had you. I know. I love you, Mom. Listen, I have to finish opening the store. Sophie downed her coffee and carried the cup to the sink. All right. I should call the gardener. The roses look pitiful. Pamela Davenport took a deep breath. If Simon Johnson makes you happy, I'll support your relationship. I looked into him. He may not be from one of the families, but he's not a bad catch. The line beeped and her mother was gone, and Sophie realized that her mother must have googled her boyfriend. Or worse, made inquiries all over town. Simon, what are you doing here? Grandma Wendy sat at the kitchen table, working on a crossword puzzle. Like she did every morning. I live here, Grandma. Remember? He walked to the counter and poured himself a cup of coffee. She'd made plenty for both of them. Some mornings, she remembered he'd moved in two weeks ago. Some mornings she didn't. But they were working things out, finding their routine. Of course I know that. I'm just surprised you're not over at Sophie's house. Or working. Don't you have a job? She winked at him over the rim of her coffee cup. Stop teasing me. Sophie's meeting me here for lunch. She said she baked something for us last night. You two should not be hanging around an old woman all the time. I can fend for myself, you know. Done it, for years. The old woman shook her head. Sophie likes spending time with you, and you know it. He dug around the bread box and pulled out a loaf of sourdough. She likes my chickens. That too. 
Would you like some toast? He asked. Toast would be lovely. I think I have a jar of strawberry jam left. Grandma Wendy rose and went into the walk-in pantry. She returned with a small jar of bright red preserves. Simon put two slices of bread in the toaster and pulled the butter out of the fridge to soften. Any eggs today? Of course. My girls are laying good. An egg from each, and I'm pretty sure Beatrice laid another double yoker. Take a look at this egg. Simon admired the eggs, as he did every morning. Asking about them was his way of making sure the chickens were fed and watered. Even so, he'd still walk out and take a look for himself. After coffee and toast. Any plans for today? he asked. I think I'm going to harvest the last of the tomatoes. There might be enough for one more batch of tomato sauce. The rest will become green tomato relish. Have you tried my green tomato relish? She looked up and was ready to run back to the pantry to grab him a jar. I have and I love it, Grandma. He put a hand on her arm, encouraging her to stay put. He'd be working from the living room today, keeping an eye on her at the stove. The pressure canner scared him. He wasn't sure what he'd do if his grandmother forgot what she was doing and walked away. Call Miss Doris, probably. That was exactly what happened. He'd been scanning server reports and going through error logs when his grandmother left down the hallway. The tomato sauce was at a full boil on the stove and the pressure canner was doing its thing, full of jars stuffed with green tomato relish. Tomato sauce splattered out of the pot. Grandma? She didn't answer. He put his laptop down and went to look for her. She was in her bedroom, the door cracked open and had dressed in her Sunday best. He knocked on the door. You're going somewhere? To church. You'd better get dressed. We're going to be late. You know the preacher doesn't like it when we walk in late. Grandma, it's Wednesday. There's no service, and you're in the middle of canning tomatoes. Don't be silly. I don't do that on Sundays. Not even during the middle of tomato harvest. Go put on your suit. She turned to dig around in the top of her closet. I don't own a suit, Grandma. And the pressure canner is running. He kept his fingers crossed that she would snap out of it and get back to the kitchen. She continued to ignore him, pulled on her hat, and picked her good purse up from the bed. Hurry up. I'll be waiting in the car. Simon shook his head. His grandfather's Oldsmobile was parked in the garage. He'd disabled a fuse the first time she'd pulled this particular stunt. Just in case. Usually, she'd sit in the car for half an hour or so and then come back inside the house and act like nothing had happened. Which meant he'd have to deal with the canner. Miss Doris, do you have a moment? He asked, his phone up to his ear, stirring the tomato sauce. Of course. Everything all right with Wendy? She's fine. He knew Miss Doris would understand, but it was still weird talking about his grandmother's dementia. She started canning green tomato relish and there's tomato sauce boiling on the stove. Okay, turn the heat down to the lowest setting on the tomato sauce. It can simmer until I get there. Now, the canner is a different story. Did she set a timer? Miss Doris's voice was firm. She was ready to jump in and help at a moment's notice. He looked around and spotted the egg timer. Yes. It has 15 minutes left. Good. Do you see the little metal piece bouncing around at the top of the lid? He nodded. Yes. It's making noise, and a little steam is escaping. Good. Do you know if it's been making that noise the entire time? Miss Doris's voice sounded urgent. A door closed in the background. He thought back. I'm pretty sure it's made that sound for a while. Great. When the timer's done, turn off the burner. I'm on my way. The timer was still going when Miss Doris arrived. She put down her purse and grabbed an apron. Where is she? she asked. In the car. If you're okay in here, I'll go check on her. 
He looked around to see if there was anything he could do to help his grandmother's friend. Go. I have everything I need. Don't worry. I've been canning almost as long as Wendy. Who do you think she got the green tomato relish recipe from? Miss Dora smiled and waved him off. She turned and spread one of his grandmother's kitchen towels out on the counter. As Simon neared the back of the house and approached the door to the garage, he heard the timer going off. It was a welcome sound. It meant the time for the pressure cooker was over. Not much longer and he could stop worrying about that metal thing on the stove exploding, sending pieces of glass all over the place. Simon opened the driver's door to his grandfather's car and got in the seat. Grandma, we're back. Ready to head inside, he asked after a moment. Grandma Wendy nodded and picked her purse up from the floorboard. That was a lovely service today, wasn't it? Remind me to send the preacher a few dozen eggs. They walked back into the house together. Look who stopped by to help with the canning, Simon said, before his grandmother could get too surprised by Miss Doris being there. He'd learned in the couple weeks he'd been living with her that surprises made his grandmother lose touch with reality more quickly. Routines and familiar surroundings, on the other hand, kept her grounded. That's so sweet of you Doris. Let me get out of my church clothes, and I'll be right back. Grandma Wendy rushed back into her bedroom. How's she been? Miss Doris asked softly as she ladled tomato sauce into a set of clean jars on the counter. Much better. The new medication and the routine seems to be helping. I don't know what set this episode off. I've been sticking to the program. Honey, it's not your fault. It's her mind. It's playing tricks on her, sending her back into the past. Maybe there's too many people she's missing. Miss Doris sighed and wiped her hands on the apron she wore. Sometimes I think it must be nice. Seeing those we lost again. Even if it isn't real. He wasn't so sure about that. He liked the present fine. But then, he hadn't lost as many loved ones as these two women had. Their parents were gone, their husbands were gone, and he wasn't sure about Miss Doris, but his grandmother had lost siblings as well. How would he feel if he lost his own parents? Or Sophie? Knock, knock. Anybody home? Sophie's voice rang through the house. Something smells good. Simon walked out to the hallway. The only problem with living with his grandmother was he had little privacy. He closed the distance to Sophie. Hi. I missed you. He pushed her against the wall and stroked her cheek. Hi to you too. Her lips twitched. They were so close he could almost taste them. Simon lowered his head and brushed his lips across hers before deepening the kiss. He lost himself in the feeling of her soft warm body pressed against his, their lips moving, their hearts beating in sync. A hissing sound came from the kitchen. He pulled away an inch. What is that? Sophie asked, sounding a little breathless. My grandmother and Miss Doris are canning tomatoes, he said softly. If you two are done, we could use some help in here, Miss Doris called down the hallway. Sophie's cheeks went bright red. He could practically feel the heat coming off them. He kissed her forehead before stepping back. We'd better get in there. Sophie nodded. He took her hand and pulled her into the kitchen with him. Don't you two look happy, Miss Doris said. She had tomato sauce splatters all over the apron. Oh, you should see them when they think no one's watching. His grandmother giggled. Do you remember being young and in love? I do. Miss Doris turned around, wielding a pair of strange-looking tongs like a baton. Enjoy it. Make memories. Love will stay, but this feeling right now, it's special and surprisingly fleeting. Chapter 12 How's Grandma today? His father asked when Simon stopped by the house a few days later to pick up his bathing suit. He planned on taking Sophie down to the ocean on her day off. She's having a good day. Spending most of it in the garden, taking out tomato plants and picking the last of the cucumbers. 
when I left, she was lying down reading. Sophie had brought her a stack of large print romances, and she'd been devouring them. I'm thinking of getting her a Kindle. An e-reader? Do you think she can learn to use it? His father sounded skeptical. They are pretty easy to use. I think it has three buttons and the text size is adjustable. They are so inexpensive these days, I figure it's at least worth a try. I think it's wonderful that she's rediscovered her love of books, his mother said. Do you remember all the books she used to have when the kids were little? His father nodded as they sat at the kitchen table, enjoying a late breakfast of bacon and eggs. Fix yourself a plate and come join us, his mother suggested. Thanks, Mom. Grandma fixed me a plate of scrambled eggs this morning. The chickens are laying like crazy. She wants to know if you're ready for another couple of dozen eggs. Gracious, no. Half my refrigerator is full of eggs. I'm sure Miss Doris would take some off your hands, his father said. I wish. Grandma sent me over there to drop off eggs yesterday. At this rate, we're going to have to reopen the egg stand. When Simon was younger, his grandparents had a large flock of chickens. During the sunny months of the year, they'd sold eggs for two dollars a dozen to get rid of the excess. Please don't. The last time my mother sold eggs and produce, she made far more than she's supposed to while drawing your grandfather's pension. It was all I could do to make the numbers work. His father looked concerned. It would never occur to him to not report cash income. She never charges enough, either. It costs her more to raise the things than she makes. I tell her to scale back. The old phone on the wall of the kitchen rang. His mother went to answer it. Johnson Residence, how may I help you? How has her mind been the last two days? His father asked. Better. The routines are helping. Even when she gets confused about who I am or where she is, she's staying calm. Most of the time, she snaps right back out of it. Thank you for taking care of her. It was a lot for you to take on, and I want you to know I appreciate it. His father raised his coffee cup in salute. Simon swallowed hard. That was high praise from his father. So far, it's working out well, for both of us. Sophie has been a big help. She's over most days, for lunch, and helps out when I have a virtual meeting. Good. If that ever changes, let me know. There are funds if you want to hire some help with her or around the house. For now we're good. He appreciated the offer though, and according to his grandmother's doctor, she could get worse over time and it could happen quickly. Clive, telephone. His mother covered the mouthpiece of the receiver with one hand. It's the office. She handed the phone to his father and came to join Simon at the table. Your sister called this morning. She has a few days off, and she and Brayden are thinking of flying back for a visit. I heard. Brayden called me. He looked forward to it. Conducting business remotely and from different states was working out well, but he missed his friend and business partner. Jane, could you grab the Schuster file from my desk? His father called. I'll get it, Simon offered. Your eggs are getting cold. He walked down the hall and into his father's office. Several files were scattered on the large oak desk. He sifted through them until Sophie's name caught his attention. He shouldn't open it. But there was something about the way she'd been dodging his questions about the store that had him worried. One quick look wouldn't hurt. He opened the file and scanned the overall income and expense report. He couldn't believe how little revenue the store generated. Yet there she was, bringing her grandmother books every other day. He'd have to insist on paying her for them. Simon, it's one of the top files, his father called from the kitchen. Simon picked up the Schuster file and left, his mind churning with worry that quickly morphed into a resolve to help her turn the store around. He handed his father the file, grabbed his bathing suit, and left to go check on his grandmother. I thought we could make a quiche for lunch, Sophie said when she dropped by a few hours later. I have some leftover ham, and I'm sure we can find some veggies from the garden. 
She pulled diced ham and a tan-colored disc wrapped in cling wrap from the small cooler she carried. Quiche sounds wonderful. His grandmother bustled around the kitchen, pulling out one of her pie tins and her rolling pin. I'll go see what I can find in the garden. She handed both items to Sophie. What can I do to help? Simon asked. He'd spent the past two hours setting up a simple little Facebook advertising campaign for her bookstore. It would take a couple of days before he would be able to tell if it was working. Sophie put her purse, cooler, and laptop on the kitchen table. You could scramble up half a dozen eggs with a little milk or cream. I can do that. The simple task was done in two minutes. He took the eggshells out to the compost pile and checked on his grandmother. She handed him a few cherry tomatoes, some greens, and a bit of green onion, along with a nice little pile of fresh herbs. Take these inside to Sophie, would you? I'm going to weed this okra bed. She was on her knees, pulling weeds out from among the small plants. It wouldn't be long before the okra would stand two feet tall. He headed back inside with his treasure and handed it to Sophie. He set her empty cooler by the front door and moved Sophie's purse and laptop to the living room. He wasn't sure how much she was on Facebook, but he wanted to keep things quiet about the ads for now. At least until he knew they were working. He opened his own computer and adjusted the campaign's audience to exclude Sophie and Maddie. For good measure, he added Miss Doris to that list as well. Do you mind if I check something on your laptop? he asked, watching Sophie roll out and transfer the pie crust into the dish. Not at all. It's unlocked. They were going to have to have a talk about cybersecurity. Her laptop sat out in the shop all day long. Anyone could easily access it or walk off with it. And while they were at it, he'd suggest she upgrade to a new cash register and a better way to track customer data than the notebook Sophie currently kept with books she was considering adding to the store. He pulled up her Facebook account and spent a few minutes scrolling through. His ads did not appear. Perfect. He closed her computer and joined her in the kitchen. The quiche was in the oven, and Sophie was cleaning up after herself. This smells amazing. He cracked the door to the oven open. The quiche had only been in for a few minutes, but the scent already tantalized his taste buds. Have I told you lately what a great cook you are? He quickly kissed her on the mouth. Sophie laughed and splashed some of the clean water from the spigot in his direction. You're such a sweet talker. I'm going to have to watch myself. She looked out the window overlooking the backyard. His gaze followed hers. I'd better go see what she's doing and get her cleaned up before lunch. His grandmother was elbow deep in one of her raised beds, pulling something out. He couldn't tell what it was, but there was a pile stacked up next to the bed. He walked out to the garden, leaving Sophie to finish fixing lunch. Oh good. Come help me take these to the fire pit. Grandma Wendy rose and cleaned her hands on her apron. Why did you pull out all the tomato plants? because the harvest is over. They were getting the plight. Only way to deal with them is to pull the plants out and burn them. If we don't, we won't have a good harvest next year. She grabbed an armful of the brown pile of stems and leaves and started walking to the back corner of the property. Your chickens aren't going to be happy if you build a fire. Simon picked up what remained on the ground and followed his grandmother. Oh, fiddlesticks. I burn stuff all the time. But if you're worried, you can go lock them up in the coop. She motioned for him to add to the pile in the pit. And then bring me some gasoline and a lighter. How about this? I'll burn this pile if you cut some lettuce and take it to Sophie. She's in the kitchen. That's a lovely idea. A salad would be nice with her quiche. I'll get radishes and a few more herbs too. She walked off in the direction of a lettuce bed and herb garden. Simon took care of the dead tomato plant pile. Thankfully, the stalks were dry and it didn't take long for everything to burn down to nothing but ashes. Sophie pulled the quiche out of the oven when he walked in. Go wash up. Lunch is almost ready. Sophie turned and smiled. 
She raised the corner of the apron she was wearing and wiped his cheek. You have some soot on ya, and you smell like a campfire. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? he asked, tempted to kiss those ruby red lips of hers. It's undecided. Go get cleaned up so we can eat. Maddie will be upset if I spend all afternoon with you too. She gave him a gentle push out of the kitchen. I guess that means we're not going swimming today. Rain check, she asked. Simon nodded. But if he was going to spend all afternoon without her, he was getting that kiss. I'm glad you finally decided to join me for brunch. Pamela Davenport was overdressed, even for Shea Pauls. Who wore strings of pearls and a fascinator to go out to Sunday brunch? You finally promised that it would be just the two of us. After the last brunch incident, Sophie had refused each Sunday invitation. Until today. It was hard to hold a grudge, even against her mother, when she was this happy. Pamela picked up her coffee and took a cautious sip. I'm assuming you're still seeing Simon Johnson? Sophie looked up. It was the first time in weeks that her mother had asked about her relationship. I am. Then this might interest you. I came across some home decorating magazines at my hairdressers, of all places. And who did I see in a feature story? You're Simon. She pulled the magazine from her purse and flipped through it before handing it to her daughter. Sophie's breath caught in her throat. There he was, sitting in a chic downtown loft, a beautiful woman by his side. That's him. Who is the woman with him? The article mentions a fiancé. He hasn't mentioned being engaged. How long ago did this come out? Sophie closed the magazine and looked for the publication date. It's this month's issue. Here are your eggs, Benedict. I'll be back with more coffee in a moment. Is there anything else I can get you? The new waitress was friendly and competent. Sophie was glad for the reprieve. Do you mind if I hang on to this? Be my guest. Sophie rolled the magazine up and tucked it into her purse. She tried not to think about the woman in the pictures. The elegantly dressed brunette gazed lovingly at Simon in one of the shots, the light hitting the large diamond ring on her finger. What do you know about the other woman? How long ago did they break up? Her mother cut a piece of English muffin with ham, the thick sauce dripping off the fork. I don't know. He did end things with her though, didn't he? He's not stringing you along until he gets married to, her mother waved her hand, this other person. The idea made Sophie sick to her stomach. I don't think so. He's been on the island most of the time. He's gone up to Charlotte a few times for the day to close on some property he owned there. I've seen him almost every day. Well, these articles are sometimes written months in advance. Still, it is strange that he didn't mention this person to you. Maybe that's something you two should talk about before you get involved further with the man. I will, Sophie said quietly. She put her fork down, all appetite gone. The black coffee tasted as bitter as the taste the article had left in her mouth. I'll give her one thing. She has good taste. I hope he didn't sell the condo. It was leased office space as far as I know, Sophie said distractedly. She couldn't wait to get out of the restaurant. She needed to think. A long walk on the beach might help. And then a bath and a good book. She needed to clear her head and come to terms with everything before she confronted Simon. Chapter 13 Good to see you, man. Simon walked up to his brother-in-law. When did you guys make it in? A couple of hours ago. Your dad is holed up in his office on a client call. Your mom and Summer went grocery shopping. They should be back any minute. Braden basked on the back deck, soaking up some late afternoon sun. Mom's been going crazy about this visit. She's been cooking and baking for days. I'm pretty sure the fridge is full. He'd stopped by two days ago to drop off more eggs and vegetables and they'd struggled to find room for everything. Braden sighed. I know. Summer has us eating a plant-based whole foods diet. 
everyone in Colorado is on it. At least everyone at Summer's Lab. So we're eating rabbit food. Sounds miserable. It is. I haven't had a steak or a burger in months. I think I'm running low on iron. Braden took a swig of something that smelled like vinegar from a dark brown glass bottle. New microbrew? Simon asked, pointing to the bottle. Kombucha. Fermented tea. It's supposed to be good for your gut microbiome. Want one? He held the bottle up to Simon. It smelled like vinegar. I think I'll pass. Good call. Brayden tipped up the bottle and drank the last of the vile liquid. The face he made made Simon laugh. How about I grab us a couple of beers? He got up before Brayden could decline. Simon grabbed two beers from the fridge and the pack of beef jerky his mother kept for him in the back of the pantry. You are a lifesaver. Brayden ripped the bag open and grabbed a large chunk of dry beef covered in cracked pepper. This is the best thing I've eaten in weeks. He washed it down with half a beer. Always happy to help. Simon grinned and grabbed a piece of jerky. How are things going with your grandmother? Are you sure you're okay living there? Brayden turned and looked at him. Honestly, it's going better than expected. Sure, she has her rough days, and it's strange when she thinks I'm her long-dead brother. Most of the time, we get along just fine. It's not hard to keep an eye on her, and Sophie has been a big help. Tell me about her. Did she grow up here? Brayden picked up his beer and leaned back. She did. She didn't go to Palmer High, though. Her mother had her in some boarding school in Georgia. That's probably why we didn't cross paths. She's a couple of years older than us. And she runs the local bookstore? Simon nodded. She loves it. It's not the most profitable store, but then, what brick and mortar store is these days? Knowing you, you have a plan to help her with that, don't you? Braden raised an eyebrow. You know me too well. Simon grinned. I have a couple of ad campaigns running and some ideas about taking a portion of the shop online. Expand Sophie's audience, that type of thing. Good for you. Brayden picked up another piece of jerky. When are you popping the question? What question? The question. Brayden pointed to his wedding band. It's a little early for that. We've only been seeing each other for a couple of weeks. You'll know it when it's the right time. One thing I can tell you is that you seem happier than you ever were with Megan. More relaxed too. Simon looked out over the ocean. A squadron of pelicans flew low along the shoreline, presumably looking for lunch. Brayden was right. I haven't thought about Megan in weeks. Instead, he'd been thinking about the kind and beautiful brunette who happily joined him and his grandmother for lunch each day. Who had a kind word for everyone and loved to give away books to the people she loved. I'm glad. She's not worth it. Simon looked up at his friend. He was confused. Not worth it? Sophie was an amazing person and there was nothing wrong with her spending time with Grandma Wendy or giving away books. Yes, it cut in her meager profits, but still. Megan. She was never the one for you. I think we all saw it long before you did. That made more sense. You're right. She's not worth it. I spent too many months, heck years, trying to please her. I was pretty down until I met Sophie. Isn't it amazing when you meet the right person? When I reconnected with Summer, I knew right away she was the one. The person I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. A car pulled up and door slammed. Ugh. Summer and your mom are back. We need to get rid of these. Brayden looked at the bag of beef jerky and the beer in his hand. Hand it over and go brush your teeth. You're the only one getting in trouble for this. Simon took the bag and empty beer bottle from his best friend. The women were walking through the front door when Simon dropped the two empty beer bottles into the trash. The bag of jerky was still in his hand. There's my elusive big brother. 
Summer put the grocery bags on the counter and hugged him. That stuff isn't good for you. She scrunched up her nose. Oh, come on. We used to live off this stuff when we went fishing with Grandpa. And I distinctly remember you polishing a bag by yourself after a race. That was ages ago. Before I knew better. You don't need all those preservatives in your body. She took the bag out of his hand and dumped it into the trash. Your sister is eating very clean. Apparently my home cooking isn't as healthy and wholesome as I thought. His mother smiled but Simon could see the hurt in her eyes. It was good enough for you when you were living with us earlier this summer. Clive walked into the kitchen and put an arm around his wife. Your mother has been cooking and baking for days. Your food is always good, mom. And compared to what other families eat, it is healthy. We've worked so hard the past few weeks to kick all those sugars and additives. I was hoping we could continue to eat clean while we're here. It's no problem at all. More spaghetti and meatballs for us. Jane smiled at her daughter. I told you we should have brought this up before we came down, Brayden whispered to his wife. Simon shook his head. As long as y'all don't expect me to eat rabbit food all day, we're good. He turned to look at his mother. I was thinking of bringing Grandma Wendy over for dinner tonight, and Sophie, if that's okay. I think that would be wonderful. His mother's smile was wide and genuine. It felt good to make her happy. As a matter of fact, he wanted everyone around him to be happy. Simon grinned right back at her before heading out to check on his grandmother. He called Sophie from the car. I know this is last minute, but would you like to come to dinner at my parents' house? I'd love for you to meet my sister and Brayden. I would love to, but I have to close the store tonight. I won't be able to make it until a little after seven. Maddie is taking Willow to an open house thing at the elementary school. Seven is fine. I'll meet you at the store and we can pick up dessert for everyone. It wasn't perfect, but it would do. He'd manage the first part of the family dinner on his own. I wish I'd known about this sooner. I could have made something for dessert. Sophie's voice was high, the words coming out fast. Don't worry about it. You can dazzle them with your kitchen skills next time. I'll swing by and grab a pie at Mary's. First though, he'd have to get his grandmother prepared for the visit. Anything out of her daily routine was tricky. At least she seemed to be having one of her good days today. Simon crossed his fingers that it would stay that way. Summer, dear. You haven't been to see me in days. You must be busy with your new job. Grandma Wendy hugged her only granddaughter. Grandma, I moved to Colorado. That makes it a little hard to pop in for a visit. I'm glad to see you, though. You look like you're doing well. Of course. I know that. Grandma Wendy turned to Simon. What did you do with the deviled eggs I made? I've got them right here. He held out the glass plate covered in cling wrap. We can put them out on the counter right here. His mother took the plate from him. Your father and Brayden are out on the deck grilling steaks. Simon grabbed three beers and walked outside. Thank you, son. His father's face was red from the heat of the afternoon sun and the gas grill. He studied the meat closely, aiming for perfectly cooked, medium-rare steaks. He always did. Of course, the instant read thermometer Simon got him for Christmas last year didn't hurt. He joined Brayden and the two of them talked business until the steaks were done. Anyone hungry? His mother asked when everything was ready. Simon glanced at his watch. It was a quarter till six. He had plenty of time to eat dinner, stop by the diner, and be at Sophie's by seven. Do you have somewhere to be? His sister asked, poking him in the ribs. Not yet. I'm picking up Sophie in a little while. She'll join us for dessert. About time I met the woman who helped you get over that stuck up. Summer. Her mother shook her head. It's okay. She's not wrong. Megan had her faults, plenty of them. 
and he could see now that she was not the woman he wanted to build a life with. Someone else held that place and piece of his heart. You two are getting pretty serious. His father looked conflicted. Simon had a feeling he knew what that was about. What did you do with that big rock Megan made you buy her? Summer asked. She never gave it back. Truth be told, he hadn't thought about the ring until Summer brought it up. Well, that's bad manners. If a young woman breaks an engagement, she gives back the ring. Grandma Wendy shook her head, her eyebrows drawn together. Not that she seems to be the sensible kind. If she was, she'd never let you go, Simon. She patted his arm. And then I wouldn't have met Sophie. It all worked out in the end. And the ring was a gift. Megan can do with it as she sees fit. If it meant that their paths never crossed, all the better. And we look forward to meeting Sophie. When is she coming? His mother smiled excitedly. I'll leave in half an hour to go get her, Simon said. You'd better eat up then. They were all finished with dinner before it was time for Simon to head out. Do you have a minute, son? His father asked and motioned for Simon to follow him into his study. I won't keep you long. He walked into the room and his father closed the door behind him. Everything okay? Under any other circumstances, I would never divulge client information. His father paced the room. I know about the bookstore. The numbers don't look great, but I think we can turn it around. Simon leaned against the desk. They don't, and they haven't for a while. Sophie tells me sales will go up, but with the expenses. I've been helping Sophie with some marketing. And even if the ads don't convert to sales, she'll be okay. She's a smart cookie. I hope you're right. I wouldn't be where I'm at today without her grandparents. Did I ever tell you that they were my first clients? Or that they got the entire island to create the scholarship that helped me go to college? Faith and Joshua Davenport were good people. As is their granddaughter. His father nodded. That she is. Let me know how the advertising is going. And keep track of any expenses you incur on her behalf. His father sat down at his desk to make notes. I have to run, Dad. Don't worry about Sophie. She'll land on her feet, no matter what. He hoped he could help her salvage the book nook, because he knew how much it meant to her. But either way, Sophie would find her way. Ready? Simon sat in one of the overstuffed chairs that were spread around the book nook. He looked comfortable. Almost. Give me two minutes. Sophie locked the day's earnings in the small safe in her office. When she walked back to the main room of the shop, he had a book in his hands, and he was smiling. Sophie walked over quietly and sneaked a glance at what he was reading. It was the book of local lighthouses she'd shown Willow. Simon gazed at the picture of the one they'd visited not that long ago. The lighthouse where they'd kissed. He closed the book when he saw her standing a few feet away from him. Let's go. I'm sure my grandmother and sister are ready for dessert. Well, maybe not summer. She used to have quite the sweet tooth, but she's on this whole foods diet thing. It's supposed to be really good for you. Maybe it is, but I'm not giving up steaks or Mary's peanut butter pie. He waited for her to lock the store and took her hand as they walked down to his SUV. Can I ask you something? It's a little personal. Sure. Simon pulled out on the main road that would lead toward his parents' house. My mother came across an article in this interior design magazine. Sophie's voice was soft. Simon glanced over at the passenger seat. Her eyes were cast down as she stared at her shoes. And? She showed me an article about you and your place in Charlotte. There was another pause. With your fiancé? I forgot all about that. Simon shook his head. He should have brought Megan up. This wasn't a great time to have this conversation. He wanted to be able to look her in the eye and gauge her reaction to his ex about the article. Not the fiancé. Ex-fiancé. A photographer stopped by almost a year ago. 
Megan studied interior design and made over my condo. I wasn't even sure they'd run it. How long were you engaged? He risked another glance in her direction. Sophie's eyes were fixed out the side window, avoiding him. That couldn't be good. About five months. She left when she found someone better. My banker, in fact. He lives in the same building. It was impossible to keep the bitterness out of his voice. Did you love her? At the time, I thought I did. I wouldn't have proposed otherwise. He took a deep breath. In hindsight, her leaving was the best thing that happened to me. I didn't realize that we didn't work until she was out of my life. Hmm. He wasn't explaining this well. I was stuck in the things you're supposed to do when you build a successful company. Get the big office. Lease the right car. Marry someone who will throw the perfect business dinner and look good on your arm at events. Megan had ticked all those boxes off perfectly. And you don't want those things anymore? I don't. When Megan left, I was crushed. Not because I missed her, but because of my pride. I'd lost to a guy with a bigger paycheck, a more expensive car, and the penthouse condo. It wasn't until I came back home and had some time to clear my head that I realized I haven't been happy the past few years. Our company was doing great. I had everything I ever needed or wanted. And I was miserable. Megan leaving me was the best thing that could have happened. Because otherwise, he wouldn't have met Sophie. But this wasn't the time for that kind of confession. I wish I'd known about her before my mother ambushed me over brunch. Sophie grinned wryly. Simon's eyes returned to the road. They were almost there. I'm sorry about that. I wish I'd told you about her sooner. The truth is, I haven't thought about her much since I started spending time with you. That's no excuse, though. You deserve to know. Sophie nodded. Her mouth was pressed into a tight line and her cheeks were pale. He reached over and squeezed her hand. I'm serious. My relationship with Megan wasn't great to begin with. And it was over long before she walked out. I just didn't want to admit it. I never felt for her what I feel for you. What about your family? How do they feel about you dating someone else? Honestly, they are thrilled and can't wait to meet you. Let's just say Megan wasn't my mother's favorite. And don't even get me started on my sister. I think she may have thrown a party the day she found out about the breakup. What do you think the chances are that they'll feel the same way about me? Zero. His reply was immediate. He didn't have to think about it. You are sweet and kind and my grandmother adores you. Did I mention that she's at the house? I'm sure she's been singing your praises the entire time I've been gone. Now you're making stuff up to make me feel better. Simon heard the laughter in Sophie's voice. His hand flew to his chest. Who me? I would never. Sophie laughed. He wasn't sure if it was his comedic talent or her nerves. Probably the latter. Either way, he would take it. He pulled into his parents' driveway and cut the engine. Turning in his seat, he gave her a quick kiss. You have nothing to worry about. My family will love you. Chapter 14 Ready? Simon walked into the bookstore, dressed in tight jeans and a crisp white cotton shirt. His sleeves were rolled up, showing off his sculpted forearms. Sophie forced herself to turn back to the customer she was helping. Give me a minute, she said over her shoulder. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Simon stroll to the fantasy and sci-fi section. She breathed a sigh of relief. That would keep him busy until she and Maddie could get this rush of customers under control. Sophie smiled. It was good to see the store full of people. It was happening a lot more frequently than before, and they were nearing the end of the main tourist season. People stopped in to buy small gifts and stationery in addition to the books. And she'd unwittingly begun to make a name for herself in the antique and first edition market. At the rate things were going, it would be no problem making payroll. Mr. Johnson would be proud. 
I'll take you over to the register, she said to the young woman interested in several historical romances. It's starting to slow down, Maddie said. She slumped down into one of the comfortable reading chairs scattered around the store. Sophie nodded. Who knew bookstores could have a lunch rush? Are you sure you'll be okay by yourself? If it picks up like this again while I'm gone. It'll be fine. Worst case scenario, I give Jane a call. I'm sure she wouldn't mind helping out for a couple of hours. Simon walked up, a book in his hand. I told my mother to expect a call from you. She's ready and waiting. Sophie hugged him. She's been such a blessing. I wish she would let me pay her. She enjoys it. It gets her out of the house, and you've given her plenty of books and stationery. And let's not even talk about the books you'd keep sneaking to my grandmother. Don't think I don't notice. He kissed Sophie on her nose. It's the least I can do. Sophie looked around the store. It was full of life. So much more vibrant than it had been a few weeks ago. I told you going back to selling more stationery and gift items was a good idea. I didn't believe it at first, either. Maddie said, moving to straighten a display of leather-bound journals. The woman never sat still. If there was one shelf out of order in the store, or a surface that could use some dusting, Maddie was on it. Sophie didn't know what she'd done to deserve her as a friend and employee. You should get out of here, Maddie said. Things are definitely slowing down. I have it covered from here. Sophie looked around, unsure if she should take the afternoon off. Go. You deserve a break. Maddie smiled at her encouragingly. If we want to make it all the way to Fort Fisher, we'd better get going. Simon held out his hand and she grabbed it. Fort Fisher was stunning. I can't believe you've never been here. Simon put his arm around Sophie. They were walking along the long boardwalk in the Fort Fisher State Historic Site. Me neither. This place is beautiful. I had no idea something like this was close by. She couldn't take her eyes off the wild landscape. Not much of the Civil War fort remained, but the beach and the view of the Cape Fear River more than made up for that fact. There are a lot of places just as beautiful all over the Carolinas. Have you been down in the Beaufort area? Simon tucked a strand of her hair behind her ear. Sophie shook her head. We'll have to drive down there. Maybe later this fall, after it cools down a bit. Simon wiped the sweat off his forehead. It was another scorching day. Sophie pulled a water bottle from her purse and handed it to him. It was no longer cold, but better than nothing. Thanks. He drank half of it in one go, before handing it back to her. Keep it, she said. I have another one in here. She patted the side of her bag. Always prepared. He smiled and kissed her cheek. I don't know about that. I wasn't really prepared for the influx of customers this morning. That's a good thing, though. You and Maddie will adjust. And if it stays that way over the coming weeks, you can always hire someone else part-time. Like your mom? She smiled up at him. She liked Jane. She might be talked into it. Not sure how my dad feels about her working somewhere, though. The last time she took a part-time job, he grumbled about it bumping them into a higher tax bracket. Sophie laughed. If that's his biggest problem. She let her gaze travel across the wild landscape surrounding them. Coming to the beach had been good for her soul. Her heart felt lighter and her mind clearer. We'll see how it goes. The past few days could have been a fluke. Or a late summer tourist rush. Simon nodded. You'll adapt, no matter what. You sound so sure of that. She looked at him, surprised by his confidence in her. He was the one with the successful business, after all. That's because I know you. He pushed the bottle into the pocket of his khaki shorts and took her hand in his. You are smart and determined. Look at what you've done already with the stationary stuff. And that's peanuts. Imagine what you could do if you took the store online. 
and invited some indie authors to sell their books. Stuff that isn't easy to find in the big box stores. I like the idea of showcasing indie authors. I'm not sure how I'd go about getting them into the store or how we'd deal with returns and such, but it's definitely something worth looking into. Sophie leaned against the railing, the wind blowing off the ocean and through her hair. I'll do some research, he said, Simon had that distant look on his face she'd come to associate with his mind brewing on a new idea. Can we stop talking about sales and enjoy this place for now? Sophie asked. You're right. This is no time for talking shop. He pulled her into a quick hug. I'm sorry. Let's enjoy the view. His stomach growled. Maybe not for that much longer. Simon laughed. I can make it for a while. But when we're done here, I'm taking you into Wilmington for lunch. I know this great little place that serves German food. I think you're going to love it. Chapter 15 Simon, do you mind getting the door? You've got it, Mom. Simon jogged down the stairs. He'd been digging through the closet of his childhood bedroom, looking for his old wood carving set. He'd promised Willow to show her how to whittle. It was something every child should know how to do. His grandfather had taught him and Summer when they were about Willow's age. He smiled as he recalled the excitement on the young girl's face. And the horror on Sophie and Maddie's. Simon pulled the front door open. How can I, he took a step back. Hi, Simon. What are you doing here? Megan was the last person he'd expected to see today. I missed you. I figured I'd jump in the car and come see you. Are you going to invite me in? No way. The last thing he needed was for his mother to see his ex. She'd give his former fiancé an earful. Wait here. I'll be right back. Simon ran up the stairs and grabbed the box with his woodworking tools. Who was at the door, his mother asked as he raced back down. Solicitor. I told them to go away. I'm sorry, Mom. I have to run. He kissed her on the cheek, glad she was still in the kitchen doing dishes. Did you find what you were looking for? Sure did. He held up the small wooden box with the Celtic knot design carved in the top. I'll call you later. Don't forget about family dinner on Sunday. Jane rinsed her hands and dried them on the towel. I won't. I promise. Grandma's looking forward to it already. He walked out the door quickly and pulled it shut behind himself. What do you want from me, Megan? His tone was rougher than he'd intended. Like I said. I missed you. Is there somewhere we can talk? Megan's shoulders were slumped, her eyes downcast. This wasn't the confident woman who used to boss him around. I don't have a lot of time, but we could grab a coffee. He'd hear her out. Not that he owned it to her or anything. But his mother had raised him to be kind and polite and that's what he'd do. Lead the way. She followed him down the island to the roasted coffee bean. He parked behind the coffee shop and waited for her to pull into the parking spot beside him. This is cute. Megan looked around as they walked into the shop. Why didn't you take me here before? She'd been down to the island twice. Both times they'd stayed with his parents. There wasn't much time to go out for coffee. What can I get you, the purple-haired teenager behind the counter asked. Simon didn't remember seeing her before. A large coffee. Black. He turned to look at Megan. Can I get a blended mocha with an extra shot of vanilla syrup? Make it sugar-free and hold the whipped cream. Her eyes wandered the display of pastries though he knew she wouldn't indulge herself. Sure thing, sugar. Go take a seat. I'll bring it out when it's ready. The barista pointed to the sitting area. Megan walked off in search of the perfect spot. That's $12.32. Simon shook his head and paid for both of their drinks. He waited for the girl to pour his coffee before joining Megan at the table she'd chosen by the window. He pulled out the chair across from her and sat down, 
placing his coffee in front of him. What are you doing on Palmer Island, Megan? I told you. I miss you and I wanted to see you. Megan smiled at him in that way that used to make him feel all warm and fuzzy inside. This time it didn't do anything for him. Megan, you left me. I haven't seen you or talked to you in months. No need to mention that he'd moved four hours away to ensure he wouldn't run into her and her new fiancé. I'm sorry about that. About the way things ended. I never should have left. We had a good thing going. A great thing. And I want that back. You're kidding, right? You left me. You moved in with James Alexander. He saw her flinch. Ah, uh, that's why you're here. You and him are over? It didn't work out for us. He's nothing like you, Simon. I don't know what I ever saw in the man. If anything, this experience has taught me what a great person you are. I think in the end, this could turn out to be a good thing. Our relationship will be stronger than ever. You've got to be kidding me. I like it down here. We're going to buy a little house right on the ocean. White picket fence out front. We are going to be so happy here. Down the road, maybe an apartment in New York. Simon stared at her. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Of course, the place would have to be big enough for our kids. And for my parents to come visit. Six bedrooms should do nicely. And a large space for entertaining. I think I saw a couple of potential places for sale when I drove in. Megan, stop. He looked at her and waited for her to meet his eye. We are done. We're not getting back together. Here's your mocha. The young barista handed Megan her drink. Enjoy. Megan grabbed the cup and took a long sip of the iced drink. Simon waited for the redhead to walk back to the counter. I'm serious, Megan. Why would you want to get back together anyway? Because we were great together. We complement each other. Make the other one a better person. No, we weren't and we don't. Simon shook his head. We were convenient. We made each other look good. Aside from that. He shrugged. Aside from that, they hadn't had much in common. Heck, they didn't even enjoy each other's company. How had he not seen that until now? We did make each other look good, didn't we? Remember that time you guys were trying to get that guy, what was he doing? Some sort of online marketing stuff, and I hosted the perfect dinner party. He loved the salmon I made. And that was before I got a chance to redo our place. Simon tuned her out and stared out the window. The wind had picked up and car steadily passed. Simon. What? Simon hadn't been paying attention. For a second, he thought he saw Sophie. But she was busy working at the bookstore. I said I can help you and Brayden take this little company of yours to the next level. Impress those contacts of yours over dinners. Are you listening to me at all? Megan stared at him over the rim of her sugary drink. Simon held up his hand. Megan, I don't need you to help me impress anyone. And even if I did, it wouldn't be a good enough reason to get back together. Her shoulders slumped. What am I supposed to do then? What do you mean? You move on. I'm sure you'll find someone else. Simon folded his arms across his chest and scooted back in his chair. It's not that easy. Megan fiddled with her napkin, keeping her eyes downcast. Simon waited. If she wanted to tell him what was really going on with her, she needed to speak up. Otherwise, he was out of there. He resisted the urge to glance at his watch. I was living with James. It was all going well. I was busy taking care of him, running his life, organizing after-work cocktails, planning dinner parties. And then he decided we weren't right for each other. I did everything for that man. Took care of him 24 to 7, quit my job to support him. And then? You quit your job? Simon couldn't believe it. Yeah, right after I moved. That's why I'm in such a mess. She looked up at him, her eyes big. 
I'm homeless and destitute. You have to take me back, Simon. I'm not taking you back. You got yourself into this mess, and I hope you'll come out of it better and stronger. Why don't you go visit your parents for a little while? I'm sure they'd love to see you. It will give you a chance to reset, figure out what you want to do with your life. He liked her father. Donald would set his daughter straight and help her rebuild her life. I'm not even sure how I'd get back to Omaha. Simon, I have less than $200 to my name. How did you get down here? Simon asked. He didn't recognize the car she drove. I flew and rented a car for the day. Tell you what we'll do. I'll drive you to the airport and buy you a one-way ticket to Omaha. You can call your parents from the airport. He rose and motioned for her to walk out in front of him. Megan stayed put. You don't really want to do this. We're perfect together. We're not, and I'm sure you will see that once you get your feet back under you. He looked toward the door and thought about his own future. Besides, I'm seeing someone. And he couldn't wait to get back to her. You're kidding, right? Megan rose and walked over to the trash can in the corner. She tossed her cup into it with the force of an NBA basketball player. We've been separated, what? Ten weeks? And you already found yourself a... Uh. Megan. His voice was calm. Simon wasn't about to play into the scene she was trying to make. He waited for her to turn and look at him. You left me. I've moved on. And so will you. He walked out the door of the roasted bean, leaving it up to her to follow him and take him up on his offer. Or not. Sophie did a double take. Sure enough. Simon sat in the roasted bean, across the table, from a pretty brunette. She crossed the street, looking forward to being introduced to one of his friends. The woman turned and Sophie stopped in her tracks. She recognized her from the magazine spread. This was Simon's fiancé. Ex-fiancé, Sophie reminded herself. She considered entering the coffee shop, but when she saw the woman reach across the table and take Simon's hand, he didn't pull away. Sophie turned and walked back to her car. Her fingers shook so hard, she had trouble unlocking the door. Had Simon lied to her? Sophie? Maddie walked over to her as soon as she entered the shop. You're as white as a sheet. I'm fine. I need a minute. Sophie looked around the shop. It was busy, and Maddie would need her help. Let me splash some water on my face, and I'll man the register. By the time the sudden slew of customers had been taken care of, Sophie felt steadier. It had to be a mistake. Maybe the woman surprised him? When is Willow getting off the bus? Miss Doris waltzed into the store, carrying a large covered tray. I brought an after-school snack for her. Sophie raised an eyebrow. There's enough to share. It's her first day of school. I wanted to make it special. Miss Doris set the tray on the counter and pulled the cover off. Those are adorable. Sophie stepped closer. The tray was full of muffins decorated in all colors of the rainbow. Little flags that spelled out happy first day back to school were stuck into them and everything was covered in colorful sprinkles. She's going to love it, Maddie said. She glanced at her phone. I'd better go get her. She's not taking the bus. I'd better get these back in the kitchen. Do you have milk? Miss Doris covered the tray and started to walk to the back of the store in search of the small kitchen. It's in the fridge. Sophie shook her head at her own obviousness. I started a pot of coffee, Miss Doris said when she returned to the store a few minutes later. Have those cookbooks I ordered come in yet by chance? Sophie checked the computer. The shipment came this morning. They're probably still in one of the boxes. Let me go find them. Oh, no trouble. They are supposed to send me one in the mail eventually, but I thought it would be nice to have a few on hand. Miss Doris sat down in the oversized chair, closest to the cash register. It's no trouble at all. Would you mind calling me if someone needs help? 
Of course, dear. It didn't take long to find the stack of cookbooks. Sophie carried them back into the main part of the store. National Apple Growers Association Cookbook? I've tasted your cooking. The last thing you need is a cookbook, let alone five of them. Funny. Miss Doris took the top book from the stack and opened it. I submitted a recipe and it was accepted. Oh how fun. Can I see? Sophie set the remaining cookbooks on the counter and opened the top one. It's on page 35, Miss Doris said. The smile on the older woman's face was contagious. This sounds delicious. I can't wait to try it. Miss Doris. My mom said you brought me a special after-school snack. Willow barreled into the store and launched herself at Miss Doris, grabbing her in a fierce hug. What is it? Can I see? I'm starving. Willow. Where are your manners? Maddie's lips were tight, her gaze stern, but Sophie could see the corners of her mouth twitch. I'm sorry. Willow turned to look at her mother. I really am hungry. I'm not the one you should apologize to. Maddie pointed her chin toward Miss Doris. I'm sorry, Miss Doris. I got excited because I love it when you bake me something. It's always the most delicious. Almost as good as Dino Nuggets. Miss Doris laughed. Coming from you, that's a high compliment. Let's get you some milk and that snack. It's waiting in the kitchen. The two of them took off toward the back of the store. Ready to tell me what happened to you this morning after you got back from the bank. Maddie pulled Sophie over to the couch. Aside from a lone customer browsing the history section, the store was empty. It was a nice reprieve after another busy day. Sophie picked up one of the cookbooks and flipped through the pages, looking for Miss Doris's recipe. Did you know that Miss Doris won a baking contest? She has a recipe in here somewhere. Of course I know. Who do you think ordered the books? Maddie took it from her hand and placed it back on the stack. Now stop stalling and tell me what happened earlier. I saw Simon. Sophie clasped her hands together, trying to think of the right words. How could she explain? That's not usually a bad thing. Maddie smiled encouragingly. He was sitting in the roasted bean having coffee. Sophie took a deep breath. With his former fiancé. Ouch. What did he have to say for himself? Maddie scooted to the edge of her seat. I didn't talk to him. They looked cozy and I didn't want to intrude. Sophie shrugged. Oh, please. I would have marched in there and given him a piece of my mind. Maddie stood up and put her hands on her hips. Sit down. We have customers, Sophie hissed. We have one and he's two rooms away. Maddie's shoulders dropped and she sat back down. What did you do when you saw them? Honestly? Nothing. I was too stunned. I only knew about her because my mother found an article about the two of them in a magazine. That's how I recognized her. Simon rarely talks about her. I don't even know how long they were together. Sophie scooted back on the couch and pulled up her legs, hugging them to her chest. So this could all be a misunderstanding. How far away were you? Maybe it wasn't this Megan person. He has a sister, doesn't he? He does. Summer. She's out in Colorado. She's blonde and looks nothing like this woman. I'm 95% sure it was the woman from the magazine. I think I still have it somewhere. So, let's say it was her. That doesn't mean he's interested in getting back with her. Maybe they have some loose ends to tie up? Maddie smiled and squeezed Sophie's leg. Talk to Simon. See what this is all about. What if it was all too good to be true? Sophie forced herself to uncurl and sit up. Eventually, the customer would have to walk back through to get to the cash register or leave. Don't even go there. You two are perfect together, and if there's one person in this world who deserves to find her epic love, it's you. Maddie rose and held her hand out for her. 
Sophie forced out a laugh. Not that I've been all that lucky so far. All the more reason. It's your time. You will figure this out. Maddie pulled her up and into a tight hug. And if I'm wrong, I'll buy ice cream and we'll binge every single Jane Austen movie we can get our hands on. It's a deal. Sophie smoothed her skirt out. You'd better go check on Willow and Miss Doris. I'll check this gentleman out and join you in a few. She locked the door and hung the back in 15 minutes sign before joining the crew in the kitchen. Did you leave a cupcake for me? Sophie asked. She held back a smile at the sight of Willow with blue frosting and sprinkles all over her face. Miss Sophie. The huge smile on the child's face was infectious. Miss Doris made me special cupcakes for going back to school. Want one? She picked one up and held it out to her. It was covered in pink frosting and rainbow sprinkles. Sophie took it and set it on the small saucer Miss Doris put in front of her along with a large cup of coffee. Maddie rose. I'll go man the store. Sophie put a hand on her friend's arm. Sit back down and finish your cupcake. I put the sign up. We can take a little break together. Are you sure? We could be missing out on customers. Maddie's eyebrows were scrunched together. Sophie wondered how much her friend knew about the trouble the store was in. I'm sure. They'll come back. Besides, we have a reason to celebrate. She turned to Willow. How was your first day back? Did anything fun happen? Well, this boy put gum in someone's hair and there was all sorts of drama. Willow sighed. That doesn't sound fun. Sophie took a bite of the cupcake. The frosting was a bit much, but the chocolate cake was to die for. It wasn't for Lily, but some of the boys thought it was hilarious. Willow shrugged her shoulders. Anything else you want to tell us about? Maddie asked. Honestly, I'm not sure I want to go back. All we did was color and read the same little books we had last year. What's the point? I'm in second grade. Shouldn't we be reading chapter books and writing stories or something? Miss Doris laughed. Give it some time. I'm sure your teacher was trying to go easy on you on the first day. If you're anything like my boys, you'll be complaining about homework in no time. You have boys? How old are they? How come I've never seen them? Willow's eyes grew wide. They're grown men now. They come and visit me from time to time. Ah, uh, okay. Willow lost all interest. Can I go upstairs and read? She looked at her mom. Why don't you and I go have a look at the chapter books? I'm sure we can find something worthy of a second grader. Sophie took the girl's sticky hand. Maybe they should stop by the restroom first. Chapter 16 Rachel McClure? Simon asked when a middle-aged woman with a rolling carry-on walked toward him. One and the same. Thank you for offering to pick me up. The woman, dressed in a twill skirt and suit jacket much too warm for this South Carolina weather, held out her hand. He dropped the small sign he'd been holding and shook it. Simon Johnson, it's nice to meet you, Miss McClure. I'm parked right out front. One of the advantages of Myrtle Beach's small airport was that parking wasn't far and the crowd of new arrivals was sparse. How was your flight, he asked when they pulled out onto the highway to head south to Palmer Island. A little bumpy, but not too bad. Miss McClure looked out the window. It is beautiful down here. I have you set up right on the beach. It's nothing fancy, but my friend Miss Doris will take good care of you. I appreciate that. I'm excited about the signing this afternoon. How many people are you expecting? To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure. You're our first book signing event. What I can tell you is that your latest book has been flying off the shelves. Simon didn't know much about the story. He'd tried to read it, but the sweet historical romance series wasn't quite his thing. His grandmother had loved it though and had been talking about the event non-stop for the past week. I'm sure it'll be a great turnout. 
I can't tell you how much I appreciate bookstores like yours who take a chance on self-published authors. It's not always easy to get our books into brick and mortar stores. It's not my store. My girlfriend runs it. I'm helping out with a little bit of the marketing and such. Isn't that nice of you? They rode in silence for a few minutes, Miss McClure enjoying the scenery as they drove across the bridge and onto Palmer Island. My grandmother is excited to meet you at the book nook later. I think she's read every single one of your books. I look forward to meeting her too. Tell her to bring them all. I'm happy to sign them. That's kind of you. She's a big fan of all those Highlanders. I guess with a name like yours, you were destined to write those types of books. Miss McClure laughed. Oh, Rachel McClure is a pen name. I thought it was fitting. My real name is Rachel White. He pulled up to Miss Doris's house and walked around the car. He held his hand out for his passenger. Well then, it's nice to meet you, Miss White. Call me Rachel. Simon got Rachel settled in with Miss Doris. The author loved the freshly painted room with its seafoam-colored walls and white furniture. Wait until you see the back deck, he told her before heading out to check on his grandmother. Grandma? Simon was surprised when the old woman wasn't in the kitchen or living room. By now she was usually settled in her recliner, reading a romance novel. She wasn't in the garden or the chicken coop, either. Simon walked back into the kitchen. The coffee pot was almost empty and a fresh basket of eggs sat on the counter. His grandmother had followed her usual routine. Between that and the medication Dr. Peters had her on, they were managing. It wasn't perfect, but most days they muddled through fine. Today was not that kind of day. Simon made one more lap through each room of the house and the garage before heading out onto the street. By the time he'd made it to the end of the block, panic had set in. There was no sign of his grandmother anywhere. Simon pulled out his phone, ready to call his father and then the police, hoping they would help track her down. He hesitated for a moment. Grandma Wendy would hate this. The phone display lit up with an incoming call as his thumb hovered over his father's contact icon. Hello? Simon? This is Billy Madison, from up the street. Your grandmother is sitting on my back porch. I don't think she knows where she is. Simon let out the breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. I'll be right over. Seeing her grandson snapped Grandma Wendy back to the present, and it didn't take him long to get her home and settled in with her book and a fresh cup of coffee. I'm so sorry, Simon. I don't know what happened. I was bringing in the eggs and next thing I know, there's Billy Madison and you. She shook her head, sadness pooling in the corners of her eyes. It's okay, Grandma. You scared me, but all's well that ends well. He wished he was as convinced as his voice sounded. Good. His grandmother put a hand over his. Please don't tell your father. If Clive finds out I got lost and wandered off, he'll put me in that home. I heard him talking about it to Joyce. They have a spot reserved for me. Are you sure you wouldn't be better off in a place like that where they can keep an eye on you? Help you when you need someone? As much as he tried, it was hard to provide round-the-clock support, run a business, and find time for Sophie. I don't want to leave my home, Simon. Can we try a little longer? See if the adjustments Dr. Peters made yesterday work? She was close to tears. It tore Simon's heart apart to see her like this. His grandmother was one of the proudest people he knew. Slowly losing her mind couldn't be easy for her. I won't tell him about today. We'll try and make this work. He squeezed her hand. The smile on the old woman's face made it all worth it. Here we are, Miss White. Simon opened the door to the book nook. McClure, the woman corrected him softly. And I told you both to call me Rachel. You are going to love the store, Rachel. Sophie is such a sweetheart and she has the best selection. She's even ordered special large print versions of your books for people like me. His grandmother took the author's hand and pulled her into the store. 
Simon shook his head. In the five-minute drive from Miss Doris's house to Sophie's store, the two had become fast friends. He hung back as his grandmother introduced Rachel to Sophie and Maddie. He hoped Rachel wouldn't mention that he'd paid to fly her in and had covered the bill at Miss Doris's place. Miss Doris knew to keep that part quiet, but he hadn't had a chance to mention it to the romance author. This is going to be such a big success. Jane linked her arm in his. The girls at the library have been talking about nothing else for days. Everyone is so excited to meet Miss McClure this afternoon. His mother had been right. The reading and book signing was a huge success. The store was packed with romance fans, and all of them bought books and stood in line, waiting for Rachel to sign them. Simon spent much of the day sitting in an oversized chair across from the cash register, working on his laptop and keeping an eye on the event. He was impressed with Rachel's altruistic spirit, even suggesting other authors to fans who'd read each of her books and were eagerly awaiting the next in her series. Some people left with stacks of books in their arms. It should make for a nice fat profit on the books for today. His father would be pleased. Can you believe it? They won't let her leave. Sophie sat down in the chair next to him. Tired, he asked, noticing the dark circles under her eyes. A little, but mostly excited. Miss Doris and my mom are taking Rachel out to dinner at that new pizza place. Sophie's eyes sparkled. I'm pretty sure your grandmother invited herself to join them. Why am I not surprised? Simon smiled. His mother had shared their plans with him earlier and offered to take Grandma Wendy home after dinner. You know what that means? I can cook you dinner at your place. How long before you close up? He shut his laptop and looked at the time on his phone. I should be out of here in two hours or so. Perfect. That gives me just enough time to run to the store and cook you dinner. Simon shoved his laptop into his briefcase and rose, smiling at the look of surprise on Sophie's face. The woman obviously still didn't believe he could cook. Even after he'd made her breakfast on a boat. Something smells amazing, Sophie exclaimed when she entered her apartment not quite two hours later. She put her bag down and walked over to the stove where Simon was busy cooking. You're just in time. I hope you like shrimp scampi with linguine, he said before giving her a quick kiss. It's my favorite. What can I do to help? Simon turned away and sneezed. Pour yourself a glass of wine. There's a bottle of Pinot Grigio chilling in the fridge. Then go relax. He pulled his handkerchief from his pocket. I'm so sorry. Sophie looked around. Your allergies are acting up again. I have a prescription. I took it a little while ago. Should be kicking in any time now. He smiled thinking about the last dinner he'd spent at her place. And this one won't have me falling asleep on your couch. Sophie pet Misty and looked around for Alfred. These two are surprisingly calm. They usually act like they are about to starve to death when I come home. They did when I showed up with the shrimp. I fed them. Hope you don't mind. Simon pointed to the food and water dishes. Not at all. Thank you. Sophie rose and poured them each a glass of wine. How long before dinner? Almost ready. Go sit down, and I'll plate everything up. He breathed a sigh of relief that Sophie had made it back in time. He'd jumped the gun just a little with the shrimp and had worried the dish would be overcooked by the time she got home. He pulled a loaf of French bread from the oven and sliced it while the shrimp finished cooking. A quick toss with the cooked pasta and a sprinkle of fresh parsley and dinner was ready. Here you go. Both cats followed him over to the small dining room table. He watched her take a first cautious bite. This is delicious. Her wide eyes sparkled with pleasure. It's the fresh shrimp. Patterson at the seafood market is an old family friend. He only sells me the best. Simon grinned, pleased she was enjoying the meal he'd prepared. I'm sure that's part of it. But you have some serious skills. Where did you learn to cook like this? 
Her voice grew louder and higher, causing both cats to sit up and pay attention. Don't sound so surprised. I told you I could cook. Brayden and I got an apartment in college and were on a tight budget. We figured out pretty quickly that we could save a lot of money if we stayed home and cooked our own food. We started with the basics, with a little help from our mothers. I enjoyed meal prep, Brayden didn't. He shrugged. And you ended up taking over the cooking duties? He nodded. Eventually, I got bored of the basics. I took a couple of classes, but mostly I learned by finding recipes online and then a lot of trial and error. Pinterest is my best friend these days. He held up his phone. Sophie laughed. You have Pinterest boards? I think you're the first guy I know who uses it. Or at least admits he does. I run a graphics app. Spending time on Pinterest is research. And it's the perfect place to keep track of recipes I want to try and stuff I've made. Fair point. She raised her glass in salute. No matter what you're doing, keep at it, it's working. This is by far the best meal someone has cooked for me. Aside from the chefs at places like Shea Paul's. He winked. No comment. Sophie smiled back at him. In all honesty though, if you ever got tired of the tech stuff, I'm pretty sure Shea Pauls would hire you on the spot. When they'd finished their meal, Simon poured them each another glass of wine and suggested they take it out to the small balcony off the living room. It overlooked the quaint courtyard that hid the bookstore below from Main Street. Can I ask you something? Sophie looked up at him, holding her breath. Of course. Anything. Simon took a sip of the crisp wine, wondering what was on her mind. I was running errands a few days ago. Sophie hesitated, her hands playing with the stem of her wine glass. It was distracting. Simon forced himself to pay attention. This was important to her. And? He prompted softly. I was walking by the coffee shop. She set her glass down and crossed her legs. Her hands rested in her lap, her eyes downcast again. After a short pause, she continued. I saw you and Megan. He nodded. Her eyes returned to his face. Simon was waiting for her question. She was waiting for a reaction from him. She stopped by my parents' house looking for me. We had a cup of coffee. He shrugged. There wasn't much to tell. It was an encounter and a part of his life he'd rather forget about. The two of you looked, intimate. Her cheeks turned the loveliest shade of pink. Simon didn't think it was from the wine since it sat barely touched in front of her. He held back a smile. Mostly. What exactly did you see? And why didn't you come inside? You could have met her and spared yourself all this worry. Could I? She murmured under her breath. The two of you were holding hands. It threw me for a loop. She shrugged, but it was blatantly obvious that this was something that had been bothering her. Yes, you could have, he said, reaching over to grab both of her hands in his. There is nothing going on with me and Megan. She stopped by, we talked. She wanted to get back together. I told her I was seeing someone else. Then I left. Mm. The noise didn't sound like an agreement. I swear there is nothing between us. I don't remember her touching me, and we certainly didn't hold hands. Could she have reached over and squeezed my hand while she was pleading her case? Simon shrugged. Sure. But it didn't mean anything and if it happened. It happened. I saw it. Sophie pulled her hands out of his. The warmth and connection between them instantly disappeared. Then it didn't mean anything. Not to me. And I think I got my point across to Megan. You never talk about her. She looked out over the balcony at a few pigeons picking through the dirt around a small maple tree. There isn't much to say. We met when the company first took off. Dated for a few years, and then last year Megan decided to move in. At the time, it made sense to get engaged. It was that, or break it off. 
Simon shrugged. Did you love her? Sophie's voice was soft and hesitant. I thought I did at the time. He played with the stem of the glass. It was nice not to have to come home to an empty place. And everyone was always raving that we were the perfect couple. Do you feel different now? She probed. I do. To be honest, I knew things weren't great for a while. When she moved out, it surprised me. He took a deep breath and squared his shoulders. It hurt my pride. I lost her to a guy with a bigger bank account and a bigger place in the same building. I won't lie, that stung. I imagine so, she said, still not looking at him. Sophie. He waited for her to turn and face him. I came down to Palmer Island to lick my wounds. That's when I walked into the book nook and met you. She swallowed and nodded. He had her full attention. And when I got to know you and fell in love with you, I realized that what Megan and I had is nothing like this. He motioned his hand back and forth, between them. I liked Megan. I was attracted to her. But what you and I have is so much deeper. I love you, Sophie Davenport. Sophie hiccuped as tears rolled down her face. She wiped them off quickly with the back of her hand. Sorry, must be the wine. I'm a lightweight. She leaned forward and cupped his face in her hands. He felt their warmth on his face. It sent chills up and down his spine. She raised her right hand to brush a strand of hair off his face. He briefly wondered if it was time to get it cut. I love you too, Simon, she said before touching her soft lips to his. It was a sweet kiss. And not nearly enough. He pulled her into his lap and deepened the kiss. He wanted to taste her, drown in her, and never let her go. Chapter 17 I brought some treats, Sophie called out when she walked into the house. Grandma Wendy busily chopped vegetables in the kitchen. Lunch is almost ready, she said, turning around and wiping her hands on the blue checkered apron. I hope you're in the mood for a chef salad with lots of veggies from the garden. The zucchini are so tender right now, and there's still plenty of tomatoes. That sounds amazing. And is that fresh bread I smell? Sophie looked around for the source of the heavenly aroma, her stomach growling. Hello, beautiful. Simon walked into the kitchen carrying a bowl of cherry tomatoes. He set it on the counter and pulled her close to him. I missed you, he mumbled before kissing her until her toes curled. Not in the kitchen, you too, Grandma Wendy teased, whipping her towel at Simon. People are eating here. Sorry, Simon said, grinning and not looking the least bit abashed. Here are the tomatoes you asked for. Rinse them and then peel the eggs. Grandma Wendy turned to look at Sophie. Would you be a dear and cut the bread? She pointed at a corner of the counter that held a wooden board and something covered with a clean kitchen towel. Of course. A beautiful loaf of rustic bread waited for her under the towel. It was cool enough to touch, but still warm from the oven. It crackled when she cut into it, making her stomach growl more loudly than before. We have to get this woman fed, Simon announced, speeding up his preparations. Sophie felt the warmth creep into her cheeks. She tugged on the collar of her blouse that suddenly felt too tight. Don't pay any attention to him, Grandma Wendy said. In less than ten minutes, lunch was ready. It turned out even more delicious than expected. This is the best chef salad I've ever had, Sophie declared. It's going to be hard to make room for the brownies Miss Doris dropped off. She rose and grabbed the small Tupperware container the friendly island baker and busybody had dropped off at the bookstore earlier. What did you do to deserve that high honor? Simon asked. Nothing special. Just placed a large order of the cookbook Miss Doris is featured in and displayed it all over the store. They've been selling like hot cakes, by the way. I think every woman on the island wants a copy to glean some of her baking secrets. Ha. Huh. I've watched her bake for four decades. One little recipe won't turn anyone into a baker of Doris's caliber. Grandma Wendy took their plates and put them in the sink. Coffee? 
Simon and Sophie nodded. Walk out to the garden with me while we wait on it? Simon asked, his eyes firmly locked on hers. He held his hand out, and she nodded and took it. His fingers were warm and strong as they wrapped around hers. He pulled her up and led her out into the cottage garden, just off the back porch. Now, let's try this again. He pulled her back against him and kissed her breathless. When they finally came back up for air, he gently tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. I needed that. His voice was rough. Tough day? Sophie asked. More like a tough week. Between work and stuff around here. He shrugged his shoulders. I heard about your grandmother. Sophie walked down toward the chicken coop and sat down on the low wall, separating this lot from the neighbors. His garden looked almost as good as Grandma Wendy's. What did you hear, he hedged. That she wandered off and ended up at a neighbor's house. Simon's eyes grew wide, and he leaned away from her. Don't worry. Miss Dora swore me to secrecy. No one else knows. She only told me because she thought you could use a little extra support right now. This can't be easy. Oh, think, Simon's smile didn't reach his eyes, but his posture was more relaxed. I promised Grandma no one would find out. I should have figured Miss Doris would hear about it. At least she's not big on gossiping. Sophie took his hand and squeezed it. What happened? I left to, never mind. I was gone for a couple of hours, and when I came back, she was nowhere to be found. I didn't know what to do. I walking up and down the road, hoping to find her, calling for her. Simon stared off in the distance, the memory of the incident obviously painful. And then you found her. Not quite. I was about to call my father and the police. Thankfully, Billy Madison called before I did. He found her sitting on his back porch. Simon took a deep breath and looked at her. I have no idea where she thought she was or what she was doing. When I got there, she snapped right out of it. And the worst part is that she knows her mind wanders. I feel so helpless. Sophie scooted closer and put her arm around his shoulders. Let me guess, you haven't left her side or slept much since. It wasn't really a question. The shadows on his face told the story. Simon shook his head. He must be exhausted. I'm coming over as soon as the store closes tonight. I'm going to bring dinner from Mary's and then you are going to sleep. I'll stay with Miss Wendy until she's ready for bed. I'll sleep on the couch. You can't. I can and I will. You need to get some sleep. I'm sure you've pulled enough all-nighters over the years to know that you've hit a point where you're no longer thinking straight. You're at that point now. Let me help you. Simon nodded. Okay. Thank you. And tomorrow, we're going to talk about getting you some help on a permanent basis. I've been thinking about that, I'm not sure where to start though. I don't want one of those mobile nursing services, and I am going to do whatever it takes to make sure she can stay here at home as long as possible. Miss Doris gave me a name and a number. Therese. She's a nurse who took care of someone next door to her. I don't think this, Therese person, is available, but Miss Doris thinks she might know someone who can help. Sophie rummaged through the pocket of her skirt and pulled out a small piece of paper with a name and number scrawled on it. Do you have a few minutes to keep an eye on my grandmother? Simon asked. Leaving her to make coffee by herself may not have been the best idea. Of course. I'll go check on her now. Sophie stood. Simon pulled his phone from his pocket. I'll call Therese and see what she has to say. Sophie smiled at him encouragingly and walked back into the kitchen. Grandma Wendy turned and smiled at her. Just in time. Coffee is ready. She'd washed their lunch dishes and had set small plates and coffee cups out. She poured them each a cup of coffee. You make the best coffee, Sophie complimented. It's the freshly ground beans, Grandma Wendy explained. She ground them in a little old-fashioned manual, coffee grinder. It's how we've always done it. 
My daddy wouldn't drink any of the pre-ground stuff when it first became available, and my husband got spoiled when we were courting. Have you tried an electric grinder? Sophie asked. Grandma Wendy nodded. They are too noisy. And it doesn't take but a couple of minutes with this. Where is Simon? He's making a phone call. I'm sure he'll be right in. Why don't we get started? I can't wait to try these brownies. Simon walked in a few minutes later. Any luck? Sophie asked. He nodded and took his seat. Grandma, how would you feel about having someone come in for a few hours here and there to help out with stuff? You mean a babysitter for when you have to work or you want to take this pretty lady out? Grandma Wendy smiled. Something like that. Simon cast down his eyes. I think it's a wonderful idea. I can't expect you to take care of me all the time. You're young, with a busy career. She patted his hand encouragingly. I'm glad you're taking this so well, Simon said. Sophie was surprised herself. She'd known Grandma Wendy long enough to know what a proud woman she was. But she was also a pragmatist. I know my mind isn't what it used to be. I'm scared to death I'll forget to turn off the stove or go somewhere and not find my way back home. Having you here, both of you, has been a big comfort, but I can't expect you young people to completely put your life on hold for me. We don't mind, Sophie said. You say that now, dear. Grandma Wendy smiled. I hope we can figure this out and I'll have a few more years with a clear mind, but until we do, I'll feel better with someone around. I'm not sure how I'll pay for that though. Don't worry about that. I called a friend of Miss Doris's, who's a nurse. She recommended a young woman who's looking for work. She spent the past five years going to nursing school and taking care of her elderly father. You might know the family. Kristen Towers is the nurse's name. I know James Towers. I think he passed away a few months ago. Grandma Wendy rose and poured herself and Sophie a second cup of coffee. That must be her. I left a message. If she's available, would you want to meet her? Simon held his breath. That's the last of them, Mr. Johnson. The installation tech put a screwdriver in the tool belt. Do you want me to show you how the app works? I think I'm good. I've been playing around with it. Pretty intuitive. The interface was brilliant and the setup process had been a snap. Simon admired good app design. It's very user-friendly. It'll also alert you if any of the sensors go bad. If that happens, give us a call, and we'll have someone out here to fix it. Simon shook the man's hand and walked him to the front door. Kristen. He waved at the young nurse getting out of her car. Who did you bribe to get them out here so quickly, she joked when she saw the security company van. I had to wait for weeks to get them out to the house. Simon put his hand on his chest. I would never. We got lucky I guess. Kristen had suggested the alarm system a few days ago after he'd found his grandmother outside in her nightgown before daybreak. It had freaked him out that he didn't wake up. What if she'd gone out the front door instead of the back? Kristen had calmed him down and then suggested installing alarms on all doors. To be safe, he'd had them installed on all the windows as well. Now, his phone would alert him whenever a window or door opened. And you got cameras on the doors. Nice. Kristen looked impressed. That means he'll see us coming and going all the time. Grandma Wendy stepped up onto the front porch. Go put your things inside and let's go. I don't want to be late for my water aerobics. Kristen laughed. You've got it, Miss Wendy. Simon walked into the kitchen, following the nurse. Thanks again for the alarm system suggestion. And for getting my grandmother out. All this exercise and interaction is doing her a world of good. Kristen nodded. It makes a big difference and stimulates the mind. I'm glad she's enjoying it. She is. I thought she was happy before, but this. It's a whole different level. I'm glad. 
I hear she's trying to talk her friend Miss Doris into joining the aquatic center. Kristen grabbed her car keys and a small purse. I'll let you know how that goes. She's supposed to meet us for a trial session today. His grandmother waited, more or less patiently, by Kristen's car. Have fun. I'll see you tonight. He rushed into the shower to get ready for his date with Sophie. Simon's hair was still damp when he picked her up at her apartment. You clean up nice, Sophie said, before pulling him close for a kiss. And you look stunning. She took his breath away in her simple linen summer dress and cotton cardigan. Her hair was pulled up into a messy bun, sunglasses stuck in her hair. We'd better get going, if we want to make it to the church on time. Let's go, Ben. They signed in at the church and got their maps and passes to start the annual plantation tour of Palmer Island and the surrounding areas. All in all, they'd tour six different houses, all of them former plantations. I love these old houses, but the thought of slaves walking and working the same grounds feels wrong. Sophie's eyebrows were drawn together. Like we're profiting from their exploitation. You have a point, but what would be the better option? To forget our history? Shut these houses off or tear them down? I think that's more dangerous. I say we enjoy the good and learn from the bad. That's a wonderful way to put it, young man, an elderly woman said. My great-grandmother was born on a plantation and worked all her life in the big house. I take this tour every year to honor her memory. What a beautiful tradition. Sophie smiled brightly at the woman. Do you know much about your great-grandmother? Sure do. It took some digging and it wasn't always easy, but I have most of her life story put together. Even wrote a book about her. The woman dug around her purse and pulled out a small paperback book. The cover showed an elderly woman in a long dress and white apron standing in front of an old oak tree. Is this her? Sophie asked. The woman nodded. Sophie opened the book, thumbing through it. I'm Simon Johnson, and this is my girlfriend, Sophie Davenport. He shook the woman's hand. Rosa Milton. It's nice to meet you both. I'm sorry. Where are my manners? Sophie held out her hand as well. I own the book nook on Palmer Island. I'm surprised I haven't seen this. Do you mind if I take a picture of the back? I want to get some copies ordered for the store. I have a whole box of them in my garage at home. I'll bring you as many as you'd like. Spent more than a small penny getting it in print. I'd be glad to help you sell them, Sophie said. And if you're up for it, we could set up a little meet and greet one day. Maybe have you read a few pages from the book and talk about your great-grandmother? That would be wonderful. The woman beamed while the two of them exchanged phone numbers and email addresses. We'd better get going if we want to make it to the first house in time, Simon prompted gently. Keep it, Rosa said when Sophie tried to return the book. I'd love for you to read it and tell me what you think. They crossed paths with Rosa and her friends a few times throughout the tour. Each of the plantation houses were on the historical registry and opened their doors for this one charity event. Some offered refreshments, many had artifacts and pictures on display. It was more interesting than Simon had expected when he'd signed them up. I'm exhausted, Sophie said and sat down on the garden bench at the next to last place. She sipped a glass of lemonade. Simon took the seat next to her. It's been fun, but I'm glad we only have one more house to go. Between the tours of the large homes and walking the sprawling gardens, the excursion had taken it out of him too. He made a mental note to go for a run a few times a week. That is you, a voice rang from the brick patio fifty yards away. A woman in a bright yellow dress and a white straw hat waved in their direction. Sophie, over here. Sophie groaned and rose. That's my mother and my aunt. I should have guessed that they'd be here. Cheer up, Simon said, offering his arm. I'm looking forward to finally meeting your family. Be careful what you wish for. She took his arm and they walked back to the patio. Mother, Aunt and this is Simon. 
So this is the mysterious Simon, Sophie's mother said, looking him up and down. I'm surprised it's taken this long for my daughter to introduce us. Oh stop it, Pam. Sophie's aunt held out her hand with a smile. I'm Anne. It's good to meet you. My sister tells me you're in tech? My partner and I run a graphic design app. It wasn't how Simon liked to start a conversation. What is it called? And asked, taking her phone out of her purse. Picture pig. Simon shrugged. It was the name they had chosen their sophomore year in college when it was time to launch the app. Once it started to take off, there was no going back. Oh, I love Picture Pig. I use it every single day. I own an interior design biz, and your app is such a big help when it comes to social media. You make my life so much easier. And linked her arm in his and started walking to the other end of the patio, showing him some of the images she'd created recently. Your aunt likes him, Sophie's mother, said to her daughter. How big is this app thing of his? Why does that matter? He's doing okay for himself. Simon glanced back and saw Sophie taking a step back. Her eyes were scanning the grounds in front of them. That's important, honey. It's all I ever wanted for you. Someone to support you and provide for you. Simon went to rescue his girl before she bolted into the gardens and beyond. Chapter 18 My aunt can't stop talking about you, Sophie said when he picked her up at the bookstore two nights later. It was very sweet of you to showcase her on your site. We do user spotlights all the time. It's good for business. Simon grinned. He opened the car door for her. Where are you taking me tonight? Sophie asked, straightening her skirt. How would you feel about pizza? Brayden has been raving about this authentic Italian place, and I thought it could be fun to try it out. I thought Brayden and Summer only ate whole, clean foods. You know, super healthy stuff. Sophie scrunched up her nose. They do. I think that's why he remembers it so fondly. Luigi's Pizzeria was a nice little place with a brick oven. The smell when they entered was amazing. Simon's stomach growled the moment the aroma wafted up to his nostrils. Sorry. I didn't have time for lunch. Back-to-back -back meetings. I'm surprised your grandmother didn't interrupt to bring you a plate. Simon laughed. It wouldn't be the first time. But no, she and Kristen went to the farmer's market and had lunch there. Welcome to Luigi's Pizzeria. My name is Gabriella. What can I get you to drink? Could we get a bottle of table wine and some water? Simon looked at Sophie for approval. She nodded. And whatever appetizer you can get out the fastest. His stomach growled again, louder than before, and heat crept up his neck. I'll get you an antipasti plate and I'll bring some bread sticks out right away. Gabriella walked off quickly with a smile on her face. That bad? Simon asked. Sophie shrugged. I've seen worse. Good call on the appetizer, though. I'm pretty hungry myself. No time for lunch? Simon reached across the table and took her hand in his. You work too much. Look who's talking. His fingers caressed the back of her slender hand. Between Kristen's help and my team at work, I'm barely doing anything. I'm semi-retired. Sophie laughed. I wouldn't call putting in over 40 hours a week semi-retired. Well, it's a lot less than what I used to do. I've had some good reasons to scale back, though. He could feel his throat tightening. I know what you mean. I've been toying with the idea of asking your mom if she'd like to come work part-time. Sophie looked up at him and he lost himself in her eyes for a moment. She's been helping out so much, I need to start paying her. The store is doing that well, he asked. I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden, people are flocking to it. Residents who'd never realized it was right here on the island. Tourists who made it a point to stop by. I don't know what I did, but business has been good. I'm glad. So, if I convince my mother to help out at the store, 
you'll have more time to spend with me? He turned on his most convincing smile. The one that used to let him get away with just about anything. If you convince her to come work for me, for a reasonable wage. That's not going to happen. The last time mom took an actual job, it cost dad more in taxes than she made. He made her promise not to take a paid position unless she makes at least 80000 a year. And I'm pretty sure that's a little out of your price range. Sophie pulled her hand back. I'm not going to take advantage of Jane. Trust me, you're not. She enjoys the store. She'll never admit this in public, but she's having more fun there than volunteering at the library. The head librarian is an old bat. I'm going to have to come up with some other way to compensate her, then. I've been trying to get her to take a few books. I'll talk to her. I'm sure she's worried you need to sell them. But with business booming, she won't feel like she's taking advantage of you. Advantage? The woman has been such a blessing. She runs that book club like it's nobody's business. It used to take Maddie and me hours to set it up, print the flyers, call everyone, come up with something new to read and discuss. And let's not even talk about the cleanup. Your mom handles it all in half the time and the store is in perfect order before the last person leaves the meeting. She's a miracle worker. My mother has a knack for organizing and motivating people. Simon grinned, thinking back on all the times she'd convince him to do something he didn't want to do. The only person better at it than Jane Johnson was Miss Doris. Here you go. Drinks and appetizers. Are you ready to order your main meal, or do you two need a minute? Gabriella asked. She placed a large platter of charcuterie, olives, pepperoni, and cheese in front of them along with a basket of breadsticks. I haven't had a chance to look at the rest of the menu, Sophie picked the menu back up and quickly turned the pages. Take your time. I'll check back with you in a few minutes. Gabriella left. What looks good? Simon opened his own menu to the pizza page. This is a lot of food already. Sophie pointed to the large platter between them. How about we split a pizza? The pizza capricciosa sounds delicious. Ham, mushrooms, artichokes. Pizza capricciosa it is. Simon picked one of the black olives up and popped it into his mouth. When Gabriella returned, he placed the order. They spent the next five minutes enjoying the antipasti in silence. The food took the edge of his hunger. The smell of the baking pizza and melted cheese was no longer torturing him. Simon leaned back in his chair and took a sip of the table wine. It was fresh with just a hint of sweetness. It went well with the piece of prosciutto he snagged off the platter. Can I ask you something? Of course. Sophie put the roasted bell pepper piece down and looked up at him. Are you happy in your little apartment? I mean, is that the kind of place you want to live in for the rest of your life? That sounds like a loaded question. She popped the red pepper, along with a piece of salami, into her mouth. Simon waited patiently. Humor me. What's your ideal living space? I've thought of this quite a bit, actually. Sophie picked up her own wine glass and swirled the ruby-red liquid around. The place above the store is convenient, and there's plenty of space for me and the cats. But? I've always dreamed of owning a little house. Something with a large porch and a garden. A place for the cats to run around or lie in the sunshine. She took a sip of the wine and nodded appreciatively. Something a little bit like your grandmother's place. Not a large house on a golf course with access to a country club? He was teasing her on purpose. You know the answer to that one. I spent the first twenty years of my life in a place like that. I'm done with mansions. She grinned. So, if this thing between us works out. Simon cleared his throat. You wouldn't be opposed to moving into my grandmother's house for a while? Simon Johnson, are you asking me to move in with you? Sophie looked shocked and surprised. No, not like that. I would never expect you to. Here's your pizza, you too. Enjoy. 
Gabriella's timing was perfect. It gave Simon the moment he needed to compose himself. I didn't mean to suggest that you should move in with me. I was just, he shook his head. I like you. More than that. Enough to start thinking about the future. I guess I was wondering if you had done the same and what that might look like. Sophie blushed and took a slice of pizza. Her eyes stayed trained on her plate. I have thought about it, she said softly. Is this the mail from today? Sophie asked, looking at a stack of papers and bills. I grabbed it on my way in. Hope you don't mind. Jane was busy cleaning off the coffee table in preparation for tonight's book club meeting. Of course not, thank you. Sophie quickly sorted through the stack, tossing flyers and opening bills, neatly stacking them by her computer. She paused when she got to an envelope addressed to her. It was handwritten. Real handwriting, not one of those fonts on envelopes that try to get you to sign up for a timeshare or join a professional organization you don't need. Those wouldn't fool her for a second. This was the real deal. Sophie grabbed her grandmother's antique silver letter opener and slid through the envelope. It was a nice heavy paper. She pulled out a pretty card with the picture of a bouquet of sunflowers on it. The card was from Rachel McClure, the historical fiction author who had come down for a book signing. Dear Sophie, I wanted to take a moment to thank you for the wonderful event at your store. It was such a treat. Being an independent author can be a bit isolating at times and without the help of a publishing house to arrange for travel and accommodations, trips like these are rare. Without your generosity, I never would have discovered your beautiful island. What a magical place you live in. I hope to visit again soon. Lou Duracton. Rachel. Sophie smiled at the Gaelic closing of the letter. She'd have to search the expression to figure out its exact meaning. It was kind of the author to write, but it was Sophie who should be thanking her. The event had been a huge success and had resulted in several new loyal customers. That's a beautiful card, Maddie said, glancing over Sophie's shoulder. Who is it from? Rachel McClure. How sweet. That was such a fun day. We should do it again. Maddie dropped a stack of books onto the counter. I was thinking the same thing. It's brought in enough business that it might be worth offering someone a small travel stipend if they want to come and read at the store. She'd have to run the idea by Mr. Johnson, but it had potential. And she was sure Simon would be more than happy to help her find a few more authors to bring in. He'd found Miss McClure, after all. Sophie read through the card again. There was a postscript she'd skipped earlier. P.S. Give my best to Miss Doris. I look forward to another stay with her soon. On my own dime, of course. It'll be worth it for the view and those cookies. Do you have any modern beach romances? Something with a little steam and excitement? A woman in a bright coral coverall dress with white flowers painted all over the fabric had walked up to the main counter while Sophie had been reading. Of course. Let me show you. Twenty minutes later, Sophie rang up a small stack of paperbacks, all of them featuring handsome men with open shirts on the cover. The woman was set for spending the rest of her vacation reading on the beach. Sophie smiled. It brought her so much happiness, picturing her customers enjoying the books she recommended. Sadly though, she couldn't remember the last time she'd taken the time to relax on the beach with a good book. That would have to change. Having Simon in her life gave her a whole new perspective on what was important. Finding a balance between work and play was one of those things. And something she still struggled with. The door to the shop opened again, causing the small bell above it to ring. Sophie looked up and her heart stopped. Megan, Simon's former fiancé, walked towards her. I'm looking for some current interior design magazines. You wouldn't happen to have anything like that around here? she asked. Her eyebrows were raised as she scanned the store. We have a few. I'll show you. Are you redecorating your home? Sophie's tone was perfectly friendly and professional. 
Megan laughed a fake, pearly kind of laughter. Oh, definitely. I found the house for my fiancé and I. I toured it earlier today. The location is perfect. Right on the beach. Maybe you know the place? She pulled a sales flyer out of her purse. Sophie recognized the house. It wasn't far from Miss Doris's place. It was listed at two and a half million dollars. It's a beautiful home. It has potential. The interior is not quite up to snuff, though. You should see the kitchen and living rooms. Megan shook her head. It'll take me months to fix the place up. It'll be worth it in the end though, I'm sure. She rummaged through the meager magazine selection and picked out two different issues. I hope you'll get the house, Sophie said when she rang her up. The large diamond on Megan's hand sparkled in the overhead light when the young woman pulled her black American Express credit card from her wallet. Thank you. I don't think it will be a problem. He knows I've always wanted an oceanfront villa with a nice pool. Sophie shook her head and watched Megan leave the store. She briefly wondered if Simon knew she was still in town. Maybe that's what their meetup had been about. But why wouldn't he tell her that she and her fiancé were moving to the island? The store got busy with a new rush of tourists looking for that perfect vacation read, and Sophie forgot all about the strange encounter. Chapter 19 Do you mind if I check the book club group from your laptop? I left mine upstairs. Sophie looked across the room at Maddie, who was busy straightening up the young adult section, putting books back into their proper place and dusting the top of the shelves. Not at all, go ahead. It's unlocked, Maddie called over her shoulder. Simon would have a stroke when he found out. Sophie made a mental note to have a talk with her friend about cybersecurity, especially in a somewhat public place like the bookstore. It took less than a minute on the fast Chromebook to pull up the book club's Facebook group. I need to get one of these, she murmured to herself as she scrolled through the latest posts and comments. Their participants had been good about checking in throughout the week, sharing their thoughts on the latest selection. Sophie replied to a few of the posts, answered some questions, and uploaded the discussion prompts for Friday's meeting. She was about to close the laptop when her phone rang. Mom, I don't have time to talk right now. This will only take a minute. I ran into Simon's so-called ex today. The one from the magazine. Her mother's tone was serious. What do you mean, so-called ex? Sophie sat up. When Megan had shown up at her store, Sophie assumed it was an act of revenge. She doesn't seem to think they are broken up. She told me about the house on the ocean they are getting ready to buy. I don't think Simon is the man you think he is. The disdain in her mother's voice was palpable. That's ridiculous. I'm sure you have her confused with someone else. The words didn't convince her or her mother. It was her. I recognize her from the picture. And her name is Megan. That can't be a coincidence. I'm telling you, Simon is playing you for a fool. I've always had a bad feeling about this guy. Mom, stop. I don't have time to talk about this right now. Don't say I didn't warn you. Sophie hung up the phone and set it down next to the open laptop. An advertisement for the store caught her attention. She checked it closer and finally clicked on the image of one of the back rooms, with a cozy set of chairs and a small round table set in front of a large oak bookcase. It was a beautiful shot of the store and not one she'd taken. You're not running Facebook ads, are you? She called out to Maddie. What? Her friend came over, looking over Sophie's shoulder at the screen. That's a picture of the back room. What kind of smarmy person would use a picture of someone else's place in their marketing? The thought hadn't even occurred to Sophie. She hesitated for just a moment and then clicked on the ad. It took her to the brand new website Simon had set up for the store. He'd been pushing her to start selling online as well, but so far, she'd been hesitant to go there. The website itself seemed to be helping though. Lots of new customers told her they'd found her on the web. This doesn't make any sense. Who is running these ads? 
The moment the words left her mouth, Sophie realized that there was only one person who could possibly have set it up. Simon, Maddie said, her voice void of any emotion or judgment. Sophie, on the other hand, felt her temper rise. It didn't happen very often, but when it did, those around her better watch out. I can't believe he would do something like that. Behind my back. I thought we were past that kind of stuff. Seeing Megan in the store earlier had brought back memories of seeing the two of them at the coffee shop. Sure, he'd explained that away, but it didn't erase the fact that he'd never mentioned his engagement. And now he was running ads? What else is he doing that I don't know about? Her eyes fell on the sunflower card she'd hung up behind the counter. She pulled it off the wall and reread it. Without your generosity, I never would have discovered your beautiful island. Look at this, Dot. She held the card out to Maddie. That's very sweet of Miss McClure to write. Yes, but look at this line. Sophie pointed to the one in question. Doesn't that sound weird? What's so generous about having someone come to the store for a book signing? It helped us out as much as it did her. Miss Doris made coffee cake and you bought all of us lunch, Maddie offered. Sophie shook her head. That still didn't explain it. What if Simon paid for her to come down? The author had stayed with Miss Doris. It would be easy enough to find out if Simon picked up the bill for the visit. Sophie forced a smile on her face when a group of elderly women that she recognized from church walked into the store. By the time she'd helped them find their way around the large print section and make their selections, it was time to close the store. Hey beautiful, ready for dinner? Simon walked into the store, his familiar cologne permeating the room. He was dressed in khakis and a striking blue shirt that somehow brought out his green eyes. As angry as she was at him, he still took her breath away. Simon looked at his phone. We'd better get going. Grandma Wendy is in the car and my mom is making salmon and some sort of vegetable risotto. She called me and made me promise we wouldn't be late. I forgot all about that, Sophie mumbled. What? Simon looked up, smiling like nothing had happened. I'm almost ready. Give me two seconds. Sophie closed out the cash register and handed the day's income and receipts to Maddie. Are you sure you're okay doing this? Of course. Go have dinner and relax. Maddie's look was stern and Sophie got the message. This wasn't the time or the place to bring up the ads or the book signing. I will. I promise. Sophie followed Simon out to his car. They were both quiet on the short drive to the house he grew up in, but Grandma Wendy happily chatted about her chickens and the trouble they'd been getting into throughout the garden. Perfect timing. Jane beamed when she walked in behind Simon. The food will be ready in less than ten minutes. Clive, will you pour everyone a glass of wine? This is delicious. Sophie took another bite of flaky fish, baked in puff pastry with some sort of cream sauce. Thank you. I was a little nervous about it. It's my first time trying this recipe. I saw it on Facebook and it looked delicious. You're not the only one spending time on Facebook, Sophie mumbled under her breath, her temper flaring up again. What about it? Simon asked, looking concerned. I'm sorry, this isn't the time or the place. Sophie took a calming breath and picked up her glass. The water was cool and soothing on her throat. Simon leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. If there's something that's bothering you, I want to hear about it. Sophie glanced around the table. All eyes were on her. Go ahead, honey. You'll feel better once you get what's bothering off your chest, Jane encouraged. Her smile was open and understanding, and it gave Sophie the courage she needed. She looked right at Simon. I know you've been running Facebook ads for the store behind my back, and I don't like it. That's what's gotten your feathers ruffled? It's no big deal. It's barely a blip in our ad budget. He shrugged his shoulders. And it's brought new people into the store. You did what? Clive Johnson stared at his son. 
I set up a couple of ads targeting locals and people interested in vacationing on Palmer Island. It's nothing major, a couple hundred bucks a month tops. And they are working like gangbusters. People love the store. They just didn't know about it before. Sophie sat up straighter and looked right at him. That doesn't make it right. We talked about social media advertising, and I told you I wasn't ready to spend any money on that. And you didn't. I did. Simon. His father waited for his son to look at him. Are you telling me that you went behind Miss Davenport's back and ran advertising without her knowledge and consent? And how did you pay for this? I just threw a handful of ads up in our main account. It's no big deal. Like I said, barely a blip in the budget. Simon held up his hands. And how are you going to expect me to account for this in your books? We'll have to have you generate invoices and then figure out how to clear them. Simon's father rose and headed toward his office, motioning for the two of them to follow. Clearing the invoices won't be a problem, Sophie said firmly. I fully intend to pay every penny back. Simon took her hand. I'm sorry. I didn't think it would be a big deal. I did a few tests to show you what local marketing could do to revive the shop. And it's working. He looked down at her with those big eyes that still gave her butterflies, even when she was raging mad at him and trying hard to keep her temper under control. Let's take a look at the books and figure this out, Clive Johnson said, his voice all business. Simon, how much have you spent to date? When Simon pulled out his phone, looked up the number, and responded with $4,320.03, Sophie swallowed hard. That was more than her and Maddie's salaries combined. She pulled her hand from his and walked around the spacious home office. A flyer laying on top of a file market Robert's sale. It was the house Megan had shown her. What was Mr. Johnson doing with this? Unless, her mother had been right. Everything clicked into place at that moment. Simon wasn't just going behind her back with this. He was the person purchasing the oceanfront villa. He was Megan's fiancé. How could she have been so blind? And you would be willing to have Miss Davenport pay these invoices over time? I'm assuming you are not spending this much each month. I'm not and like I said, it was a test, an experiment. There's no need to pay me back. Simon turned to look at her. Sophie crossed her arms and took the seat closest to her accountant. How much can I afford to pay him? Actually. Clive's eyebrows rose, his eyes dancing across the screen. You could pay it in full right now and still have plenty left to make payroll. This is some impressive growth over the past three months. He turned the screen to show her the balance sheet. Thanks to Simon, she'd experienced some of the most profitable months of her career. Yet, she'd never felt so betrayed or hurt. He'd gone behind her back. If this was all just an experiment, why not tell me about it once you could tell it was working? Sophie asked, curious what lie he'd come up with next. Because I'm a coward and I was afraid of your reaction, Simon said, taking the seat beside her. And you were so happy and proud that the store was finally in the black. I didn't want to ruin that. But now that you know, we can up the budget and really get things cooking. I don't think so, Sophie said softly. She turned to Simon's father. Would you put together an invoice and tell me who to make the check out to? I'm going to go say goodbye to Jane and head home. I'll drive you back. Simon's voice was tired. Sophie had forgotten he'd picked her up at work. Remembering the last time she'd insisted on making her own way home, she nodded. Both of them were quiet during the drive home. Simon tried to speak up at one point. Don't, was all she said. He pulled into one of the parking spots behind the store. Sophie unbuckled her seatbelt and grabbed her purse. We need to talk about this, sophomore. There isn't much to talk about, Simon. You've lied to me. Everything I thought we had was built on lie upon lie. I don't think we should see each other again. She looked at him, grieving for everything that could have been. Goodbye.
Simon didn't remember how he had made it back to his parents' house or from their back home with Grandma Wendy. He felt numb, lost, and not sure what to do. That was a new feeling and one he didn't like. He was a man of action. The guy who made the hard decisions. Yet there he was, paralyzed by a huge ball of pain spinning in his stomach. He walked out onto the back porch to watch the chickens in their run. On these fall evenings, they didn't go into roost until late. You've been quiet since you took Sophie home, his grandmother said, when she came outside, wrapped in her favorite cardigan. She took a seat in the rocking chair. I don't feel like talking about it, Grandma. That's fine. I'll be here when you're ready. This is a good place to come to let your heart and mind calm after a busy day. She rocked gently and the two of them sat, watching the light fade. It's about time to put up the girls, she said a little while later. Simon watched his grandmother walk to the chicken coop. The last few hens made their way inside before she locked up the door. See you in the morning, she called to the chickens before making her way back across the yard. I think I'm calling it a night. Lock the doors when you come inside. He nodded. It was a long time before he made it back. He poured himself a bowl of cereal and sat down on the couch, staring at the blank TV screen without seeing anything. That's how Kristen found him when she walked in the next morning. Have you been sitting here all night? What happened? The urgency in her voice knocked him out of his stupor. I'm fine. I couldn't sleep. Girl trouble, Grandma Wendy explained. She had donned her housecoat and her hair pulled pack. Coffee? Please. Simon ran his fingers through his hair. I think you need sleep more than you need coffee, Kristen said. He's not a napper. Grandma Wendy bustled around the kitchen, starting the coffee, and getting out a bowl. If someone goes and gets eggs, I'll make us pancakes. Kristen pulled a large bowl from one of the kitchen cabinets. I'll go let out the girls, Simon offered. The fresh air and sunshine did a lot to revive him. By the time he'd finished his coffee and a large stack of blueberry pancakes, he felt human again. Kristen is taking me to a lecture at the library this morning. It's on growing medicinal herbs in a kitchen garden. Would you like to join us? I think I'll head to the beach and go for a swim instead. That always helped clear his head and calm his body. With a little luck, the workout would wear him out enough to get some sleep. Simon changed into his swim trunks, pulled his favorite Palmer Island t-shirt on, and left. He pulled into the driveway at his parents' house. Thankfully, the house was empty when he walked in. He put down his keys and phone before scribbling a note for his mom. When his toes hit the sand, he took off running, diving headfirst into the water when it reached his waist. The Atlantic was balmy warm this late in the season. He swam out past the breakers and then turned to stay parallel to the shore. By the time he made it well past Miss Doris's house, his shoulders ached from fighting the current that pulled him south. He walked out of the surf and stood in the sand, letting the salt water run off him before starting the long way back to his childhood house. Simon. Miss Doris waved at him from the back deck, motioning for him to come up. He thought about pretending he didn't hear her. He wasn't in the mood to talk to anybody, and especially not the unofficial matchmaker of Palmer Island. I know you can hear me. I need to talk to you. Come on up. Miss Doris called across the beach. Simon waved and jogged through the sand and up the stairs that took him over the dunes. Take a seat. I'll grab us some lemonade. Miss Doris pointed to the deck chairs and headed inside. Simon fell into the closest one. The swim had done him good. He felt calmer. Thank you. He accepted a tall glass filled with ice and what he was sure was homemade lemonade. You look like you could use it. I hear things aren't so good with you and Sophie. Miss Doris settled herself in the chair opposite of his and put her own glass on the table between them. What? How? I ran into Wendy at the library. She picked up her glass and sipped, quietly looking out toward the ocean. We had an argument. 
I'm sure we'll work things out. At least he hoped they would. I'm sure you will. Of course, having Megan running all over the island showing off her ring and telling everyone who will listen that the two of you are getting married and buying the Thornton place isn't helping. What? Megan is back in Omaha. Megan is staying in the beach cottage. Miss Doris pointed to the small guest house at the back of her property. Would you excuse me for a minute? Simon asked, putting down the empty glass of lemonade. Not at all. I'll be inside. If I don't see you before you leave, give your grandmother my love. He nodded and rose. With each step toward the cottage, his blood pressure rose. By the time he knocked on the door, he heard the blood rushing in his ears. He took a calming breath before Megan opened the door. Hi, you. I knew you couldn't stay away. Come on in. Megan walked inside, leaving the front door wide open. Simon stepped inside the door. The guest house was small but well furnished. Lots of light flowed into the studio living area, through the large windows looking out onto the beach and Miss Doris's backyard. I think you have the wrong impression. I thought I made myself clear the other day in the coffee shop. Simon stood in the entrance, his arms crossed over his bare chest. You were hurt. I get it. That takes time. She opened the fridge and took a bottle of sparkling water out, imported from Europe of course. She held one out to him. Simon shook his head. You're not hearing me. I don't need time. I need you to leave. You don't mean that, honey bear. We belong together. And guess what? I found us the perfect house. I toured it this morning. She picked up a small stack of papers from the kitchen counter. Simon glanced at them. He knew the place. One of his father's clients was in the process of making an offer. Isn't it darling? The kitchen won't work, and I'm not a huge fan of those bathroom fixtures, but it has good bones. We can work with this. Simon glanced at the asking price of the newly remodeled beachfront home. It was far outside of anything he'd ever wanted to spend on a house. That's not really my kind of place, he said. Of course it is. Think about the dinner parties we could have. And beach parties. It would do wonders for the business. He'd heard the same words out of her mouth when she'd insisted on redecorating his condo. She'd turned his comfortable living space into a display piece and planned to do the same again. Simon had never been so thankful to be over her. Let me call the realtor. I'm sure he can. I'm in love with someone else and I'm going to ask her to marry me. He waited for her to look up. And I'm certainly not buying the Thornton's house. Besides, I'm pretty sure one of my father's clients is buying it. But I saw your dad when I was touring the place. I thought he was buying it for us. As a wedding present. I assure you, he wasn't. Megan, listen to me. I am not going to marry you. Her jaw dropped. She stood there, staring at him, not saying a word. Megan, you need help. And you need to leave this place. He turned and walked away. Chapter 20 Simon, would you mind taking me over to Doris's house? I promised her a few dozen eggs. She's making pound cake for the church dinner. Grandma Wendy walked into the kitchen, adding a few more eggs to a basket that was about to overflow. Sure. Anything to make sure some of these eggs got used up. As much as he liked omelets and quiches, he was ready to eat something that didn't involve them. A steak and baked potato would be nice. Or a burger from Mary's. Simon closed his laptop and grabbed his keys. Help me pack these into cartons. Grandma Wendy stepped into the pantry and came out with a small stack of them. It didn't take long to get the eggs packed up, and they were on their way. I miss Sophie. When are you two going to make up, his grandmother asked. Simon shrugged. I keep calling her. She won't answer. So you're giving up? The disappointment in her voice came through loud and clear. No, of course not. 
I'm giving her a little time to cool off while I figure out how to best approach this. Walking into her store and cornering her didn't seem like a smart idea. But what else could he do at this point? When your grandfather and I were courting, we had a spat like you too. I didn't think I ever wanted to see him again. But then he showed up on my front porch in his Sunday best. He brought me flowers, and I'll never forget the look on his face. It's when I knew he was the one. Simon nodded. Flowers sounded like a good idea. He should find out what Sophie's favorites are. Maybe Maddie would help him out? He pulled into Miss Doris's driveway and walked around to help his grandmother out of the car. By the time they made it up the front walk, Miss Doris was waiting at the door. I thought I heard a car pull up. Come on in. I have a fresh pot of coffee going. Simon resisted the temptation to look at his phone. He had work to do, but it could wait long enough for his grandmother to have a chat with one of her oldest friends. Are four dozen eggs going to be enough? Grandma Wendy asked as they walked into the kitchen. More than enough. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. The pound cake always turns out better with your eggs. I don't know what you feed those chickens, but keep it up. Miss Doris pointed to the kitchen counter and Simon set the cartons down. Head on into the living room, Simon. Wendy and I will be right in with the coffee. He nodded and made his way down the hallway. Hi, Simon. He stopped in his tracks Sophie sat on the couch, holding a cup of coffee. Hi. I wasn't expecting you here. Miss Doris asked me to help bake for the church dinner. Simon took the seat across from her. We brought the eggs for the cakes. Sophie nodded and took a sip of her coffee. Miss Doris and my grandmother should be right in. He shifted and looked over at the door. The silence grew longer. He didn't hear a sound from the kitchen. How is the store? he asked. Staying busy. Those ads you set up are still working. Her smile didn't reach her eyes. About that. He rose to pace the room. I'm sorry. I didn't think it was a big deal, but after giving it some thought. He paused and shoved his hair out of his face. He turned to look at her. And after some hard conversations, I see that it was wrong to start those ads behind your back. Thank you. Braden and I had a long talk the other day, and he helped me see that it was a violation of your space. The store is yours. He told me I would have reacted much worse if someone meddled in Picture Pig or changed something in the app without running it by me. The thought still made cold shivers run down his back. It wasn't fun, but it's working. So there's that. She shrugged. She was looking at him. That was something. I'm glad it's working, and to be honest, the ads can only do so much. It's what they see in the store and how well they are taken care of that makes the real difference. Simon rose and walked over to the window. Thank you for saying that. Her voice was soft. When Brayden and I launched our app, we couldn't get the word out. We tried our best, but our marketing budget was non-existent. They'd both been in college and their budget was basically their beer money. Some marketing guy with a course gave us a shout-out on YouTube and recommended the app to all his followers. It gave us the boost we needed to get off the ground. I guess, in a way, I wanted to pay that forward. He turned around. She was perched on the couch, looking up at him. Her eyes were hooded. I know I messed up. I hope you can forgive me. It's not just that. You paid for Rachel McClure to stay here. I'm guessing you covered her plane ticket too? He nodded. Another strike against him. I should have been honest about that. You were so excited, and it was my pleasure to get her here. And I appreciate that, but I would have liked to at least know about it. I thought she lived much closer and was staying with friends or something. I'm sure we can find semi-local authors for the next, he shook his head. He was doing it again. Let me try that again. I'm sure you and Maddie can find some local authors and create some fun events for them. Sophie's lips twitched. That had to be a good sign. 
we're already on it. If there's anything I can do to help. He walked across the room, needing to close the distance between them. He perched on the seat across from her. Sophie scooted back, away from him. That's not the only thing bothering me. Megan, he guessed. Yes. There are always two sides to each story. You tell me she broke up with you, and then she shows up in my store, talking about the house you are buying for the two of you. Simon looked at her, hoping she could sense the truth in his words. I thought I loved Megan. Dating her made sense at the time. I didn't realize how unhappy I'd been since she moved in, until I came down here to get away from it all. Until I saw Brayden and Summer. And then I met you. He smiled, thinking back on the day he entered her bookstore. I remember that day. You looked a little like a lost puppy. I was feeling pretty adrift. And then I rebuilt my life here, with my grandmother, and with you. Sophie leaned forward. What's with her showing up again, then? Her new relationship didn't work out. She didn't have a job or a place to live. Taking me back was the easy way out for her. And she's had a hard time accepting that that wasn't going to happen. And the house? She saw my father when she toured the property. One of his clients is buying the place. I honestly can't explain how she got it into her head that we were buying a house together. I offered to buy her a ticket to fly home to her family. She declined. Then I found out that she was staying here with Miss Doris. Miss Doris explained that part. I guess what I'm asking is did you lead her on? Was there anything you said or did that made her believe the two of you still had a chance? Sophie was up on the edge of her seat, getting close enough for him to see the little golden flecks in her eyes. Other than being a decent human being? No. I thought I'd made myself clear in the coffee shop. I hope I got through to her this time. You did. Simon jumped up when Megan walked into the living room from the back deck. I came in to give Miss Doris the key to the cottage and tell her goodbye. I called my dad. I'm flying home tonight. Good. Your parents are nice folks. Simon had only met them twice during their engagement, but they were kind, hard-working people. That they are. Megan turned to face Sophie. I'm sorry, I tried getting between the two of you. I had no idea Simon was dating you. I assumed he was waiting for me to come back to him. It took me a little longer than it should have to accept that he wasn't. He's a good guy. Don't make the same mistake I did. She walked over and hugged him. Goodbye, Simon. He watched her leave the room and heard her talking to the women in the kitchen. A moment later, the front door shut. He wished her well, but hoped that sound was the last he'd hear from his ex fiance for quite some time. I miss you, Sophie said softly. I would like to work this out, but it's going to take some time. It's not easy for me to let people in, only to have them disappoint me or leave. I need to be sure you're all in. I am, he assured her. I can't imagine a life without you, Sophie. I want to believe you. And part of me does. But then. She rose and joined him by the window. He took her hand and when she didn't pull away, he let out a breath he didn't realize he'd been holding. I messed up. I'll do whatever it takes to prove to you that I'm all in. She nodded and stepped away when they heard Miss Doris and his grandmother come down the hallway. They took their seats and spent a pleasant hour tasting pound cake and drinking strong coffee. I have to get back to the store, Sophie said a little while later. I'll walk you to the door. Simon stood and walked into the hallway before she could refuse. He heard her take her leave from the others before joining him on the front porch. Thank you for being honest with me today, she said. For the first time that afternoon, she looked at him without the guarded expression in her beautiful eyes. I'll always be open and honest with you, he said, hoping she heard the sincerity in his voice. And right now, I'm miserable without you. I want this to work. I want to trust you completely. Then I'll have to work at earning that trust. He ran his fingers through her hair and felt her shiver. 
Her eyes were wide, her mouth slightly open. He could feel her breath moving in and out quickly. She wanted him as much as he wanted her. That was a good start. Something he could work with. He cupped the back of her head and touched his forehead to hers. You have no idea how badly I want to kiss you right now, he said, his voice hoarse from the emotions churning in his gut. He brushed his finger over her plump lower lip. Hmm. Her eyes drifted closed. It was all the permission he needed. With his heart beating out of his chest and the blood rushing in his ears, he closed the distance between his lips and hers. They were soft and warm and molded perfectly to his own. He lost himself in the feeling of their connection, her scent surrounding him. He could drown in it and never want to come up for air. Her arms wrapped around his neck, her fingers brushing through his hair. It sent tingles down his neck and spine. He couldn't remember a time when he felt more alive. He could live right here in this moment forever, tasting her sweet lips, and then he'd die a happy man. Simon reluctantly let her go when she took a step back, her hands brushing back the hair he hadn't realized he'd tousled while they kissed. I'd better go, she said, still breathless, her lips red and swollen. All he could do was nod. He stood rooted to the porch until her car disappeared down the road. I think Doris is ready for us to get out of her hair too, his grandmother said when he joined the two older women in the living room. You know that's not true. I love having company. Miss Doris looked genuinely upset. I know, honey. But you have more cakes to bake, and I need to go check on my garden. Simon held his arm out, ready to walk his grandmother to the car. I'm glad the two of you worked things out. Sophie is such a sweetheart, and she would make a wonderful wife for you, his grandmother said as they walked back into the house. I am too. We're not out of the woods yet, but we're getting there. I need to show her that I'm serious about us. She's the one, Grandma. Grandma Wendy nodded. Wait here. I have an idea. She walked down the hall and into her bedroom. Simon put on a pot of decaf coffee. This was my mother's. She left it to me in her will. I think it would suit Sophie. His grandmother handed Simon a beautiful antique engagement ring. Are you sure? It was the first time he'd seen this family heirloom. The band and setting were white gold with intricate details that reminded him of the Art Deco style. The European cut diamond was a good size and balanced well with the band. It was a beautiful ring and something most women would be proud to wear even without the family history. I wouldn't have given it to you if I wasn't sure. I offered the ring to your father when he met your mother. He wanted something new and shiny instead. Grandma Wendy shook her head and took the ring back. She put it on her ring finger, next to her own engagement ring and moved it back and forth in the light. It looks plenty shiny to me. Simon smiled at his grandmother. It is. The stone is beautiful, and the setting is unusual. I have it cleaned every once in a while and have them check the setting. She pulled it off her finger and gave it back to him. Thank you. Simon held the ring up for a better look and swallowed hard. Don't wait too long to give it to her. I won't, he promised. Sophie yawned as she pulled into the stable's parking lot. The sun wouldn't rise for another thirty minutes, and there was a chill in the air. She closed her cardigan and took one last sip of coffee before climbing out of the car. There you are. Ready for another sunrise ride? Simon stood next to a beautiful white stallion while Toby led the remaining two horses out of the stable. Sophie recognized the chestnut mare she'd ridden last time. She walked up and stroked the horse's side and ran her fingers through the coarse mane. Hey there, beautiful. Ready for another ride on the beach? I guess I'll have to grow out my hair if I want that kind of attention. Simon bent down to check his saddle and adjust the length of the stirrups. Sophie laughed and turned toward Simon. She'd barely taken a step before the mare bumped her shoulder. Not ready for me to walk away, are you? Sophie went back to stroking her neck. She loves attention, Toby said, grinning. 
She's not the only one, Sophie muttered under her breath. Who can blame her? Simon walked up, the horse trailing behind. If everyone's ready, we better get going if we want to make that sunrise. Toby looked up at the sky. The first hints of light showed on the horizon. Simon nodded and swung into the saddle. Sophie led the chestnut a few steps down the path and got on as well. With Toby taking the lead, it didn't take them long to reach the beach. The morning sky turned orange as they trotted through the sand and surf. Walk out to the point with me? Simon asked when they stopped. Sophie looked over at Toby. I'll wait with the horses back here. Go enjoy your sunrise. Simon got off the horse and strode over to help her down, holding her a little longer than necessary when her feet hit the ground. Have I told you how beautiful you look? Not today. She smiled. They'd had their ups and downs, but Simon always made her feel beautiful and loved. Toby took the reins of both horses and made his way a little farther down the beach to one of the rare trees near the dunes. Sophie felt Simon's hand wrap around hers. Let's go, or we'll miss it. They made it in time for the first sliver of the rising sun to appear and it was breathtaking. Sophie stood in front of Simon, his arms wrapped tightly around her. Warmth radiated off his body and engulfed her like a cocoon. Almost as beautiful as you, he said softly, his cheek barely touching hers. Sophie wished she could stop time. Stay in this one perfect moment with him forever. There's something I've got to do. Simon stepped away. She missed his warmth instantly. The cool breeze off the ocean stole the last hint of the scent that was so uniquely Simon. Close your eyes, he said, his voice rough. Sophie allowed her eyelids to drift close after taking one last glance at the rising sun. She wanted to burn the memory of this moment into her mind forever. No matter what happened, they'd had this perfect morning ride. The sand in front of her crunched under his weight. Can I open my eyes? Her stomach was in a knot, the peaceful feeling from earlier gone, replaced by an excitement she tried hard to tamp down. Yes. Sophie took a quick breath and opened her eyes. Simon was on one knee in front of her, perfectly framed by the ocean and the sun that was just about to fully rise above the horizon. He had a small red velvet box in his hand. Simon slowly lifted the lid, revealing a beautiful vintage engagement ring. Really? Simon nodded. Where did this come from? It was my great-grandmother's. Can you let me do this, please? I promise to answer all questions after you answer mine. Simon smiled, his eyes sparkled as brightly as the first few sun rays hitting the crests of the gentle waves rolling ashore. I can do that. Sophie bit her lip to keep quiet. The joy and excitement was on the verge of bubbling out. Sophie Davenport, you are the reason I get up in the morning. I didn't know what was missing in my life until I walked into the bookstore and met you. There's no one I'd rather watch the sunrise with. Will you marry me and so we can share all the sunrises and sunsets for the rest of our lives? Nothing could keep the smile from spreading across her face. Yes, I'll marry you. Simon slipped the ring on her finger. Sophie raised her hand to get a better look. It was a beautiful white gold ring with intricate designs on the band. The four prongs held a diamond large enough to meet her mother's approval. Do you like it? Simon asked as he rose. If you'd rather have a different. It's stunning. Sophie didn't know what else to say. It was one of the most beautiful pieces of jewelry she'd ever seen. And now it was hers. As was Simon. She lifted on her toes, the sand shifting below her boots. Her arms wrapped around his neck, and she pulled him into a long, slow kiss. Who needed time to stand still when you could have forever with the man of your dreams? Epilogue There is still time to call this off. Her mother paced back and forth through the bedroom. Mother. I don't want to call it off. I love Simon, and I am marrying him today. Sophie gave her mother a stern look. She would not let this woman ruin her wedding day. Are you sure he's the right one? 
The man you want to spend the rest of your life with? Her mother took her hand and Sophie saw the fear in her eyes. What if it doesn't work out? Mom. Sophie squeezed her mother's hand and pulled her over to the small settee. I love Simon and I hope we live a long and happy life together. But I don't know what the future brings. I'm sure you thought that your marriage would last forever on your wedding day. Her mother nodded, raising a silk handkerchief to dab at the moisture pooling in the corner of her eyes. Simon isn't dad and I can't imagine him having an affair or walking out on me. But there are no guarantees in life. You know that and I do too. But I have to take a chance on this. I love him. I want a chance to be happy with him. It's worth the risk. Maybe you're right. I've tried so hard to find you someone boring and reliable that you wouldn't fall for head over heels. And here you go, finding your prince charming anyway. Her mother smiled through the tears. Is that why you kept setting me up with people like Martin? To protect me? Sophie was stunned. It had never occurred to her that her mother could pick men she knew her daughter wouldn't be romantically interested in. I figured if you married for practical reasons, it wouldn't hurt so much when they left. Her mother waved the hand with the piece of silk at no one in particular. I didn't want the pain of real heartbreak for you. Sophie hugged her mother, feeling closer to her than she had in years. Pamela Davenport wept silently, her shoulders shaking softly. It's time to put on your dress, Maddie said, handing Sophie's mother a glass of champagne a few moments later. She walked over to the closet and pulled the creamy white gown from its garment bag. Would you mind checking on Willow? Of course. I'll go splash some water on my face and fix my makeup. Her mother strode out of the room, head held high. Thanks, Sophie mouthed to her friend. It's my job as maid of honor. Maddie lifted the dress and gently guided it over Sophie's hair. The stylist had curled and arranged it in a messy pile on her head, with a few ringlets framing Sophie's face. She hadn't been sure about the look until the woman added the small veil with the pair of antique silver combs Maddie had found at a thrift store and insisted on letting her borrow. Are you ready? Maddie asked when the dress was on. How do I look? Sophie turned right and left, trying to get a good look in the small standing mirror. The ready room adjacent to the church was surprisingly small. Stunning. You'll take Simon's breath away. Maddie handed her the larger of the two bouquets of flowers waiting on a small side table. Sophie took a deep breath and then the flowers. I'm ready. Ready to marry Simon and start their life together. You look like you're bored out of your mind. Summer Johnson, now Summer Kessler. Parker corrected himself, said as she walked up to the corner table where he'd sought refuge. She held out her hand. Dance with me. Isn't that your husband's job? He scanned the room for Braden, without luck. I wish. He and Simon are back there talking business. On my brother's wedding day. She shook her head, her carefully curled blonde hair bounced all over the place. I'm sorry, Summer. I wouldn't be good company. Fine. But you're not sulking over here by yourself. I'll be right back. He shook his head. There was no telling what Simon's little sister would come up with. When they were growing up, she was notorious for trying to follow them or sneak into her brother's room. One time, she'd hidden on their father's boat to be part of the party Simon, Brayden, and he had thrown. It had been while they were home for a break from college and Brayden had volunteered to keep an eye on her and escort her home. And now they were married. And he was getting a divorce. Here you go. Summer held a plate piled high with wedding cake and various desserts out to him. Her own held just as many treats. I'm not big on sweets, Parker said, pushing the plate off to the side. Don't give me that. Breakups require lots of sugar. It's science. I should know. I work in a lab. At a university. She popped an eclair in her mouth. I'd love to see a peer review study on that topic. We should run it. 
It could be a Colorado State Clemson collaboration. I bet we would have no problem finding broken hearts on either campus. And I'm sure Miss Doris would be happy to supply all the baked goodies we'd need. He smiled, feeling a little better. He took a bite of the fudge brownie he'd been eyeing all night. Liza hadn't approved of processed foods and sugary treats. But she wasn't in his life anymore. To prove his point, he dug his fork into the slice of wedding cake covered in thick, white icing. That's the spirit. Feeling better? He nodded, his mouth too full of cake to speak. For the record, Liza is an idiot. If you ask me, you're better off without her. I know it doesn't feel like it right now, but it will. My baby sister is right. Simon took a seat next to Parker. Braden pulled out the chair next to his wife and took her fork. Thanks for being here for me today. I know it's not easy. Hey, go get your own plate, Summer protested as her husband cut another piece of cake and ate it. What happened to eating clean? Simon asked. His sister poked him in the shoulder. It's your wedding day. We're making an exception. Parker appreciated the distraction. Looking forward to your honeymoon? I am. Though I don't know about the flight to London. His friend shuddered. Parker didn't remember Simon flying anywhere. So far, he'd only known him to drive while traveling to meet clients, no matter how long the distance. You're not worried about the actual flight? Parker looked at one of his oldest friends and realized how much they'd grown apart since college. Back in the day, he would have known if this was something Simon was scared of. He missed the closeness. The feeling of family. It's much safer than driving, Summer added. So he was scared to fly. Parker shook his head in surprise. I know that, and I'm sure I'll be fine. I'm just wondering if I should have picked a shorter flight to test this theory. Simon shrugged. Too late now. Too late for what? His stunning bride walked up and put her arms around her new husband. Too late to go out for a swim. Parker here tried to talk us all into going skinny dipping. Simon had always been quick on his toes, but if this hadn't been his wedding day. Simon rose. And I was about to tell him I'd much rather dance with my beautiful wife. He took her hand and led her out onto the dance floor. Summer shot a glance at Brayden. His friend swallowed hard before rising. Would you like to dance? he asked. She smiled and got up, ready to join her brother and sister-in-law. Parker found himself alone again at the same table. Only this time, it was littered with dirty glasses and halfway filled plates. Somehow, that helped. Proof that he wasn't alone. He had friends here. A family. His phone buzzed. Parker pulled it out of his jacket pocket and looked at the screen. A text from Liza. Thought you should know. I'm in labor. It's yours. The End This has been Solace of Simon. Written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2021 by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.